probably one of the most unique and difficult challenges that exist on the planet. I'm excited to get out there and give it my all. It takes a lot of determination and 24 hours don't underestimate it. I want to hit 50 miles this time. I want to keep it going all night long. This is the hardest thing I've ever done. No, things are tough, especially Devil's Beard. That one sucks. During the pitch black, you've got to push forward. One foot in front of the other, keep going. You just got to power through these yeah. terrible hours. And better. Let's lift up at time. You won't hear each other in the headphones, so okay. we'll leave it here open. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, y'all good. Welcome to World's Toughest Mudder 2023, the 24-hour World Championship race for Tough Mudder, what I believe is the single greatest event in obstacle course racing. My name is Will Hicks. I am here with my co-host, Fran Grando. Hello. We are very excited to be here for the next 25 and a half hours with you, even longer, 26 hours, because we haven't started yet to bring you World's Toughest Mudder. Fran, how excited are you about this? I'm race? so excited. So, as you know, last year was my first year coming to World's Toughest Mudder. And, and I agree, it's such a special race. I've been so excited looking forward to this. It's such a special atmosphere. The people out there do really, really incredible things and it's so much fun getting to watch them and support them and, and talk about it for all this time. We're gonna be with you for the next 26 hours, bringing you the entire race. It's our own little World's Toughest Mudder here in the booth. The <laughs> apps are in the start shoot. They're getting uh, last minute safety briefings and last minute rules instructions. Uh, we're going to take you to the start shoot when it gets good. Don't worry. Um, we are very excited to to see the athletes. We want to talk about some of the rules of the race, what you're going to expect, uh, what what the athletes are going to be dealing with out there on course. Just to, if this is your first time watching World Toughest Mudder or learning about World Toughest Mudder, I want to talk to you about the race. Um, World Toughest Mudder is a 24 hour race on a five mile loops course. The man and woman and team 
who run the most laps in 24 hours win the title of World's Toughest Mudder. Mm -hmm. So there are some rules about how, when you have to do your last lap and when you have to complete by, which can sound a little bit confusing if you don't know what's going on. So let's recap on, on what that means and what people have to do. Sure. So the race starts at 12 noon local time. We're here just outside of Dallas in Granbury, Texas. The race starts at noon, 24 hours later, would be traditionally be noon on Sunday, right? However, you, this year. <laughs> you'd think so, but this year there's daylight savings time. Now, daylight savings is gonna do its thing. So we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep track of 24 hours. We're gonna keep a 24 hour clock going on the, on the uh, coverage on the athletes. Just remember it's a 24 hour race. At the end of that 24 hours, athletes will have one and a half hours to finish their last lap. So the start line closes at 24 hours after the start line opens. The start line opens at 12 noon on Saturday. 24 hours later, the start line will close. Athletes will have an hour and a half to finish their last lap. So if they're if they're working it right, they have 25 and a half hours to get as many laps as possible. Uh, if they finish their last lap after 12 o'clock, like if they come across the finish line at 12.01, they cannot start a new lap to finish by 1.30 or to, to finish by 25 and a half hours. So that's the 24 hour race, 25 and a half hours to finish your last lap. Amazing. Think about 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. in the morning. Sure. So to qualify as a world's toughest mother finisher, you must finish your last lap. Now, traditionally, we would say after 8 a.m. You have to finish a lap after 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. Because of daylight savings, you'll be 7 a.m. It's the exact same. It's 24 hours, it's 12 hours plus the eight hours to so 20 hours of racing to become a world's toughest mother finisher. So that means you can't just go out, do one lap and say, I completed world's toughest mother. You have to start and then either stay out all night, which we know people do, which we'll talk about later, or then get another lap in at least. That's right. So some people will, a question I get a lot when I talk to people about world's toughest mother is, well, do you sleep? Can you sleep? <laughs> you absolutely can. And some athletes do. There, there is going to be athletes that are out there literally 25 and a half hours. There's going to be some people that do, they'll, they'll go until midnight. Then they'll go into their tent in the pit area. We'll talk about the pit area in a minute. And they'll sleep for six or eight hours. They'll wake up and they'll start a lap and they'll finish a lap. They'll come in after 7 a.m. And they're a finisher. They didn't run the full 24 hours, but they were out here. They experienced the race. They probably put in 30, 35 miles and, uh, and they experienced it. That's something else we can talk about. The, gamp, the range of athletes from... Yeah, I was just thinking that. It's not a huge field of athletes here. Like, it's not the biggest event, but the range of athletes is incredible, especially considering it's such a specialized and difficult event. You see a lot of different people taking this on. Yeah, so last year, the man and woman who won did 110 and 100 miles, respectively. There were also people that did 5 miles and 10 miles and 15 miles. My very first year at World's Toughest Mudder, 2015, I ran 15 miles. It wasn't wasn't my greatest performance, but they're literally running the gamut from weekend warriors who do this one race a year to people who have been training every single day since World Stuff Mutter last year to get ready for this year. I mean, we did the hot lap yesterday, and I'm sore just from doing that. So I find any miles impressive. <laughs> so Fran and I yesterday went out with the OCR report crew, and we participated in the hot lap, which is what uh, it's a, a new thing. A few years. It, where pit crew members and anyone who wants to run the course, but maybe they're not going to be able to run the whole 24 hours, or maybe they're just out here to pit for a friend or for an athlete, they can go out there and run one lap of the course, try out some of the obstacles, and just kind of get a feel for it. Try to get part of the world's toughest better experience uh, without having to run the whole 24 hours. It's nice. People have their kids as well and families, so people who aren't going to run it get to know what people are going through and perhaps even have a picture in their mind of where they are and what's happening and what kind of thing they're going through. And it's really helpful for the pit crew too, because they can get a, get a, like you said, like a sense of what their elites are going through. So when they when the elites come through and they're pitting for them, if I want to toss the goal, um, I'm, I'm going to be about a mile from the finish line. Uh, there's no communication between athletes and pit crew up there, but it does get kind of a, a heads up on what's what's going on. If if people want to run World Seven Fire, but 24 hours is a long time, I can't run 50 miles. I can't run 100 miles. Most people can't run 100 miles, so don't let that stop you. <laughs> but the, coming out and pitting for a friend or pitting for anyone, volunteering is a, is, a, is a great way to experience it. And then you can do the, the hot lap on Friday as a way to uh, get a little taste of the race. Yeah, definitely. So what did you think of the course yesterday? We did the hot lap last year, saw the course last year. Yesterday we went out trying to get a feel of, of what we're going to be talking about. What did you think about it? You know what? 
um, this is a new venue. We're here in Granbury, Texas, just outside Dallas. Last year we were in Atmore, Alabama, outside of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, one thing that I think is going to be different, that I think the biggest factor that's going to change the way this race is compared to last year is the weather. That's not what you asked me, but let's talk about the weather for okay. a second. Um, it is much warmer today. I, in fact, I feel like even here in the booth, we're in shade, but I feel like we're already sweating from uh, from Granbury. Let's talk, actually talk about the weather. Right now, it's... It was, it was hot to start with last year because I had sunscreen on. I was wearing shorts, which I'm wearing now, and then it got very cold overnight. So I do remember it being pretty warm to start with. Last year was, was kind of wild weather. If you were with us last year, it started like a nice day, like, like a warm day, but a nice day. Uh, like right now, we're at 65 degrees here locally. But it is breezy. It is breezy, and that'll come into a factor, too. But it got, last year, it got really cold, really early. Like, 3 in the afternoon, we were putting on jackets, mm. which is super unusual. Uh, the weather has been cold here in Granbury, but it's been trending warmer. So we're expecting it to be warmer overnight tonight. Um, one big factor for World Stuff's Motor every single year is wetsuits. Um, it Generally, it gets very cold overnight at World Stuff's Motor. It's always first or second weekend in November of the race. And so it gets, it gets cold overnight. And you're in and out of water. You're in and out of an, an obstacle called Arctic Enema, which with a, a, a It's how it sounds. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it does what it says on the box. It's really cold. So you're going to need to, last year, not everyone wore wetsuits. Not everyone needed to wear wetsuits. Well, it's the right time to put on the wetsuit. You don't want to put it on too early and overheat. You don't want to put it on too late when you're actually going to get a cold. I mean, personally, if I was running, I'd be really concerned about the weather today because it's a really tricky mix. It's very, very sunny, so I know I personally would overheat quickly. But then once I got wet with the wind, as you can see here with the microphone, the wind would chill me so much. So for me, this is the less than ideal running weather, getting wet. Yeah, and it's tricky. Putting on the wetsuit too early is, is just as bad as putting on the wetsuit too late. If you put on the wetsuit too late, you are you get cold and you're facing it, trying to warm back up. And that takes a lot of lot out of your body physically. Mm. If you put it on too early, you overheat. This, you overheat, and that's a that's a legitimate. And once you're overheated, then you have to go get to your pit area, just kind of stagger, make it back to your pit area, and then hope you can cool off and recover enough to get back on course. And for the elites that are trying to put up 90, 95, 100 plus miles, they don't have time it's to waste. Just like not that. time for that. It sounds. I mean, as somebody who can't, it sounds crazy, but it, 100 miles in 24 hours doesn't sound like that much, but when you take into account how much the obstacles slow you down, like it's amazing how little time the athletes have in their pit. In t like they're not stopping, they you know, stop for a few minutes at a time, maybe sit down, maybe if they're changing their shoes, Tyler was saying he might sit down just to change his shoes, or maybe a bit of food and carrying on. Like they, they, they are pushing all out. So there's not time to waste to recalibrate your body. Sure. We mentioned the pit area a few times. For if you're, this is your first time watching World's Toughest Mutter, at the, there, it's a five mile loop course. You, you, you cross a start line, You'll run five miles, you'll do 20 obstacles, five miles, and you cross the finish line. Between the finish line and the start line is the pit area. Every athlete has a 10 by 10 foot area where they can set up a tent if they want. They can put a tarp on the ground. They can do nothing if they want. They can just throw a sleeping bag down there. Uh, or they can just, whatever they want to do for their, they, it, it, every athlete can individually decide what they want to do for their pit. What the elites tend to do is they have a, a small area or they'll even group up with some other friends and they'll have two or three elite athletes with two or three pit crew members that when the elites come in there, they'll hand them nutrition, they'll hand them some, something to drink, and they're gone. What regular athletes, like when I, when I ran the race two years ago, my last last time I ran, we had a tent area and we had a cooler and we had sandwiches in there. We had our wetsuits ready for us to go in the corner. So, so for a person running the race, a pit stop might be come in, grab some water, use the restroom, grab a sandwich, eat your food, throw some stuff in the trash, and go. For an elite, that whole process is 30 seconds to a minute. Yeah. They don't have time I, to I waste I mean, I was food. astounded by the simplicity of Tyler's pit. He's got a really good spot. It's really, really close. The elites, the contenders, are right at the front, so they don't have to be wasting time going deep into the pit. He didn't even have a tent or anything. But I mean, we're not due any rain. It is a little bit breezy, but he doesn't need a tent there. And he's got a little bit of food. Lots of people, I mean, we've got more food than he has. <laughs> And it's really simple, but like you say, in and out. We're talking about Tyler Beerman. <laughs> uh, before the race, about an hour ago, Fran and I walked through the pit area, talking to athletes, talking to elites, trying to get a feel for how they feel and how their training went and what we, what they're looking to expect. And as we as we watch the elites through the uh, 24 hours, we'll, we'll share some of those stories. One of the athletes we talked to a few weeks ago was Tyler Beerman. Mm -hmm. He ran 100 miles last year, finished in third place. And uh, he has 
high expectations for this year. He's a very simple pit area. He has tarp on the ground. He has a little table with, you know, very little gummy fish. It looked like, and uh, he's good to go. So interestingly, of the athletes that we spoke to, and I'm sure we'll go over this throughout the night a lot. Very very high mileage. It's almost it's like a bad luck thing to talk about. Mileage. It's like they don't want to jinx themselves, right? We we asked almost every athlete, how many miles are you shooting for? Um, are you shooting for a mileage goal or a placement goal? Almost every one of them said quantified their goals in mileage, mm. but not necessarily. They wouldn't. They didn't give the mileage. I actually really like the way Tyler goals because he did give a goal in terms of anything. Some people said run 25 and a half hours. Um, yes, I have a number in my head, or yes, I have a position in my head. He just said, I want to get to the point where I can't go any further and push past it. And I don't know, for me, that feels like. That embodies the entire spirit of this event for every athlete of what they're hoping to achieve. Every athlete, I think, every endurance athlete, whether you're a world's toughest mutter or a marathon runner or whatever your your endurance event of choice is, has come against that wall, right? Um, when I, I ran, I ran one marathon, a traditional road marathon in my life, and that was what everyone warned me was: there's a wall, you're gonna hit a wall, and I'm like, okay, I've done world's toughest mutter, like this is twenty six point two. But it's, it's like a 17 miles, like it's like you physically hit a wall, and you know, like, like you have to start walking. Do you know, what? I mentally hit a wall. So I, I did a marathon this year, and I did lots of training, did a half, that was great, and I ran the marathon. The first half, fantastic, and then right on the halfway point, I hit my childhood home. The halfway point was my child, and I kind of got there and went. Oh God, I know exactly what's coming now for the next, like, however many miles it was, because suddenly our roads got empty. And I knew I had to go round these roads that I've been on, round my hometown that I live in now. And, and it just felt, felt joy was okay. Like, like, legs were a bit sore, but it's okay. But it was a mental block, and I was so fed up. And once I got past that, it was like, once I got to mile 21, I was rocking and rolling again. But it was the half marathon to 21 that destroyed me mentally. And I said this yesterday, I don't have that mental strength that these people have. So World Toughest Mudder, the wall is different, I think, for different athletes. It could be a mileage number. When you hit that, um, whatever your top mileage was last year, mm. like, I need to get past that, whether you're a 50 miler or a 75 miler. Um, for me, it's usually a time. Three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, you're out there on course by yourself. I say by yourself. There's other athletes out you're there. You're by yourself. But... You're by yourself. You get to a wall obstacle, and you're like, I can't get up this by myself. And you have to wait. You're standing there waiting at a wall. It's 3.30 in the morning. A lot of people have found their pit areas and are sleeping. I mean, even sitting here, comfortable with everything we need, that's a difficult time of the day. Yeah. It's difficult. And so, and then Tyler was very, um, almost passionate about talking about his goal is to find that wall yeah, and to push through it. it. I, I really enjoyed that. And what was interesting as well was talking about his goal last year, and he said, you know, said you asked your body to give you 100 miles and you did and no more and I, I think sometimes and maybe that's why athletes don't want to say because it almost feels like you should over exaggerate what your goal is because if your goal is something that you can achieve once you achieve it, you have to push further because you, it, it, it's a mental thing it's a psychological thing your brain's like that ah, i delivered you what you wanted i'm not delivering anymore but if you say i'm going to do 120 miles which and you know you can't you're still always pushing there's there's no there's no stopping. We were sitting here. I remember talking with you. We thought Tyler Beerman was going to win it. Yeah, we did. Oh, absolutely. He just won um, OCRWC like two weeks before or something. And he hit that 100 miles and his body was like, nope. you asked for 100. I gave you 100. We're done, buddy. Mm. And Tyler, he uh, he owned it. He's like, it's what I got. I, I gave everything I had. and that's He's so sweet. I love so. him. Awesome. So last year, we did see some big numbers. Well, we saw a very big number from Chris. Who's here again. Yeah. Let's talk about Chris Kriplowski. Chris Kriplowski, her first time at World Toughest Mudder last year, she ran 100 miles. Yes. We, or as we watched, I mean, that was the uh, uh, picture in picture of the, uh, of the start line. I'm not sure if we have audio of that. Let's, uh, let's see what we're doing there.
We have audio on these, right? Should. You can turn it up over there in a second. First two are me and Dustin. Second one's Dustin. Turn up. Thank you all very much for that. It's very important, no matter where you are, whatever, whatever your country is, you're all represented up in here. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity, since I got your attention, to introduce myself to all of you. My name is Coach Mixmaster Mudhoney. But my friends all call me Coach. For the next handful of minutes, I'm going to ask you all a series of questions. And you're going to answer me with yes, Coach. Is that clear? Beautiful. I just got to know, are you mentally prepared for what's about to happen for this next 24 hours? Come on, with a little confidence, are you prepared? Yes, sir. Excellent. Now I need to know, do you believe in your reason? Do you believe in your mission? Do you believe in your why? Yes, sir. Awesome. Now I want you all to look around, look around, look around the people in here. Look around. This is Mother Nation. Do you have confidence with the mothers to the left and to the right of you? Now this next one is delivered from a good friend of mine. A good friend of mine wanted me to ask you all a question. In fact, it's a good friend of ours. And he wants to know, are you going to give your best out there on that course today? And he doesn't want that to be your subtle best. He wants your honest best. Will you give your best out there on that course today? He says, you do that, that's going to make y'all better. And that's going to make all of us better. And we will see you at the finish line. How are we feeling, Mother Nation? Woo! Now, I still feel a little bit of nerves up in here. Yeah, right? There's nerves, there's energy. We all have that energy. It's kind of going around and up. There's a girl out there. Her name's Annie Thorstadter. She's won the CrossFit Games a handful of times. And she's got this thing. She says, it's okay to have butterflies, but when it's time, you got to tell your butterflies to fly in formation, Mother Nation. Right. I'm going to that time right now. So collectively, Pit Crew, TMHQ, all my mothers, we're going to take a big collective breath together. And we're going to bring that energy together. Well, three, two, one, in. Mother Nation, hold it. Let's go. One more time. In with the dust. Hold it out. All right, we're bringing it together, Mother Nation, as one in. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we got our buttons a little loosened up. Find yourself some speech and approve the move. We're going to get ready to set you out there on that course. We're going to start with the big backwards arm circle. I took a dance party. I know it's time here. Just stop drinking. People get out your way. Yeah. 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 I just don't 
We have started. That is World's Toughest Matter 2023. Kicking 24 off. hours starts now. So as we did last year, we've got static cameras around the course. We've got the finish line camera. Um, we have two rabbits out running. Uh, we've got Jason is out with the front runners. How much of a signal there right now? Uh, unfortunately. So yeah, as uh, as happens when you're out in fields, the signal can be a bit iffy. We did a bit of testing yesterday when we were out recording. So this first lap is fun. The first lap we call it the sprint lap. It, the obstacles are all the obstacles are closed right now. Mm -hmm. The obstacles will be opening on a kind of a rolling status. But you know, none of the obstacles open until 1 p.m. of the lap. Until one hour is in the books. So the athletes, there's some there's some strategy here. There's a little bit of how hard do I push this first hour when all the obstacles are closed? So there's a special um, sprint lap bib, isn't there? There is. The, the first man and the first woman to cross the, the finish line, to finish the first lap, are the winners of the sprint bib. Uh, it's it's a green bib, nothing to wear. It's mainly for bragging rights. There's no prize money attached, attached to it. Um, but it's it's something cool to get. Now, tradition, now, typically, if you win the sprint lap, you are not going to win the race. In the history of World's Toughest Mudder, 11 years of the race, one only one person has ever won the sprint lap and once that was Ray Coble back in 20, back in Vegas. Well, we did think last year that it was possibly going to happen. It's 2017. Last year, I don't remember who won the sprint lap. Was it not D? Uh... But it's never happened other than Ray Coble. No one's ever done it. And Ray Coble's the only woman to do it. I felt like the person last year who won the sprint lap on the male side was then doing really well. And then... That was Anthony Kunkel. That's it. Anthony Kunkel, who, who is not back next, this year. Uh, Anthony Kunkel did do very well in the sprint lap. And he, you're right, he did very well the first, uh, I'd say, 12 hours of the race. This is something that we've said before and we're going to say multiple times. It, it, sounds, it sounds ridiculous, and I know it is when I say it. The race doesn't start until midnight. The first 12 hours of the race are about positioning yourself or about putting yourself in a position so that when the race starts, now the race obviously is officially started right now, but for the for the elites, intents and purposes, their race starts at midnight. So we're watching the, uh, this is probably the, the back of the group here. So we've got Jason at the front and we've got Justin at the back. Watching Jason signals. Not as great at the front. You said the race doesn't start till midnight for the elites, but I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't. Right. You can see Alex Cotispodia, one of our little little person there, um, in the middle of the group there. It's really congested the first lap. So if you're not near the front, uh, you might be walking a lot of the race. This might be a good time to talk about some of the bibs that you'll see out there. Okay. There's a lot of white bibs. The white bibs are the open class. Anyone can sign up to run World Service Butter. There's no qualification required. Okay. You could sign up literally yesterday. You could walk up, you could register, you could sign up, you could run the race in the open category. There's also two other color bibs you'll see out there. There's a black bib and there's an orange bib. The orange bib is the contenders. The contender uh, have qualified a tough to stuff butter infinity to get the contender bib and the orange bib. And then the black bibs are the elite contenders. And they also qualify through a higher qualification process, miles or more kilometers at a toughest or an infinity. Toughest and infinity are other tough butter events, multi lap, multi hour events, infinity during the day, toughest overnight that you qualify for. That was I was interested in doing an infinity. Uh, near where I live, we've got a really good uh, Tough Mudder event, which is the uh, Chumley Castle in the northwest. And I, I really wanted to do it because I kind of I had my goal this year, I did my goal, and then I need to, I always need something in the calendar to train towards. Otherwise, I'm too lazy and I don't do it. But I don't know what happened. Things happened, and then I didn't I didn't commit to it, and it didn't. But I would love to do an Infinity event. I'm trying to make out the writing on that flag. A lot of athletes will carry flags or. or... Um, they'll write on their bibs to kind of bring attention to a cause, maybe a loved one with cancer, what they're running for. It's one of our wheelchair athletes. I was talking to Bo Hart and Scars. Bo Hart and Scars, absolutely. Uh, one of our one of our wheelchair athletes, Jesse Strahan, is not here this year. She's usually here every year. I was talking to Sarah, one of her support group. Sarah's running solo this year. Give her a, a shout out. Um, but 
Jesse, you are not here, but we're thinking about you and uh, wish you the best. You are missed. Trying to give you Jason in the picture. Unfortunately, he keeps dropping out a little bit. There we go. He's with the front. It's difference about the people who are running in the front. And you are kind of conjecture. Fence crossing. So there's several places on never, never had a fence on a course, at least not since 2015. There are we're on a rear, True Grit Ranch in Granbury, Texas. And there are, I believe, four fence crossings, like that one you just saw. Um, they, when I say fence crossings, I mean there is a, like a fence, like a barbed wire fence yes. that Tub Mudder has constructed a up and over where you basically got to climb up and over. So that's, that's the source of a lot of that congestion. So it's not so much an obstacle as it's not an obstacle. that's going to cause people difficulty, but at this point it is going to create more congestion. But I mean, everyone's warm, everyone's dry. It doesn't really matter at this point, does it? Here we're out front with the contenders. Uh, I saw Joe Perry there with the face paint in the back. I saw, I believe Kevin Givens. Um, so we're, uh, Watching the athletes here go across. There's this fence crossing we we're talking about, and it's gonna, you know what? It's gonna cause congestion this entire first lap for these, and it's a shame because these athletes are all trying to get through here without uh, just trying to skip obstacles. The obstacles are closed. Everyone knows that. So That's only so much you can avoid in terms of designing a course. Every race director knows avoid putting obstacles near the beginning of the race that's gonna cause congestion. But if you don't have a choice, you don't have a choice. There's some science to it because that's why the obstacles are closed the first lap because to spread the athletes out along the five mile course. Oh, yeah. You you want instead if you, if if the first obstacle was open, there would whatever it is, there would be congestion at that first obstacle. Here you go out in front. Some of our athletes. And you can see this this guy in the white bib. I don't know his name, but he's doing great with the uh, with the guys in the orange bib. There's no qualification for like some of these open athletes are elite elite athletes that we'll get to know through the uh, through the 24 hours. And uh, uh, out there too, like they're gonna see some uh, some action out there on the mud. It's breaking up a little bit. Looking for our best signal here for you guys. So once the athletes start going through the obstacles as well, we have our static cameras at the obstacles. Like I said, we've got the finish line, uh, and then we've got a couple of obstacles, and then there's two more that look like they're not quite going, but I'm pretty sure Jason, as he runs around, will be sorting those out. Should we talk about when the obstacles start to open? Yeah, so the first, so the race to noon, the sprint lap, we, we call it the sprint lap. It's really the sprint hour. The first hour that there, no, none of the obstacles are open. Everything is closed. The, the start of the rolling obstacles begins at 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. So we've got a list here of when the obstacles open in terms of opening time, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to the obstacle list. So the first obstacle to open is Snogging Dirt at 1 p.m. And uh, that is actually obstacle number four. Also Dublin Walls opens at 1 p.m. That's obstacle number nine. And there are some obstacles that don't actually open until the evening. Uh, well clung, hanging rough. Uh, they don't open till eight, and Dingleberries doesn't open till ten. Yeah, the the sprint lap is always tricky because you have two schools of thought. One school would say all the obstacles are closed, so run as fast as you can while the obstacles are closed and get as many miles as possible, as many laps as possible. Uh, while the obstacles are closed, yes. you want to get get through as much as you can. The other is, and this is where I think I would land, is it's never a good idea to burn out early. It's a 24-hour race. It's a long, long race. If you if you bust it, and if you're whatever your your usual pace is for a race like this, say it's you know a 10-minute mile, say it's 11-minute mile. If you say you know what, I'm going to go faster than that, by faster than what I'm comfortable with, mm. because I want to get as many obstacles fast as possible. You're going to pass one, or maybe if you're really fast, you'll skip two obstacles mm. that you would not have to do. But at what cost? You're going to be burned out. The obstacles are going to open anyway. It's To me, it's not worth it to burn yourself out to skip one or two obstacles. Mm. It's a long, long race. If we were talking about a 10-mile you know, race, or okay, but it's a 24-hour race. These athletes are trying to do 50 or 75 miles or 100 miles. Uh, there's not a lot of. Um, it's not. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter if you miss one or two obstacles. Mm. 
this this fence crossing is uh we you know we knew it would uh cause some backup but it's kind of surprising how many it really has caused a lot yeah. is this do you reckon this could be a problem throughout the night because there's, there's four of them isn't there I think, so. no i don't i don't think it'll be a problem throughout the night i think i think this will be an issue for this lap maybe the second lap mm. but after this it'll start but once you have the the field of athletes I don't know. I don't have the exact number in front of us, but it's less than dice this year that are out there. Once mm. they're spread out over that five mile course, it, it won't be an issue. I mean, we when we did the hot lap yesterday, which we walked all of, uh, we pretty quickly lost people and lost that congestion. Yeah, well, there was probably about say people that ran the hot lap yesterday. Mm. And we broke up almost immediately over the first mile. Yeah. I'd say everyone was in groups of five. Now there were a few obstacles that people stopped at the grappler. There was a big group of the grappler because people just wanted to try the obstacle and you know the grappler is an obstacle where you're at the bottom of a hill and, and Interesting one, wasn't yeah, it? it's been quite a long time you, it. you have a, a a rope basically attached to a baseball drill through and you have, have to pull up a rope and basically toss mm. the rope and baseball up and into a uh, a v-shaped catch yeah and then it catches like the a baseball. wooden board two wooden boards uh, narrowing down like a funnel, yeah. and then you pull yourself up. Necessarily need the rope to pull yourself up the hill, but the obstacle is to get up the hill. It was interesting. It showed the value of the hot lap yesterday. Uh, the guy who was selling the obstacle, he said, "We made this obstacle, and we all tested it out, and we were uh, twenty goes, no successes. We were just throwing the ball with the string attached, attached, and then somebody uh, wound it up like a, a cable and threw the whole thing." And then we started getting it, and um, then they started getting it. And but they also said that throwing overhand was way more successful, and people who were throwing it underhand weren't actually really having much success. And that is a three obstacle, three try obstacle. So if you don't get it, it's quite a long penalty loop. Yeah, and we, I didn't do any of the uh, penalty. We didn't, not intentionally yesterday. We didn't do any of the penalties, so. I'll be interested to see what the, uh, how those shake out. Well, the penalties this year are a bit interesting. They've made them a bit harder, haven't they? Yeah. In the, the past few years, the penalties tended to be more of the – they were time-consuming, mm -hmm. but they were more fun. Stuff like you have to write a word with an etch-a-sketch, or you have to bounce a bouncy ball from mm. here to there and back. Um, there, there are going to be some challenges, they said, on the penalty loops. Charles said, I was asking him earlier, I was like, are there still, because we didn't see them because we didn't do the penalty loops. And he said, yeah, there are. The thing is, the penalty loops are long, and halfway through, you'll come up, up, come upon a silly challenge. Uh, so we don't actually know what they are yet, so we'll be having to send our rabbits around and checking those out. Last year, we couldn't even try it out the penalties. That, that fun, or the uh, the silly, silliness you say, it's, it's part of the Tough Butter DNA. Absolutely part. That's... And if, if that wasn't that, it would feel very strange. It's a serious race. World Stubbs Butter is a very serious, intense race. That doesn't take itself seriously. But yeah, it's a, it's a fun one too. Mm. It Seriously, is. Some it's of the athletes here are already starting to walk. Um, it's, it's, it's hot. It's surprisingly hot out there. I mean, it's, it's 20 degrees Celsius, uh, Celsius. I don't know what that means in America. That's pretty toasty. But yeah, it's, it's mixed with that wind. The flags are all flying. There's a kite in the air. In fact, we've had to properly nail down the tent and probably hear the wind behind us. It is it is hot. I think it, it could be really tricky weather. I'm not going to lie. And if the sky stays clear, it's going to be cold overnight. In Laughlin two years ago, um, my goal for, for that race was to get 50 miles. I never went 50 miles. Mm. And I my goal all year long was 50 miles at Laughlin. I didn't do any other Tough Butter events. Mm -hmm. I just did traditional trail running racing events. My, my goal for that race was... 50 miles mm. and then all year long i was looking forward to 50 miles at world stuff butter and so i I'd made sacrifices I'd, I'd changed my typical typical race plans just to 50 miles of Laughlin. that's what i gotta do this is the year i get 50 miles at world stuff butter and the race started and this at this point in the race right now like what are we 30 minutes into the race uh um, 15. <laughs> 15 minutes in the race. Yeah, no, about this time. In, in Laughlin on the course, it was hot. And I was not I was in a big group of people. And I was like, well, maybe next year. <laughs> now, it ended up working out. I got my 50 greatest race of my 
lot of emotional high that I'm still coming down off of two and a half years, two years later. Mm. Great race. But man, that first lap, when, like these guys, they're in a big, you can see them going down there. Uh-huh. There's not really room to run yet, right? They're just kind of. A lot of the paths are quite narrow. And on the edge of the path, I mean, you have to stay on the path anyway as part of the rules. But um, there's a lot of cactuses out there, cacti. Oh my gosh, friend. We were doing the hot lap yesterday. There are cactuses. Not technically, I mean, maybe on the course. I don't know how if you, it depends where you draw the line for the course. But, but they're if, right next to the course. Yeah. And, I've got and, a couple like, of scratches and, and just from doing the hot lap walking. And, and these aren't like the cute Snoopy cactuses. These are like real cat, Like, like you, beetles. You, they'll go through your web suit. They might go through your shoes. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be a legitimate concern, especially middle of the night when you're tired. Um, when you're when it's three a.m. and you're walking or running, 12, 14 yeah. an hour, um, you're just kind of there's parts of it where you're just kind of staggering from point to point, and that's going to be something the athletes going to need to be very aware of as you watch the terrain here. You, you might. I, I think terrain as well is going to be tricky. Now this, I actually got um, cut my hands off yesterday. I went down it too fast. This, yeah, this area has a rope, but there are a few little hills with uneven terrain, big, not big rocks, like giant ones, but twist an ankle, which could become a bit dangerous during the night. Uh, could, you know, people their eyes out on what's going on. Anytime you have these big epic obstacles, which we'll get to see some as the, as the athletes get through the course, there, there's about, you know, mother or Everest to worry about injury, right? Like, if I fall off this, I can get hurt. And that's absolutely possible mm. and it happens from time to time but what the real risk of injury or the more common injury on a world service motor is stuff like that hill right that going yeah. down that hill rolling your ankle uh, taking a spill coming off of a wall and just landing funny and when you're not something. necessarily paying attention anymore yeah it's, it's the ones you're not necessarily on guard for right yeah. you're when you're on motorhorn and you're 60 feet in the air mm. you're like i need to be careful i need to watch where i put my feet but when you're you know, running down a slight slope, it's, it's not as, uh, it, it's, it can surprise you sometimes. It's like they say about car crashes, most of them happen within a certain distance of home, where you feel safe and you don't need to think so much. But yeah, but then also because you're, every time you drive, drive near your home, right? You don't always drive uh, near that's Target. A good point. That's you don't always point. drive, like percentage-wise, I think that's the... Okay, fair. Fair, fair, fair. So they're out there. They're 15, 20 minutes into it. They're... This is, they're never going to feel better than they feel right now. <laughs> when I go running, I don't know about you, but when I go for a run, the first mile is always terrible. Like, yes, no matter the warm what, up. What I, know is awful. Yeah. I, I used to find when we do, I don't know, in the UK Spartan races, they do a warm up. Um, and, you know, they show you what the burpee looks like. And Spartan sure. in the UK is really good fun. And me and my sister sometimes run together and we're both very honest with each other. We'd be like, I'm tired of the warm-up. <laughs> this is worrying. And it was kind of before I realized, oh, yeah, because the warm-up is the tiring bit. <laughs> and then you get into it. Lindsay Webster told me once, Lindsay's a elite athlete. Um, she told me that she, for the short races, she up intensely. Mm. Because you want to be hot when you get to the starter line mm. for a short race. For a long race like this, it's not as... I'm sure warm up, warming up is good, but you've got 24 hours to warm well, you're up. You're warming up on your on so your lap, got, aren't you? You get those miles in. Talking about Lindsay, uh, she was at OCWC a couple of weeks ago. She had a really good race, and the sh- it reminds me because the short race. I don't know if you saw the finish line. What happened there? Very it was, exciting. Uh, yeah, Nicole overtook within seconds. It's amazing. There are just athletes who can take on so many different distances. It's interesting because of those fence crossings that we have, the group hasn't broken up as mm. much as I think traditionally you would see at this point in the race. Mm. There's a, there's bigger groups, bigger clumps of athletes here. And what's, what happens every year is, you know, we'll be going and she's, she's doing a good race there. Look at her smile on her face though. Good for her. I, I think it's also important to point out that it is as dry as it looks. I mean, we took bottles of water out on the hot lap yesterday, and well, I got through them. Yeah, it's it's very hot. It's very warm. It's very dry. It's very dusty. And it's windy. Mm. The the uh, almost a must have alongside that wetsuit is chapstick this year. Oh god, yeah. Um, we did five miles yesterday, and I'm, I live dry. So dry. We got in. 
So yeah. I would, uh, it's a little late now, but I recommend that. <laughs> if you're playing it for next year, my, I just, I love this race. I love watching this race. And if, if you're an athlete at home and you're like, man, I don't think I could ever do 24 hours. That's, that's crazy. Mm. Well, you're right. It is crazy. The human body is not supposed to run for 24 hours. So this is the hill where they'll be doing um, the grappler. The grappler. You so see you can them, see it at the top. You can see the top. They're walking up the hill. They're going to be, when the obstacle opens up, they'll be throwing a rope at, landing in those V-shaped um, openings, and then pulling themselves up. So you asked yesterday when we were looking at this obstacle whether it was... Uh, there was a gender disparity, and whether it was necessarily fair. I asked the marshal. I said, "Have you noticed women being unable to do this obstacle more than men?" And uh, he said, "No." He's like, "No, it's it's just it seems chance." It looks like there we go, Carlo and Carlo Piscitello and Jack Goris. Our right, Carlo, if you want to follow the OCR report on Instagram, really Carlo's work. It'd be also Jack's work in our photos of and our race. Oops, our. Uh, race photos from today they'll be up uh i want to say by tomorrow jack's really good about getting those, those he photos. is he's very good and he takes very good pictures i yeah. like to wind jack up all the time when he when i saw him a couple of weeks ago he's taking pictures and i was very seriously went up to him i was like jack come here i just need to talk to you for a second <laughs> the first time i've ever seen him he looks slightly worried i was like why do you get off being so it's, he's he's remarkably i i, I firmly best photographer in the sport of obstacle course racing, award-winning photographer. I agree. He's also done some work, freelance work, in Ukraine in war coverage. Oh, he's heading back there soon. I think next week. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I think he's got a fundraiser going to help him buy protective equipment. So take a look at his Instagram page and help him out. That grappler obstacle we got to see for a second. The athletes have already moved past it there. It's interesting because there's a couple schools of thought on how you throw that rope up. I'm looking forward to when the obstacles open up so we can see more of the storage. It'll be really good fun when we get the cameras going, the static cameras, so we can see people going through. So let's have a talk about what the obstacles are then that we're going to be seeing. What's different this year from last year? What is uh, a must-see? And uh, we, a few that we tried out yesterday, Melting Point, that was that was new from last year. Melting Point is a new one. It's, it looks like an obstacle called Tipping Point. Um, it's a, uh, you get into a pool of water and there is a, a culvert, a pipe, a black pipe, probably 20 feet long that's elevated and it's on a teeter totter is not the right word, but if I say it's a seesaw. teeter totter, a seesaw, then it, it, it paints the picture the best. So you, you pull the pipe down to you, you crawl into the pipe, there's a rope inside, you pull yourself along and when you get to about the halfway point, the the teeter totters and it'll, <laughs> it'll slide you on down to the exit. Well, Mike did it uh, also with us. He's doing a podcast this weekend and he splashed into the water with such power that he splashed me. And then you did it and you were a bit more controlled because you were then getting advice from other people. I had seen, I saw Mike go through it and I saw Jason go through it first. So I, I kind of, I, I was almost not going to do it, mm. but the fact I was kind of scared of doing it, I was like, well, if you're scared of doing it. That means you probably shouldn't do it. So, mm. so I got in there. Yeah, it's it's you. So you pull yourself up to the uh, the rope. It, the rope is. I want to say the roof of the. It's a pipe. So, but so if I say the roof, you know what I'm talking about. Mm. About two feet in, and two feet from the exit, and it makes a, a, a little bow. So you pull yourself along. Last minute, I uh, and you know you're about to slide forward, but because of the way the rope is attached to the front and the back of the pipe, you can pull back. So you can kind of control your descent out of the out of the culvert. Um, so the, the reason they call it melting point is what they told us, and we will, we'll see this when it opens up, is the front water pool is hot, and the and the, the entry water pool is hot water, oh. and the exit water is cold. Oh, that's interesting. So we'll see uh, how that shakes out when you get, they're passing Operation there right now. It was Operation here last year? Operation was not here last year. I don't think so. Operation is a, kind of a classic World Stuff is Better obstacle. It's It comes back every two to three years. We'll see it on course. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, <clears throat> it's an electric based obstacle and those are always controversial because mm. is does electricity belong on a competitive world championship course it's kind of a because you can't really train for electricity right you can maybe get used to it um i say you can't train for electricity you can train for cold water you can go do ice baths you can do cold plunges you can 
your body can become accustomed and used to, and you can even enjoy cold water. I, I, I think the obstacles that challenge you in different ways, other than just technical grip, or because uh, there are, you know, there are a lot of grip obstacles or strength obstacles. I think the ones that challenge you in a different way. It's why I always love balance beams. Like people find them surprisingly hard, and I get it when you're racing and you know you're full of which we have a balance beam this year, but when you're full of, you know, adrenaline and you're moving fast, yes, it's going to be difficult to do a balance. The same thing with operate. Like it's having that body control, that um, sense of mind to be able to keep steady and take your time and do it. And I think that's a test that is good for the athletes as well. Twinkle Toes is our balance beam obstacle you're talking about. Nobody's at five o'clock tonight. Uh, that is such a... I don't know how to describe it. Not frustrating because it's very simple. You're walking on a two by four, right? Mm -hmm. Literally every person alive can, walk has, like that. can do it. Yeah. Everyone can do it. Anyway, I don't care how fit you are or not, how what your car like, when's the last time you were inside. Anyone can, you can go on a curb and practice it. Yeah. And, but just elevate that that two by four. It's not that it's like three feet above the ground. Maybe it's, or it's above water. Or it's above water. Yeah. yeah. It's it, there's something about it being a beam, and I do it all the time. Like I'm a kid when I walk on uh, pavements, I'll walk on the edge or I'll sure. walk on a wall. And balance is pretty much the only thing I can actually do. Any other obstacles, but I can do that. So it kind of astounds me because I'm just like, you just walk, just walk. But this again, it's a mental above water i love that challenge of 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 giving people that that mental i mean i, I think we saw, a, sorry, we saw a spartan race a couple of weeks ago like an obstacle uh, an athlete falling off an obstacle it was a balance beam it's beam. yeah it's a, it's a fun it's a fun uh obstacle. and usually uncle toes will have a penalty associated with it so if you can't do it then uh you pay for it so what's going on with um so Statue of Liberty obstacle going up to midnight to six AM. Midnight to six AM. So what that is is every app will receive a torch. Mm -hmm. uh, not exactly a tiki torch, but similar to that where it's lit at the top and you get the torch at the at the start of the obstacle, then you get in water and you have to swim. Now, usually most of the athletes will be in wetsuits by then, so the swimming mm. isn't, isn't strenuous. You just float on your back. You keep it floating up. Keep it. So if the flame gets extinguished, if you drop it in the water, you have to return back and start start over. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we, if we look at the map, and I don't think we have a picture of the map that I can show you right now on screen, um, but it kind of it loops round and cuts off Augustus Gloop. The course, the course will chilly during that, that midnight to six. Okay. Just so that, that the course can get to a body of water. Okay. So that they can uh, cross. And, and it's not really a, a hard obstacle to do. You know, I mean, for me, getting to into water is a hard obstacle. Uh, you know, that, that cold feeling, that's, that's, that's the biggest obstacle for me. I'll bet you, I, I would wager most athletes will be in a wetsuit by midnight. Unless if it's super warm, we'll see. Even if it's warm, man, I, it's nice to have the wetsuit just for the protection. When you're banging into stuff, you're mm. going into Everest and banging against that wall. When you're rubbing against ropes, going up and down Mutterhorn. Mm. Um, this year, the Augustus Loop is rope-based instead of tube-based. Yeah, so you tried that out yesterday, so, didn't you? Did that yesterday. It's nice for obstacles like that where you're going to get you know, rubbed and wear and tear on your body. It's nice to have that wetsuit to, uh, to absorb it. Another look at the operation booth there. If you look at it, you can see it's enclosed there. Operation's gonna be dark. That's gonna be a fun one when the when the athletes get to that. Um, yeah, Augustus Loop was. If you've done Augustus Loop at a, at a regular tough butter in the past, typically you get into a, up the water, and then there's a, a corrugated pipe, maybe yeah, 15 feet tall. Mm -hmm. you, you go duck under and, and into the pipe. The pipe is vertical, and then inside that pipe there are handholds where you climb up. Mm -hmm. And while you're climbing up. They are spraying water at the top. If you remember the loop where Charlie and Charlie 30 got this loop, sucked up that pipe. That's what you're doing, is you're going up the, uh, the pipe. Well, they probably replaced it with a circular cargo net. Mm. And you have to climb up the cargo net. It's much more difficult to climb than just the handholds, like climbing holds mm. from from previous versions of the obstacle. Do you think it'll be easier for people? Because Augustus Gloop has always looked like a bit of a claustrophobia style 
obstacle I felt, you know, going up a tube, which will be dark at times, and with water pouring down into your face, for me, it's felt more like a, a fear than a skin. You know what? That's a great observation. I think that was where the difficulty was, was, like, was in the stress level, raising the stress level, right? Um, physically, it wasn't the hardest obstacle. You just tuck your chin down to keep water so you can breathe, and you climb up, like mm. climbing up a, a ladder, essentially. Now you're climbing a cargo net, and you're right, there's no claustrophobia, it's, it's wide open, you can see everything. But it's much, physically, it's much harder. I suppose it depends how much water they pour down, because yesterday, whilst you were doing it, there was the marshal uh, watching who was giving advice on how to do it, and we were talking about it afterwards, and you're like, well, she said to spider it, but I went forward and that was fine and Jason made a valid point yeah but when you put your hands in front you'll tip back slightly and that will give you the water full in your face I will be interested to watch that obstacle because the, I don't know if she was a volunteer or a top butter employee yesterday at the obstacle she was she was telling everyone and it meant like a spider mm. which means your arm legs out to your side mm -hmm. and climbing up and then the, and the, her logic behind that and she was explaining it was that it keeps the circular netting that you're climbing up yep. in a in a vertical alignment mm. whereas naturally you probably want to climb it like a ladder mm -hmm. which is your hand in front of you and when you when you do that we're hearing clapping would we, we may, be expecting we to see the first athletes through the, uh, the finish line here we'll see who they are so once they come through we'll get the the results oh, we'll be able to see so if people are coming through, this should be the first athletes of the sprint lap. So they're finishing the sprint lap now. This is the, the male sprint lap winner. Quite cut up on the knees there. Did you catch that? Kevin Thompson with the uh, with the sprint lap win for the men. Nice. So Kevin Thompson for the men, and we're looking for the uh, for the first woman to come through. We're just the, uh, sprint lap. trying to get the uh, results updated here on our computer. As we say, as always, having the. Um, We'll stick with the finish line camera here for a minute while we wait for the uh, for the first woman, and then also for more men to come through. We'll, uh, we'll see who they are. Uh, Kevin did not look super like uh, it looked like Kevin's goal was to win the sprint lap. He was pretty cut up. He had uh, cuts on his knees. He looks like he'd really he'd really pushed for it. We are here with you all night. If you do have anything to chat about, send us comments on YouTube. We will be <laughs> checking up on them as much as we can and trying to kind of give you the information that you want. Uh, Thomas G. Peterson asking, is there a good site where laps and latest laps or something can be seen throughout the results? Uh, Lisa, the results. <laughs> We're just trying to get that done. Um, having a few connectivity issues here, as always. Ah, so, uh, somebody else commented race briefing specifically said no Statue of Liberty this year with the lake. So, uh, this sucks to us for not paying enough attention to what's going on. Well, at least we talked about it. It's a nice, fun obstacle. Let's go Team UK. We've got a few UK athletes out this year. James Burton, he's uh, an elite British athlete. He's got quite a good goal this year, so let's see how he gets on. And it sounds like we've got another athlete coming through. We can hear the, the bells ringing, ding in. And here we go. Let's see who they are as they come through. 
false alarm. That was uh Yeah, <laughs> that is one happy dance. <laughs> All right, 19 more. <laughs> Don't dance yet. <laughs> Good for him. Good for him. Four, five. Six, six five. five. You want to, uh, you want to talk in like, maybe like an hour or so? Yeah. You want to just talk? So first lap done, when you get that first lap done, you know you're just started, but it's a good feeling. You've got it under your belt. You, uh, you're, you're looking at your times. Here's a super common, uh, it's not a joke, but a super common thing people talk about. You'll hear people talk about it at the brunch uh, on Monday. Oh, I was on pace for 100 miles. <laughs> and then the obstacles open. <laughs> well, yeah, no, we, we all were. We were all at pace for 100 miles the first lap. I mean, I wasn't. I never have been. <laughs> Hot lap took two hours. But some of these guys are going to run 100 miles. So, start fast this easy. It's kind of wild to think about. What that guy, what those two guys have just done, they mm -hmm. just, 19 more, and uh, they get an orange jacket. It doesn't sound that many when you say it like that, does it? No. Nah, I did one. 19, I did one in... Uh, 30, 30 odd minutes yeah. to do... Uh, to do the five Shoot, miles. Man, I might as well do 200 miles. Why would yeah. I slow down? Ooh. There we go. Third man. Four, five, eight, six. Coming through, our fourth man through. Outstanding. Well done. And now they're now they're starting to come in. Here's our fifth guy. Looks like Josh Fiore. Fiore, he is a voting threat for this race. Chris Mendoza. Christopher Mendoza. Chris Mendoza has won this race. He's run 100 miles multiple times. Chris Mendoza is a world's toughest mutter, beloved member of the community. It's such a nice atmosphere here on this finish line with the first athletes coming through. Yep. Everyone's cheering me. Everyone's well. cheering for him. Everyone's, everyone's happy for everyone. And even, even toward the end of the race, everyone is happy for everyone's accomplishment. There's no, um, there's no bitterness or whatever. So our first men through, John, Kevin Thompson was first through. We saw him. Jonathan Stern in second, Michael Schott in third, Kevin Anderson in fourth, Joshua Fiore in fifth, James Burton in sixth, Christopher Mendoza just passed through in seventh, Andrew Losh in eighth. So there are, I mean, I spoke to James Burton yesterday and he was aiming, he said he was aiming for 100. He's the only person okay. who's spoken about miles. Sure. Um, all eyes are on him well, uh, possibly being able to do that this year. So to take the top spot. Kelly Glenn. We have eyes on Kelly Glenn as our first woman through the sprint lap. Oh, Kelly Schweikart. Kelly Schweikart is our first woman through. We had a chat with her earlier in the pits. Uh, she was one that said she wasn't necessarily talking about miles. She was talking about position because the miles change every year depending on what happens. There's another chunk of that. Here comes Chris Roglowski. Chris Roglowski right behind her. So Chris literally Austin Hayes over the wind coming in with Chris. Chris let's see let's remember she got 100 miles first woman ever to get 100 miles in the world's longest mother. I mean the seconds behind uh, the leader of the team at Oh Katie Knight coming through. Tyler Veerman. Tyler Veerman. And another man Together. I missed. Katie Knight has won this race. Maybe did her miles last year. 
and all the athletes. Okay, this is what we're waiting for. This is what we're excited about. I love this part of the race. So Tyler and Chris have been doing a lot of miles this year, very long races. They've really been getting those numbers in. Chris Roglowski told us last weekend she did rim to rim to rim at the Grand Canyon, and then something else, and then she ran her miles for her ran her mileage for her birthday. Yeah. And I was like, how old are you? 24? She's like, I'm 27. I'm old. And I'm like, <laughs> we're both like, <laughs> Hilarious, 27 year old. Evan from Paris. But I mean, last year, Chris, what did you seven 100 milers over the summer or something? Or over the year? As you do. And then, and then did 100 miles here, number eight. She has that mental capacity to push and push. So Callie Schweikart in first place for the women coming through. Uh, again, very early in the race. The race doesn't start till midnight, but I am excited to see what Callie Schweikart does this next 24 hours. Yeah, I would like to see her doing well. And I, I hope this going fast on the sprint lap is a, a negative one. Now, Krista Glaske clearly is the favorite. She ran 100 miles last year. She's run more miles than any woman has ever run. And before Chris ran 100 miles last year, no woman had ever run more than 90. Yeah, so she not no. only just broke the record, she smashed the record. Yeah, the record was 90. Three women had run 90. Another woman coming through. So not only, yeah, so Katie Knight, Amelia Boone, and Ray Coble. Katie Knight's won World Seven Mutter. Ray's won it twice. Amelia's run it, won it three times. Nikki Caramba just came through. Nikki's a new name to me, so we'll see Nikki how she does. Strong early start to Nikki Caramba. And we're looking at, right just out of interest, between Callie, who came through the sprint lap first, and Nikki, who just came through. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Two minute difference. Seven minutes between the first male and the first female. Sure. So Chris, Chris last year dominated the the course. She ran 100. Now, now if you look at the mileage for all the other women, got another woman coming through she was, here. She was what you would expect for the women. The women typically 80 to 85, 90 miles wins it for the women's race. The, it wasn't an easy course last year. The women had a outside of Chris's finish. It was a typical field. It was it was what you we would usually expect. Chris dominated she the course dominated last it. year. Well, they did say last year, didn't they? Giles was saying this is a really tough course. You know, people are going to really struggle. And then, and then Chris kind of, she, she like we say, she smashed uh, the record. But the first place male was 105 miles. She was 100 miles. So the difference has always been a lot bigger. You know, the, in uh, 2021, it was a difference of 90 miles for first place female and 115 for the male. Yeah. So we're looking at normally a much bigger gap. So actually, yeah, that was correct. It was a tough course, just not for Chris. You know what? Something we should we will keep an eye on throughout this course. We talked about how Ray Coble is the only person to ever win the sprint lap in a race. Um, Kelly Schweikart seconds ahead, finished the first lap seconds ahead of Chris Rogloski. If Chris Rogloski had run the sprint, had won the sprint lap yeah. just now, we would be having that same conversation. Exactly. Oh my gosh, Chris! Chris just won the sprint lap. Could you do it? There's no reason Callie couldn't win the sprint lap and then also win the race. Absolutely. Now, Chris is Chris Rogloski, big competition. If you're gonna if you're gonna win the race, you've got to be Chris Rogloski. So, Chris versus Callie will be uh, will be fun to watch over the next. So we have had two hours. more women come through. Obviously, a lot fewer women coming through than men. Uh, they were Stephanie Bland and Jenny Overstreet. Oh, Jenny Overstreet. She was a name we spoke about a she lot last year. Third place last year with 85 miles. And another lady crossing right now. We saw one guy cross the finish line and he changed out of his wetsuit pants immediately. <laughs> he uh, wasn't loving that. Here comes Hannah Carter. Love her. Crossing the finish line. Hannah already wearing her wetsuit bottoms. So is Sarah Tucker just uh, coming through just before Hannah. I mean, it's hot right now. I'm standing still and I'm slightly concerned for my skin. Let's yeah, that I, uh, I want to tell Hannah to change out of the bus like bottoms, but she ran 80 miles last year, so I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. I she's think she knows what she's doing. Yeah, she knows what she's doing. She doesn't need us to in here from the booth. She does not. Backseat drivers. These guys all look strong. Everyone looks good. I was I just thinking that. Like, 
people running through. They just they look emotionally and physically strong. Like yeah, that, that just look good. And they're all running. Really makes me want to run more. <laughs> We're seeing a little bit of quick pit action. Uh, athletes running up to their family and their, their friends, their pit crew, grabbing a bottle of water, grabbing some quick nutrition. So the first obstacle to open is going to be uh, blah, 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 snogging dirt at 1 p.m. That's obstacle number four. A lot of a lot of athletes can, can miss that, can't they? Still, if they're coming through now, they're going to miss. They'll be asked it, yeah. yeah. 45 here locally, 45 minutes into the race. Dublin walls, a little bit further on. So. And after that, it's 2 p.m., 2 p.m. for the obstacles. So those guys running in the front are going to be missing. Friend, this is exciting. Oh, like when the athletes started coming through, the first athlete, we've been sitting here 45 minutes, you know, watching, you know, a lot of walk-in, a lot of, but when the athletes started coming through in mass, we both stood up. Yeah. We're like on our feet watching this. We're, uh, I'm invested. I wish these um, headphones were wireless so we could stand there by the finish line. If these headphones are wireless, then we'd be out there giving high fives and stuff. Exactly. We're, uh, But yeah, they look good. All, all of these guys, look at them. The idea is what kind of speeds we've seen on previous uh, first laps, sprint laps. They're typically 30, 35 minutes. Okay. It's not, you know, it's... So it's we're looking at kind of the average kind of time stuff. Yeah. This course, elevation-wise, has less elevation than Vegas. And I'm very comparable to Laughlin. Mm -hmm. Maybe give or take 100 feet, 200 feet. There's a few steep little hills. Yeah. They're short but steep. Oh, that guy's a balloon. And they keep coming through. Looking strong. Looking strong. So one lap down, 19 more to go, maybe nine more to go. If you're shooting for 50 miles, most of the regular, I say regular athletes. Here go. Yeah, this is, this, you know, we talked about this. Like, if you're going to sign up for this course, you're, there's already something a little inside you where you're like, there goes Kevin Chow. Kevin Chow. So but, somebody is asking, what obstacles will the static cams be set up at later? So we're going to move them around a bit throughout the night. The first ones we've got them set up are at, um, what's it called this year? Funky Monkey, Chunky Monkey, Spunky Monkey, and Batterhorn. Uh, and then we're going to, we are going to move them depending on what the uh, what, what's going on, what people are doing, just to kind of keep it a bit more interesting. Yeah, like we're going we're to have a, like we have one set up at... Um, the rig obstacle with the bananas. Spunky monkey. Spunky monkey. But when when it gets to the middle of the night and you're that constantly, that's not going to be fun to watch. Just people falling on the first obstacle. So we'll move it to uh, to Mutterhorn or to Everest or something more exciting. So a regular athlete. I say regular athlete. Like I'm a I'm a dad in his 40s. I run and I lift. But I'm never going to run 100 miles at World Stubble's Butter. So for me, if, if that's you, someone like that, 50 miles is the, the goal. Um, you can set it however you want. Is tough. 50, when you reach 50 miles, you get a bib. And I've always said the um, the second best thing about World Stubble's Butter is the community. Mm -hmm. And the first best thing is the sweet, sweet bib. <laughs> And so everyone gets a bib, you see them running through. If you're, if you're like, I want a World's Toughest Mutter bib, you're wearing my regular Tough Mutter events next year, just sign up and come. You get a bib. But you run 50 miles. You get a brown. And if you're 75 miles, silver bib. 100 miles will get you the gold bib and the orange jacket for 100 miles. Oh, we got a picture earlier with Chris in her 100 mile orange jacket. Chris is the only woman to earn that orange jacket. So for a regular guy running, if you're looking at this, you're like, man, can I do this? Elliot Reeb coming through. And followed by Mario. Shout out to Elliot Reeb. Uh, so yeah, so 50 miles is your goal. That was my goal for years and years. And 
and I finally years ago. Then uh, these guys are one one lap. You need ten laps, fifty miles. They're just swimming through the finish line. Uh, ten percent up. Just got to do it ten more times. That's all. That's uh, that's race math. Oh, he's the barefoot guy. Oh, our barefoot runner. Okay. Oh man, I gotta get that guy's name. He ran last year, fifty miles barefoot. I talked with him afterwards. I said, so what kind of training did you do to run 50 miles barefoot? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, training. Raymond, Vincent Raymond. Vince, Raymond Vincent. Raymond Vincent. I was like, what kind of training did you do? He's like, what do you mean, training? I'm like, you just ran 50 miles barefoot, man. Like, how'd you prepare? He's like, oh, I just showed up and did it. I'm like, what are you talking about? Bubbles and clouds. Bubbles. Bubbles. That's, the, that's the first lap finish. Let's see what the 10th lap finish looks like, Bubbles. Well done. Good job. He's like, yeah, I just wanted to see if I could do 50 miles barefoot. I'm like, well, you did it. I remember watching him last year as his feet slapped across the finish line. I was thinking, God damn, they must be cold. I don't even like walking. Uh, I don't even I don't even like walking uh, outside barefoot. So. What's up? Hey, we're going to bring a special guest into the booth. This is three-time World Toughest Mudder world champion, Amelia Boone. How's it going? Oh, we have three? You're good, you're good. Hey, Amelia, how are you doing? I, uh, I'm fantastic. So, to be here. So we're watching the finish of the sprint lap. Yep. You won the sprint lap a few years ago. Uh, 2019. 2019, okay, yes. four years ago. Time flies. Yeah, I was I was smart enough to not do that again. <laughs> you, uh, I think you told me that you had all the other bibs, but you wanted that one. Yes. So, yes. what was it like to scratch that that bib off your list? Uh, you know, it was uh, uh, probably not the wisest thing in hindsight if I wanted to go on and do well in the race. But no, it was fun to 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 go for the sprint lap um, and just just uh, crush it out there for the for the first one. But it takes a toll, you know. I think that's why you generally don't people winning the sprint lamp lap and then winning the race there are exceptions but it did it rated it once but um, as far as i know that's the only one that ever done i think so too yeah i think you're right I, I, the men i don't think there's ever been a male sprint lap winner who's not one to win podium for that matter so then i saw you posted this week that you actually there was one more bib you hadn't scratched off your list that you scratched off this weekend Correct. what's that last bib that last bib is the pit crew bib actually so uh Yes, so I, I do a pit crew bib this year, uh, and I'm helping out whoever needs help. Technically, Trevor, but Trevor doesn't need help, so uh, yeah, it's it's good to be here in whatever capacity I can. Trevor Psychos? Yes. He runs 100 miles every year. Yes. How did he look good going out? Uh, he looks. Trevor always looks good. He's always calm. He last night we're staying in the same house. He said. Never heard till midnight. He says, see me in the back for a really long time. Like, you're not going to see me out of front. He said, but by midnight, I will be in front with everybody else. So he knows what he's doing, for sure. Like, I don't, I haven't even seen him run. I, yeah, I haven't either. No. So, <laughs> which is funny. Um, but, yeah, he knows what he's doing. Um. Hey, Jason. What does blinking red mean? It was blinking red a second ago. Was it on? That's on. That's on. You're on. So, Amelia, I think part of that we might have lost, but that's yeah, all right. Um, so, I've only worked pit crew one time. It was a few years ago, but I remember when they all left the start line. Um, as soon as they all left, I had this intense emotion of, I am so alone right now. Like, I'm supposed to be out there, and I'm here, and they're all gone. And I know you're surrounded by, there's hundreds of other pit crew, but the athletes are gone. And I felt, that's where I belong. 
Did you did you get any of that when the star line left? Oh, absolutely. It was terrible. They all they all ran away, and I sat there being like, "Wait, no, no, wait. This is actually real. I'm not running this. It's weird to be on the other side of the fence. Um, not used to that at all." I felt sad. It's definitely isn't sad. It, isn't it like it's like I feel like I planned it ever? But I felt sad. Yeah. It's, I think it's really when reality kind of hits in. Like when I was setting up yesterday with people, it's there. You're like, okay, I'm not running. I'm not running. I'm not running. And I've known I haven't. I've known for three months that I'm with this. Sure. But it's still it really become real and take, take off. Okay. And then you're sitting there and you're like, I guess I'm just waiting every hour or so for you to come back. Yeah. And it'll be like you're helping other people too, not just Trevor, right? You're yeah, no, I have four eyes and Anne and then just whoever leave mid race to go to London for work. So I'm just <laughs> helping out while I can and, and then making the trip elsewhere. Team Four Eyes, good to see them back again. Team Four Eyes is a constant. Um, they are. It's funny because we see each other once a year, pretty much, maybe one other race. But I have been with them every year since 2011, and they are just the best. They're absolutely the best guys. Um, and that crazy little sport brought us together. So. It's cool because when you come back to World Tough as Butter, you're kind of a celebrity. Like you, you can blend in during your day job. When mm -hmm. you come to Tough Butter, like you're one of the legends of the, uh, of the sport. It, that's true. If people have been around for a while, <laughs> I have. I have not been around. You know for a long time. It's been kind of a, uh, a hit or miss several years for me, um, but I still I still try and show up when I can. <laughs> You're still the only woman three times. That is true. What do you, uh, when you see the, like Blosky, uh, what, what do you think of running today? I like how beyond where we were 10 years ago um, in, terms, in terms of just uh, in terms of they were that's what I'm saying. No, uh, they're they're fantastic, and I, I think it will be a really good race um, between a lot of the top women um, this year. So I'm looking forward to it. So I have a spreadsheet of like all the yeah. top ten finishes over the past year. Yeah. And as I was looking at it, preparing for this weekend, what's that out is that you are the time winner. We talked about. Yeah. But you also you won second ten years apart. 2011 oh. and 2021. That's some longevity in the sport. Yeah, there's no, no shame in that game. <laughs> and I think we also realized, Trevor pointed this out um, the other day, is that I am the only woman to finish on the men's podium. You almost won it outright. Right. I was and seven minutes back. So I'm the only woman to ever finish second overall. Yeah. But that, that feels weird to say I'm tooting my own horn. But uh, it's actually pretty cool because I don't think I finished fourth overall. In 2017. Okay. But um, yeah, so the only woman to have landed would, would like crash the men's podium. Did much. they have podiums back then? Like, did, did they? Uh... No, there was like a big. It was kind of. They brought us up. It was pre brunch. Like, they didn't it have was brunch pre. Back we then. didn't have brunch. They gave it like right afterwards. I remember I finished. In, I was like hobbling around. I was hypothermic. And they're like, you need to get on stage with Will Dean right now. And so somebody has to help me up on stage. They give me this massive check. But at that point, they actually only paid the top winner. And like, third place got nothing. So it was winner takes all. Sure. $15,000 for the winner. Second, third, nada. Sure. Um, but so, yeah, there was none of that. There was no podium. I came about maybe in 2014 was the first time we had an actual sure. podium. Uh, and maybe that was the first year of the brunch. But no, yeah. No pit crew back then. And no pit crew. 20, 2011, you actually, they were forbidden. You couldn't have any help. I think 20, and same with 2012. So I think they could come in during the day, but no one could be there during the night. So it was a very, very different race. To watch this now, because it's such a well old oil machine, you have the quick pit and people are coming through, grabbing bottles, going. We had to go back in tents, grab all of our own. Back in my day is what I sound like right now. <laughs> but um, you think about how that just changes the dynamics of the race and how much faster it is. And like the fact that you don't have to rummage around and set everything up and be self-sufficient. I actually, I remember being very upset when they started having pit crew because I thought it was an unfair advantage. Because you can't compete now if you don't have pit crew unless you're Trevor Psychos. So um, it is remarkable to see guys like Trevor who yeah. bring like a shoebox of 
stuff. Got, he's got his ironing board. Yeah, and it, literally, he has an ironing board. Yes. That he'll, and some people have entire tents yeah. and like facilities that they bring in, basically. Right. Yeah. And then Trevor, top of the top, yeah, I got an ironing board, and I'll put my gummy fish on top of it. Or something. Exactly. He's got some cans of Pringles, and uh, he's ready to rock and roll. I'm like, Trevor, what do you need? He's like, eh, eh. He, he fuels 100 miles of Pringles. Yeah, I think some other things I saw in there. Not sure what. This has been the race. Uh, I mean, you know, well, first of all, the course length changed over over the years. Um, so we, which is very different dynamic than five miles, because you have ten miles out there. That is a much harder to wrap your head around. I think in terms of making sure that you have fuel and water. Um, and things like that. Five miles, you know, you can get it done within an hour, um, depending on how fast you're running. And so I think that was just an added um, dynamic that makes it a bit easier now, though it does make it more tempting to stop more often because you back around. These owners at this point, they're not stopping. You know, nobody's stopping. They, they grab a bottle and they go. Um, so those days are long gone. I like to tell the regular folks that are running, trying to get 50 miles. Yeah. The pit is your enemy. It is. You think it's your friend, but it's not. It's your enemy. You need mm -hmm. to get in. You need to get out. Oh, absolutely. Because I think that's always eight stations in an ultra or something like that. you you got to put a timer on and say five minutes and I'm out. My first traditional ultra, yeah. like running, I came up to a aid station and it was a buffet. They had, like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I had to like, I left it, but I was like, it was, I was like, that was not a good decision. But. Yeah, no, yeah, it's it's easy to get sucked in there, um, you know, and and, as you're, and like the time just goes by. And it's very doable to get 50 miles out here. You just keep moving. And I think stopping at all in this race is really the enemy of those miles. Um, you get sucked in. So you're not able to run this year. Um, no. You'll be gone. When you see everyone out there running, see your friends running, see elites that you compete against, does it make, like, do you think about next year? What are your... Oh, absolutely. I was really excited for this year. And things that people actually don't know is I had an entire this year is that I was running, um, I was going to do Chicago Toughest, or Chicago Infinity, Chicago Infinity, then the Killington Ultra Beast, and then I was going to come here for World Toughest Mutter as my first year in the Masters category. I was really excited to be in the Masters sure. category. Um, Were you? I was actually, yeah. I mean, because I'm like, oh, I, don't, I can't compete against Chris and Kate in the Masters category. Um, and so this is this was tough for me. It was a tough blow. Um, and to kind of like, no, but I, absolutely. I mean, I will come back out here as long as it is around. They're never going to be able to get rid of me, unfortunately. Um, and, and just compete as hard as I can. Because I still I would love, I mean, I would love to win it again. I don't know if it's feasible with my age and the other women but like i you know i feel like i've always had unfinished things to come out here you know too. i feel like as we age especially if you're putting miles in yeah like we stack that like like ryan atkins is still winning races like yeah he's, he's not getting younger either like yeah you get those years in the ultra running community some of the women winning outright are in their 40s yeah. like oh absolutely it's, it's, it's not the same as basketball yeah. to 26 whatever yeah and you get smarter and you know and it's it's a lot of mental aspect of it gets easier just because you're able able to handle it sure um so yeah you have, they'll they'll see me you all see me out here again next year wherever it is love to hear um, it yeah amelia boone three-time champion thank you much thanks for having me Amelia Boone, everybody. Three-time world champion. I would love to see her back here running. I would love to see her do it. It's true that we were looking at the... Um... Sorry, one <laughs> So watching the athletes come across, this is all still first lap finishers here. We were talking Everyone... this morning when we were looking at the contender list, and it's interesting that for... Um, uh, yeah. But a lot of sports, a lot of other sports, masters when you're in your 30s. And it kind of highlights the difference between this sport and other sports. 
you're kind of you're not you're not done at 28 basically i to me i think it's true that with endurance running the necessarily a bad like the experience the building that base year after year now if you're just starting out they're like oh hey i'm I'm 40 and I'm going to start this. You're like, well, you're going to be at a distance. I'll be but, fine. I'll be fine. But if you've been running since you're, you know, you're in high school and, and you've been stacking miles and miles and that experience. And also she mentioned a good point, the, the mental side of it, you build that mental grit. And there, there's absolutely, it's absolutely a factor that there's a mental aspect to it when you're out there by yourself mm. and you got to, your, your brain will start lying to you. Your brain will start. You don't, what do you have to prove? You, you did 50 miles last year. What are you, why are you trying to do 50 this year? Like, you don't have to prove anything to anybody. Like, your loved ones aren't even out here. They'll never know. Like, nobody even cares about this. This is just about you. Why are you, like, your brain. I would love to see, the, like, Amelia and Back and Chris, like, see what they would do. Chris is young. Amelia. Amelia knows what she's doing she's got the heritage she's she's got the mental capacity like they're both i think they could be a real driver for each other to achieve incredible things i would love to, i would love to see the mileage those two put up yeah i always say never bet against the champion but then if, if chris is going against amelia like yeah amelia's won it three times chris has won it once like who do you who do you pick i don't like i don't like making tricks no it'd be a good race it'd be, a good it'd, be race. it'd be fun to watch for sure Let's have a quick look, see what you're saying on the line, what you've got to, what you're talking to us about. If I can ever get there. We've got Giles here coming to join us. Giles Shader, CEO of Tough Mudder. Welcome to the booth. Uh, oh, thank you very much. I think there's a pretty awkward shot of my middle. Don't worry, that's uh, <laughs> it's also a very awkward shot of my middle and I would not ever put that out on camera. So Giles oh, is in our happened? booth with us. We're showing him this is what everyone can see out there. This is our picture in picture. These are all other cameras we have, but this is what is, is being broadcast right now. Superb. Just watching people come in. Look at all these really good faces. Fun. How's it all going out there? Oh, pretty well. You know, we think about the start of the race in a couple of couple of sections. You know, you've got to obviously get it off on time, which was good. Coach did a wonderful job. And then the sprint races, or the kind of sprint lap, is just a thing in itself. Right, any kind of sprint lap problems are just gone, don't really appear. So, you know, we're at the back of that, which is great. And then we'll just monitor, you know, the next couple of laps quite closely to make sure that, uh, you know, if there are any post points, of course, that appear, we get them tied up pretty quickly. Uh, and similarly, you know, just watching the obstacles over the next kind of four or five hours. And to make sure it's, it's processing smoothly. How do you choose which obstacles to open when? What's the process? Uh, a lot of it is about, you know, how we think about this event almost is uh, just people are here to have an amazing time and to just put some like monster endurance feats down. And mm. as best we can, we need to add to that, but not get them stuck or caught up anywhere. And so we look at uh, introducing obstacles that are going to thin out the course mm -hmm. uh, and kind of get people spread nicely over that five mile loops. Although there are no obstacles open yet, how are you feeling having had a lot of people come through the sprint lap? Oh, pretty good. I'm mean, pretty good. And the feedback we're in the races and looking around, you can see them coming across the finish line. Uh, you know, one lap down, they're looking pretty pleased uh, with what's out there. So, um, we'll take that as a good start, but it's <laughs> a bit like it is to the race. 
this 24 hour of this and our operation is um, 24 hours long and we'll continue to roll with whatever comes as they will, I'm sure. What are some differences so far between this year and last year? I mean, I'm more likely to get sunburnt this year than I did last year. <laughs> That's, uh, so, oh, there we go. Fran's got me some sun cream. I'm, I'm certainly on my second round. I'm a little bit tasty. Same. Um, I think I think the, the weather's a big part. The um, the quality it's firm underground. There are obviously some loose parts out there. There's not that much gradient, so that's a big part as well. But I think the thing that we've introduced to this that's probably the biggest change is ensuring that obstacle completion is rewarded. Um, all for the majority of the obstacles, you should be at a material advantage in the race over somebody who can't. Uh, and so I think the penalties are going to be a rig element of this for, for everybody. Let's talk about that. The penalties um, last few years, I don't want to say they were fun, but they weren't necessarily punishing. Talk, what, what I the mean, the glasses like? and the, the, the little two befores you had to walk on, that was pretty punishing. I felt like I was going to vomit. Yeah, I tell you what, some of that, you know, even the little in the little space hoppers, that's pretty savage on your legs. Um, I think it's the balance. I Even though we describe the penalties as fun as they are fun, I mean, let's be honest, uh, we do like to chuckle at, at TMHQ. It's always a treat to put something out there and uh, see people at it. Uh, but we're not, we're not just looking to mess around. This is obviously a serious race. And it's, that, it's that endurance runner who and almost switch their mind off and focus and keep going and by putting something that is uh fun uh, for, for want of a better word right a little bit irresponsible it requires them to kind of stop get out of that zone engage the, the brain deal with uh, the emotions the frustration the anger that comes with having to do something that feels inherently ridiculous uh, as well as like dealing with all the physicality of the event so you now i think that's a really important uh, we've also added running to most of those elements as well this year, so the, the combined penalty distances I think, uh, over a lap could make a, a yeah, the, the, big difference. They looked a lot longer than before, and, and I think you know we saw a lot last year, especially on Chunky Monkey, people just hopping into the water, hopping straight out and doing... It was the, the space hop for last year, which I think would cause havoc for cramp for me anyway, but people were choosing not to do obstacles, and it feels like you're kind of avoiding that. Well, that's certainly the plan. I was actually thinking back my first um, WTM back in Vegas. Uh, I was out with Eli on the night shift, and uh, we just sense of indignation. We'd marked this penalty, and people were choosing to do a, a penalty of the obstacle. It was like outrage. <laughs> Yeah, so we, did, we did. So we went into you know, pitch black. We had the UTV, not a lot of lights, so we just grabbed some stakes. We made it twice. Like we were not having it. Was, it was our age. He was well put out. Um, whilst we're not looking to be gratuitous, we're moving back in that direction with the penalties for sure. It should never be better penalty over completing the obstacle. Sure. And you can't blame the gas. It's almost a strategy thing for them. They think, well, man, if it takes me five minutes to go through the penalty and or five minutes to do the obstacle and three minutes to do the penalty, I'm going to get it. That's kind of on, on Tutter to say like, well, we're going to make that a harder decision for you or not make it an obvious decision the other way if we can. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's what's driven the change. So, do you know distance wise how many miles of penalties there are? Has that been mapped out? I mean, it has. I don't actually have that number off the top of my head. Um, I suspect you could generate a couple of miles of incremental penalties. Be honest, it certainly stack up over the uh, afternoon and evening. That's something always interesting to look at when they have some an athlete will have 50 course miles, but they look at their garment and they're like, they ran 58 miles. That, yeah, that was some penalties. Uh, can you imagine your uh, percent of lap in, in penalties? That's certainly going to add up. You know, uh, staring at that 100 miles. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the elites tend to not do as many penalties Indeed. as the rest, but still, if, if you did 105 miles on course, you probably did 110, 115 miles, right? I'd imagine. And that's always a balancing act for an event like this. Um, there's so much of the kind of the energy and the tradition and history comes from that kind of core group of Tough Mudder. And if you think, you know, most people are doing a Tough Mudder and are running 10 miles on a weekend, there's not a a natural obvious step from oh, I run 10 miles in the week and I'm going to come put 24 miles. The community does kind of bring people together, inspire them, and they go out and put some kind of awesome feats of athleticism down. Uh, and we need to design something that you know really works and is fulfilling and challenging for that group, as well as something that can pull people from 
outside of Tough Mudder, potentially out of OCR in that ultra space, who can look at this and go, like, this is a really meaningful kind of moment on that, you know, calendar of challenging races. I'd love, you know, Tough Mudder to sit in just the OCR environment. And we're, we're continuing to just, I guess, finesse uh, the rules, the field, how we think about it. Um, so that's one of the reasons you've seen the change uh, in how we do dealing with people who are eligible for podium. Right? We want somebody else to come in outside the sport, uh, potentially someone who is unknown. But if they put you know, the best race down on the day, we want to be able to reward and recognize them for that. Yeah. I think it's actually a really good change. We've talked about it a little bit, but basically anyone can sign up and run World's Toughest Mudder. They have to qualify as a contender or they can run in the open category. And if you win the race, you win the prize money. You're on top of the podium. You can get. You know, it doesn't matter where you started from two days ago or a week ago. You're welcome. And we, uh, I, you know, I spoke to a couple of people from the Spartan world this morning. And whilst we try and communicate these changes, I think uh, um, I've got to be honest, right? Not everybody reads everything we write, not least because of the sheer amount of emails we send out. Uh, and they were pretty stressed. They're like, oh, you know, I'm in open, but is there anything I can change? You know, I really want to be eligible. I'm like, well, don't worry. It's okay. You are eligible. Just, you know, go out and go out. Run. Um, and I like that. That said, that's said, we've got the Spartan break in the past going on, and I mentioned this um, when I was welcoming people in this morning. Uh, so I met a gentleman this morning, and he's like, oh, well, I came for the break all pass event. Uh, World Tough Mudder is included in the pass, so we thought I'd sign up. And, you know, I was like, oh, well, you know, I've not run a Tough Mudder before, but World's Toughest, I, you know, I guess that's like a spark beast. You know, one of the tougher this will be fine. Uh, and it wasn't until this morning that he found out it was 24 hours. <laughs> And he's still up for it. He's going to give it a bash, but you know, hasn't trained, not equipped. He's in for a real adventure overnight, I think. He showed up today, Saturday morning. And he didn't know where else Tuppence Mudder was 24 hours. Indeed, indeed. A um, little bit shell shocked when I was speaking to him, but you know, still up for it. He's going to give it a bash, and I, I like, I love that. I, I imagine he's shell shocked too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and if we think he's shell shocked now, but you've obviously, I mean, you got the orphan tent out there. You just got a pit crew, you know. Happy to keep an eye out on everybody so people will kind of reach in and, and give them a hug story. through the night. That's amazing. You mentioned the community that comes out you know, every year, repeat, versus like new people coming out. What, what do you know numbers, percentages? Like how many of the people come back every year? Like how many, how many of those are we looking at? So as we look at the breakout this year, um, 30% were new and 70% had run Worlds before. Oh, wow. Uh, and if you think about it you know, from the community and that feeling that it's a fairly like endemic event, actually having 30% is really good. Yeah. You know, we're really excited that we are managing to you know, convince people that this is a good idea. I joke about it absolutely not being a good idea. Um, it's great to be welcoming people in because it's just so impactful. It's such a good people, a family almost to you know, introduce people to. And then obviously the other side, you know, you have that 70% to repeat, but Loads of them have been running, you know, just 10, 10 worlds, 11 worlds for them. We've got some people who've been coming back for quite a while. Yeah, I can I can totally see how someone would look at World's Toughest Mudder and see it as a bucket list item. I want to do it once and I'm, I'm good. But and then I see, like, my experience, I came once and I've come back every year since. It's a great atmosphere. It's it's a community. It's uh, I, can, I can see how people do it either way. I'm glad that that many people are coming back every year. And I was speaking to, uh, I mean, there were people who were coming back just for the atmosphere, just to be a part of it. I was speaking to um, uh, DJ and Amelia on the start line, and neither of whom were running. And Amelia is actually flying out to the UK tomorrow morning, but still, you know, he's here today with with friends, as we, you know, allude to it, or with family, for the, the feeling. Same thing, DJ, I don't want to run, but he's like, no, I don't want to run. So I'm going to be here, something else, I'm uh, going to be involved. It's, it's wonderful, right? How wild is that, DJ? Fox in the event, the first place man. He's not running this year, but he came to pit for friends of his. It's just great. And same thing. I was, you know, I was walking through this morning, and Chris, uh, they're looking smart in their orange orange jacket. First woman to hit that hundred miles, which was so remarkable last year. And she's sitting at the orphan tent, braiding other people's hair before the race. Uh, it, I mean, what does that say about? like her as a like inspirational leader in this space but just the community that is built up here is really quite something we just saw josh Fiore finish his second lap coming through athletes do everything uh, and there goes james burton from the uk so i'm just going to put a little bit of a plug up sure you had get up on the podium to uh, 10, uh, 10 miles now on the mails i'm just trying to send them through to you to have a, a quick look you can stick that up on the um 
can imagine that after the live stream. A shot. A few people have been mentioning Michael. He's a European athlete. He's not terribly well known, but uh, did very well at Europe's Toughest Mudder. Okay. So, so I am Joshua Fiore. We're kind of thinking he's going to do well this year. James Burton has got a very high goal, and uh, Grant Thompson. So at least five men have done two laps so far. And, and we're obviously early into the race, but this is really exciting for me because every year I get up, and it is such an honour to be able to, you know, recognise those podium finishes. Uh, and I love that. But deep inside, I'm like, oh, come on. I want to bring the podium, like, help me out of your team. Where's Team Europe? But I'm, I'm feeling like we've got a, a number of really strong uh, athletes in there to challenge our North American Lured players. them over here, huh? What are you guys looking forward to the most? You're going to be trapped in your booth for 24 hours, living the dream? I don't know. I mean... I just, I, you know what, for me, I the atmosphere. I, I really, it's just everyone is cheering for everyone. There's, there is competition 100%, and there are athletes that want to win, right? But the most 99% of the people are out here to just do their personal best. And whether it's 50 miles or whether it's 24 hours or whether it's just five miles more than they did last year. And I love the – especially once you know, tomorrow morning when you get to 8, 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. When, when the finish start line – when people start finishing, right? They're like, I'm a finisher now, mm. giving out headbands, the tears, the emotion – um, you know, we are we are three feet away from the. I, I wouldn't wear anywhere. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the then world here. right now than where we are right now. I think for me is the part that's the most difficult, which is those dark hours where it's freezing cold for six a.m. And even though that's tough, uh, it's the whole point of the race, isn't it? They are really hard. You're slightly delirious, freezing cold, but that's the bit that I remember the most. And last year, I remember it just as. as and so up and we had bagpipe music playing and I shed it, which we do quite often, but still. And it was just like, this is wonderful. That, so this is fun, it's great, got people supporting and ringing bells. But at that point where it's like, people realize what they can achieve. And same is feel sure. Like people often ask me, like, oh, the weather's warm. Is this going to be an easy? Like, there's no such thing as a, an easy world's toughest butter. And you're absolutely right up that. You know, those those dark moments over the, the evening. And that's, I think, where those the penalties, the stuff we, you know, talk about, oh, that's a bit of a joke, that's a bit of fun. I mean, that is savage to get your head into the right place to do that way in, in you know, that darkest moment. The flip side of that, uh, Coach and Coach's Corner, he has brought the magic this year. Like, the personal energy, the crew he's got, but the setup and that, and that hit is going to be lit. <laughs> It is going to be glowing. There's going to be music, and I think that is going to be something. Yeah, it's going to be just, fun. Just I think we're going to get a static cam up there as well at some point. Over the good fun. I mean, it is supercharged. It is another level. That's what we've seen in the last couple of years. It's going to be something pretty special. We do have someone asking. The finish line is great and all, but can we see an obstacle? Uh, yep, we've got Jason's gone out on course to set up some obstacles. Sets of cameras and obstacles. I mean, as we say, they're not actually really open for a while. We have a few open now because it's half one um but there will be plenty of obstacles throughout the night to be seen and it's really quite but i do love this this finish line camera it's so nice to get to celebrate everyone because so often the criticism which i 100 percent agree with the race coverage is it's just the elites it's the top three it's the top five and this is everyone everyone can see themselves coming through and it's amazing yeah we do a lot of live a lot of race live streams and the best here comes kylie schweikart through her second lap I holy believe. macaroni is she our first place woman? Uh, he is our first place woman, yeah. So, Giles, I don't know if you deal with this, but we in the booth, we're watching everyone come through. Austin Azar are also coming through, and we want to cheer for them. But we're the broadcast team. We have to stay neutral. I can't stay everyone. neutral. I can't stay neutral. But we're like, give, give us to the Europeans like, as well, are you? France on my side. <laughs> we're like fist pumping when we see people we know, and like when we people who are really struggling and are pushing through it. And you're right, like, when you. Fred, you were talking about that in the middle of the night time. Mm. Like, when you, when you hurt, when mm. everything hurts, the back of your legs, that mm. little, little thing behind this. your knee that never hurts, the Hip front flexes. of your, that you know you're alive. Yeah. Yeah, you hurt, but you've never been more alive than at three in the morning when everything hurts. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if you saw the coverage a couple of weeks ago. I cried when Leon got the uh, podium. Sure. I, I was starting to see. I, 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 it's not that I prefer them to anyone else and I don't want them to do well. I just, when you do this and you get to know people and you meet them all the time, it comes as well. And there's there's a lot of personal stuff embedded in that. Just, you just want people to do well. And 
it's, it's difficult when it comes to a competition. It's not like, oh, I want you to win more, but I, I find it hard yeah. to take control. I, I think that's one of the really like beautiful things that we still have in OCR. Whilst we are still in that amateur or infancy like yes. stage where we're in, right? We we still like know everyone who's involved. They real humans as a humanity and like a, an yeah. engagement to them uh, that we need to work really hard to make sure we don't lose um, as in the future the sport potentially professionalizes a little bit more because it's, it's so important well, we've, so, we've been so lucky with so many of the elites who are so so good not all of them might be outgoing and chatty and, and want to be in the middle of things everyone's a different human and that's fine but I can't think of anyone off the top of my head that would go, yeah, they're not very really nice. Everyone's lovely, everyone's kind, everyone is interested and supportive of others. And maybe it's part of what drives people to do this sport. Maybe it's part of the personality. We're very lucky. And yeah, I hope we can continue to keep it up. Right. You have the ability to run shoulder to shoulder with them, come up on the wall. You help with them yeah. on the wall. Like, what other sports do you get to see some very best in the world? And as if that's a, just a completely normal. Thing. My dad used to tell me, here goes this case, you know, comes through again. My dad used to tell me one of the great things about golf is that the, you can go the weekend after the the Masters, or whatever, and, and play the exact same course that they did. And I was, and okay, but with World's Toughest Mudder, you can go on the exact same course on the exact same day, stand right next to them on the start line, and you can run up Everest, turn around, and help them up the obstacle. And you can, I, more I remember, so than any other OCR, you know. An elite wave, a lot of OCRs, you can stand with them in the start pen. You're not going to be running with them, but here you are. You will come across them and run with them. I, I was running Toughest Mudder Canada, I think, in Whistler. And I ran with Allison Tide for a quarter mile, and we just talked. And, like, she definitely was slowing down to run with me. But I, I still go, like, what other sport are you going to run with the best of the best? As Chris Classy crosses the finish line for a second time. Looking strong, chilled. Looking studying. chilled. She could be just out for a jog. Her her last lap will be faster than my fastest lap, my first lap. A remarkable lap. Just, just trotting along. But but clearly in second place. If we're if we're it's a little early obviously to keep track of who's doing what. So that was Chris coming in third. Chris is in third place behind Katie. Caroline, Kelly, Katie, and Chris. Gosh, my card in first. <laughs> Yeah, that, I mean, if you, if you job, but... listen to the people who run worlds over and over, right, a lot of them will say the race doesn't really start for the first 10 hours. Sure. Um, and I think particularly here, there's going to feel like quite a temperature difference <laughs> between running right now and then when it gets to hard. That'll be tricky to deal with. Um, not just that, as soon as I step out of here, I'm going to get sunburned as well. Maybe. Yeah. That's going to be tricky. That could sting in the morning um, it, if you it, don't deal with it. It feels, like wind, it feels like wind might be a factor too. Yes. Huh? Yeah, I'm particularly over. It's really exposed out there. Um, the, the hill with the... Um, yeah, the grappler. Grappler. That, that was very windy yesterday. And if people are standing there for a long time, that could be unpleasant. Yeah, really exposed. But, I mean, we, um, we had some challenges with the weather. Uh, we had some challenges with the trailer turning up about a week after it should. So uh, we've been working well into the night to get this um, set up. The stars out here in the Texan sky when you're up on those hills are just unbelievable. I think it's going to be quite a special. I'm moment. going to be looking at those tonight. So we've had four women come through doing two laps. Kelly Schweihart, Katie Knight, Chris Kowalski, Nikki Karamba still. She was fourth on the last lap. We've not had our fifth lady through yet. Yeah. What's going on with the men? And our men. Stern in first place, Michael Schott in second, Jerry in third, watching Jerry Newcomb, Brandon Thompson, Christopher Mendoza in sixth place, John Herb, Edwards of Brass, Elmer King, and Chris Johnson, Christian Brown Johnson, he's an orange jacket holder, as is Mendoza and Joshua Fiora. But as you say, the race doesn't start till we talk and talk and talk about this, but. Start Last year, we were watching the, the man's sprint lap winner. He did great. He was a great start. He was outstanding. But midnight rolls around, and it, it becomes a different race and uh, changes everything. Right. So nutrition, uh, you know, how, you know, what you eat, what you drink, how you look after your body is a really big part of all this. So the question to you two is, uh, what's your snack of choice to get you through 24 hours on the mic? Do you know what? Last year, we 
bought food and we were really well prepared and we didn't actually eat. And they got to midnight and I had like a little, it's like a pot of goulash or something, which I've been looking for desperately. They couldn't find it and it was so good. So I brought some like bean soup, but also just like peanut butter. I love peanut butter. You and like got, peanut butter on bread, or are you just going to eat a spoon out of the tap? Oh, Ritz, Ritz crackers cracker. scooped oh. onto some Skippy. I love some peanut butter. So if you look behind you, Giles, we have a little buffet set up back there. And um, if Joe DeSena were here, he'd probably throw every single thing in the garbage. Um, he, he would not approve. I've been thinking, I'm a big fan of the old the, the Pringles. Sure. Uh, and so I have a running joke with Joe that we do need to get Pringles as a uh, sponsor. Oh, just awful. across everything, all brands, all worlds. Sure. <laughs> Pringles actually make me feel ill. Really? Yeah. Come on down. Prawn cocktail. I and then we got our British sweeties, Jammy Dodgers, and a. <laughs> they are not a sponsor yet, but I'm about the uh, Nature's Valley Crunchy Gorilla Bars. I love. Um, I didn't realize this. I buy them in bulk, and uh, I bought just a smaller box. Oh, it's our, one of our wheelchair athletes finishes their first lap. Wonderful. Oh, hearts and stars. Outstanding. Well done. I mean that's that's something else that that just tears you up. And, and, you know we talk about this a lot, and I'm going to mention this before the start of the race. It feels amazing to help the people, right? You feel you know strong and generous, and all of that. It's such a good feeling, and there aren't enough opportunities in the world necessarily to help other people. It's wonderful that people mm. do. But the far more challenging thing is to you know be vulnerable and accept help from others. Oh, that's much more difficult to do. We all want to be that hero that helps somebody else up. And so, uh, you know, I think events like this give you that opportunity to, you know, to accept help, and that's a pretty special feeling as well. And when you see you know, some of these adaptive athletes that go around and the, the strength and character and, and mental strength necessary to completely trust yourself, you know, been shared for this group of people in bodies of water up at height. But that's what remarkable. sets this apart from other brands other events is that focus on teamwork camaraderie helping each other and i think that reflects in the community and i was so last night and i was like there is there is nothing in ocr apologies to everyone else that matches up to the community here so many things over the weekend are arranged by the guys there not by you it's, it's done because they want to do it it's not a drive from you to kind of get people together and i think that all ties into if, if this is how you like to be if you give help and accept help and you're all together in it rather than just running by yourself. It's, it's, it's really a special part of the brand. It, it takes some humility, right? Like, you, it's, you gotta kind of push that ego down deep inside and be like, like, like yeah, but especially, especially not the other athletes, but literally any other athlete, no one can control force by themselves. You're five in the morning, you're not gonna be able to get up every single wall by yourself. You're gonna need help. You're to win four, so you can get over that wall together for three of you. There's a, there's a message here for you, Giles, which is embarrassing me, uh, which is Will Chung saying, I've not actually, Fran, done a tough one. I need to get out on course in 2024. It's true. I've never done one. You know some people. We could hook you up. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can make that can happen. Can we get a code? Can we get a code, Giles? <laughs> I was, I mean, we were just saying before, I was wrong. looking at doing Infinity this year. Um, I needed another goal to work towards, and then the summer just happened. And, but yeah, I would like to. Talking about your UK friends, your UK friends sold you out there. I'll tell you what, the UK is a really good place to run Tough Mudder as well. You know, the, um, the event sizes, you know, our biggest Tough Mudder events in the world are consistently out in the UK. The community there is really strong and they're able to get to a lot of events. So it just becomes that, you know, almost group of family. It's almost like Christmas. It's just coming like every couple of weeks right through, the, right through the summer and the, the teams are really great. The UK community there, so. is incredible. I've heard the Northwest venue is really nice. Oh, it's muddy, muddy, muddy. <laughs> kind of my, I was like Frank a lot. <laughs> this is our women's top 10. Six athletes coming through with two laps. Uh, since we last spoke, Jenny Overstreet has come through. Having done 10 miles. So we should be seeing some other athletes coming through soon. Callie Schweikart finished eighth last year. She's in first right now. Katie Knight, she won the event two years second last year to Chris Trubosky. Chris in third, obviously our winner from last year, the only women's 100 miler. Bramba, mm. that's a new name to me. I'd love to learn more about her. Um, Stephanie Bland, Jenny Overstreet in sixth. She finished on the podium last year with 85 miles. Mm. Robin Kazia, Costa, Sarah Tucker, Hannah Carter, 
Anna Carter was one of my, at the beginning of the year, we had a, a phone call with all the OCR board mm. people, and we said, who's like a kind of a wild card athlete that you want to watch and see? Let's just see how they do. Anna Carter was my pick. She got fourth last year. She's currently in ninth place right now. So I think the interesting thing about Chris, and obviously she's done two laps, she's currently running in third. But the great thing about Chris is she just runs her own race. She did a savage race a couple of months ago and you know we were talking about her going well she's she's in third or fourth currently and she's been pushing herself i think she'd come on a red eye you know everything she, is this it has she pushed it too far and then all the other women had just pushed themselves too much and she just kept running her race and she took first again so she she's very secure and confident in her capabilities and will just run her race so it's who knows what's going to happen but it's hard to oh hannah carter coming in eighth uh, ten she just passed us just crossed again it's, uh, I think, don't underestimate her. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that same mindset, the same mentality, um, a lot of the top elites have it. I know Trevor Psychos every year, he tells me, hey, he's going to run 100 miles and I'll see what happens. Like, he literally is like, if I'm third and sixth place of the 100, I'm going to run 100 miles. I was going to mention Trevor as well. I just, a remarkable difference in his, like, his nap time doesn't seem to change. He's almost like a metro you know, the most positive way you can possibly describe someone as a metronome. I think that's great. Uh, Trevor has a, he has an active six year streak of 100 mile finishes. No one, Ryan Atkins, no one else has that. Wow. Fran was you know, saying earlier, just talking about this group of like hugely talented athletes that are also you know, just humble and lovely to be around. Trevor is uh, he's one of the okay. he's just great chat. Trevor and I had a little, uh, little beef a few years ago. Um, we, I went to Thomas Letter Berlin. And uh, Trevor also ran Thomas Butter Berlin. The weekend before, he ran across Ireland, I believe. He did like 300 miles. And so he came to Thomas Butter Berlin just for fun. Well, whatever, it still counts. I beat him 15 to 10 miles. So then when World Thomas Butter came around later that year, I said, Trevor, I beat you at Thomas Butter Berlin. You know, I feel pretty good about beating you here. But he's like, okay, we'll see. And so he narrowly beat me. 100 to 35 miles at World Seven Butter that year. So wow. at the end, I said, okay, so now we're tied, one to one. <laughs> World champion, Trevor Psychos. Here comes Austin Azar. That is not Austin Azar. Yeah. But man, he does a good Austin Azar impersonation. <laughs> Tell me again who that is? Uh, Mark James' son. Mark James' son? Yeah. Mark James, a stalwart member of the World Stemmest Motor community, his son just crossed through the uh, through the finish line. So I do want to say, we do have the capability this year. If you want to check up on an athlete, see how they're doing, send us a message on YouTube. We can find them and uh, pull up their results onto the screen. It takes a few minutes, but it's, uh, and here it's possible comes to do, and we want to celebrate everyone. Bodie crossing the finish line. I'm crying. Just love the emotion, and it's every single lap over and over. There's just that that look on, on people's faces, whether they're just stopping for pause or going out again. You know, it's just registered. This is most of these athletes are finishing their second lap now. It's not all of them, though. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be. What did it take us yesterday to do the hot lap? We uh, record for the slowest hot lap yesterday. Well, we missed the start of the briefing, didn't we? And we stopped. stopped we stopped a few times at obstacles to. We chatted to people. And we were talking, so we we took our time, but yeah, it was a slow hot lap. It's a cool lap. It's gone. Well, Josh, you're welcome to stay here all day if you want. I don't want to keep you. But... I will. I will definitely be back. I'm right. One of the can things come, I come have some snacks. Oh, yes, we got a little snacks. buffet behind you. If you, if you can let me know when the Pringles get open, <laughs> I'll be back for those. We'll open them for you. We've got one of the one of the team out here, a guy called Brendan, actually. And Brendan, he got inducted into the Hall of Fame last year. He is a massive, like, Pringles man. Sure. Uh, and so I try and bring him the flavors from the UK that they don't get in the US every okay. time I come out. I didn't know there was sure. anything. Prawn cocktail. <gasps> oh, quite, delicious. Know, strong work. And um, that new sweet chili flavor. Okay. And we've got the, the sizzling uh, kind of cream and chai one. I think one you're looking for a personal sponsorship so by I'm, Pringles, aren't you? If you know someone at Pringles, if you're listening and you know someone at Pringles, sure. please, please drop me a note. Maybe we get like a referral code if nothing else. I actually buy a few things in the States to take home. Sure. One in particular is um, 
Nature Valley peanut butter bars. Because all cereal bars in the UK have honey in them, and I don't eat honey. But in the US, corn syrup, so I can eat them. Sure. And maple go. syrup, instant porridge, can't buy it in the UK. And antihistamine cream. Um, there's double, oh, double the active it? ingredient in it. Significantly better. I sweep that up for my wife. There you go. And are we, um, as we get into that kind of the witching hour, as, as things get like crazy overnight, I feel like that's the time where we need to actually run up. <laughs> Tough matter events. Let's get some dates in the diary. Let's get a commitment when she's not eating, when she's not eating, when the peanut butter is running out, when it's all at a little bit of a. I'll you know, do it. I need a goal. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Get the waiver sign. Absolutely. I need a goal. I've got a half marathon in like March, and that's it. Which one are you running? Wilbslow. I was going to try to do the, um, I just got the, the palace one. Okay. That's the plan. Flat. There you flat go. Is the, flat is the trick, I think. All yeah, right. Manchester's just very flat. Very good. Well, we can, I will uh, we be. Can, we could have her sign up on, like, on the broadcast if you want. Yeah, well, that is we'll that's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. I'll right, we'll turn the out. camera on in here and <laughs> sign the death and get it going. You should yeah. ask. I mean, there'll be a number from the, uh, the um, sorry, the, the UK community, like which, which should Fran come to? Or events, you know, it doesn't have to be, we can shoot for the stars here. <laughs> which um, one would you recommend as my first? I mean, my daughter has done Little Mudder, Little Mudder. Oh, so mine she, as well, mine as well, and they're school friends. So, uh, um, what I recommend, I really like London South. Um, that's a great venue, I try and run that one each year. Also, the UK has that like weather wobble. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Through July and August, which is pretty well, unpredictable. But it feels like when we get into exactly Not right. Familiar. It's sun. It's summer and it should be sunny. Okay. And invariably, it's just miserable and rainy. It was not great. Yeah. And so it then seems we get our summer in like spring. Then we have a rainy couple, and then like, like September, October, quite second, pleasant. second summer. So I feel like a bit like the Hobbit breakfast. Sure. <laughs> you just want to ignore that middle bit between right. first breakfast and second breakfast. So I reckon London South would be good. Uh, or, or Midlands, that's sure. a wonderful venue as well. Certainly if you're, a, if you're US listening and you're coming over, Middle Castle, everybody loves a castle. Beaver Castle. Indeed. Legitimate castle. That was the site of about years yes. before it moved recently. Yeah, I think if I were to go over for a race, I'd go for Beaver Castle, just because I've heard so much about it from the top of the Come! <gasps> Let's do it together! Yay! Tickets for everybody. I've never done a... I've done Toughest Berlin. I've never done a Tough Butter in the UK, though. So, I love the UK. Let's if America, it. like, went crazy, I would move to London tomorrow. I love one. Or Manchester. It's slightly better. No offense. That's it. So, you're now both signing up later. I'll sort the codes out. This is going to be great. <laughs> Excellent. Will, will will be there. He'll take you around. He absolutely well, will. I just need to work on my uh, skin hardness a bit because uh, one obstacle is giving me blisters. It's very clay at that Beaver Castle Midlands Defensive, so that'll be good for your skin. Just Yo, like, uh, speaking of Will Chung, why is it Will Chung here? Where are you at, buddy? Yeah, Will. Answer. So we'll wait for him to answer. Yeah, right. Well, TikTok. <laughs> Just get staring at the screen. Or Come awkward on, silence, hoping for him to be typing. <laughs> Type faster. Also, isn't it past Will's bedtime? I do appreciate he's staying up and. Oh, where, 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 what I time know, is it over in uh, Charlie? Oh, no, I, seven o'clock. I they? ignore what time it is at home when I come to the states. Why that no longer exists? Time is a construct. It's the only way I can deal with jet lag. I uh, I quite like it because I'm an evening person. Uh, I cannot get up in the morning. Uh, I do a lot of work in the evening, particularly with like the US hours that we end up working, so fairly regularly. Joe will be, and he'll be like, Charles, you've got to go to bed at 8 o'clock. Don't eat after 5. You know, go to bed at 8, get your sleep, get up at 5. I'm like, Joe, you just put a meeting in my diary for 11.30. What did you want me to do? Um, and then you come over here, and you've got a 5 a.m. event start. And you're like, no, I'm up. I'm feeling good. It really I'm works. It, life. Yeah. it really works because you come over here, go to bed, jet lag, wake up about 5 a.m., ready to rock and roll because you have like 12 hours sleep sure. and then i just stick to that time last night i was like god it's really late it was half eight super productive though in the morning. so good but then yeah at home I, i'm a slow start of the day and working till late hours of the night right i'm gonna leave you too continue all right buddy everyone abreast of what's going on in the world definitely do text me when those pringles get open come on back yeah I'll share <laughs> tough mutter ceo uh, happy to have you. Thanks for joining us. Alrighty. Let's see what's going on out there. Jason is out on the camera. 
Oh, I keep putting that up and down, and I really don't mean to. Let's have a look at Jason's camera. We'll be getting some obstacles to you soon when they are opening, and we've got the the camera set up. We do have them set up. At a few, but not have a show, but yeah, we have one set up at Mudderhorn. What time does Mudderhorn open? Two p.m. Yeah, soon, so Wait, soon. Picture, picture. Excellent. So we've got a camera back out on course. Seeing the athletes out there. You can see the terrain. It's it doesn't look that pretty, but in terms of getting mileage, I think it's a good course for it. I believe that was Heather Olson just passed us. Well um I look her up in a moment. Olson. But you can see the terrain, it's it's pretty firmly packed. And if you want to get miles, this is a good year to get some mileage to put some some miles on. It's um it's open, isn't it, this train? So a lot of the times yesterday on the course you can really look around and see a lot. See a nice vista. Yeah. Whereas that's last true. year there was a lot more kind of wooded areas. Um Yeah, and like you, you see you see a random tree, but you can see for miles. So middle of the night we're gonna I think you're gonna feel less alone than you if you think back to Toughest Mudder Tough Mudder or World Toughest Atlanta. That venue had lots of trees. You were in and out of forests constantly. So in the middle of the night, there's Jim Campbell, um, long time World Stubbs Mudder. Been, we just passed Jim Campbell. He's run every single World Stubbs Mudder event, one of the few to have that. Um, but so in Atlanta, a venue like Atlanta, you're in and out of forests constantly. You're just trees. And so what that means is in the middle of the night, Close. I, I think in the middle of the night, we'll see what happens. But my 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 belief is that you're gonna you're gonna feel less alone out there. And what that does is that makes it mentally a little bit easier, right? That's one less thing working against you in terms of getting miles. Your, your goal right now, especially if you're out there in the middle of the night, the only reason you're out there in the middle of the night is you want to get miles home. And so anything that can help you get miles, if, if feeling less less lonesome or less alone on course does that, then. Uh, mm. So there we go. Heather Olson, Heather Bodie. Heather Bodie, yep. Two, Two laps. laps. 146. Last year, Heather finished in fifth place, 75 miles. I know she wants to get more than 75 this year. So we've had 15 women come through on two laps. And let's have a quick look on men. Uh, so there's the men coming through on a lot, a lot, but not on three yet. In the YouTube comments, Mitchell says, America is already crazy. UK is the way to go. Thank you, Mitchell. I mean, I was born here. I was kind of outnumbered in the booth here for a minute. I don't know if you noticed that with yeah. Fran and Giles talking about Pringles flavors in the UK. I don't know what I don't know what that's about, but yeah, I know. So, I thought that we should necessarily talk it. about other brands, but someone saying I should run a different race brand. Uh, this is actually happening next weekend. OCR report is going to be in Savage for the final race, and I will yeah. be there, and I will be running it afterwards. So. Broadcasting and then running. Outstanding. Savage that is, is a good job. Okay. Second lap, probably. Hmm. Will be cool to see all the headlamps lighting up the uh, course tonight. Absolutely will be. We should be able to see Coach's Corner from where we're sitting if we kind of look around a bit. We'll be able to see a bit, which is nice. Can't wait to start showing some obstacles as well. Was it Shane Alston with that last comment? Yes. Shane talking about the, the headlamps. One of my favorite things about Toughest Mudder is when the line is start. Not Toughest Mudder is after dark. Mm. Because you'll have the entire field, 300 to 500 Toughest Mudder athletes at the start line with their headlamps on, the, the bright white light on the front. But on the back, they'll have a flasher, a red flasher, a blue flasher, a green flasher. 
Sue Harvey Brown crossing the finish line. Job two. So someone Sue asking, where can I find a scoreboard? Um, in seventh place last year. At toughmodder.com. They've got the results going. It's a, it's kind of a bit of a long one, so I can't read it all out. But yeah, toughmodder.com, you'll find the live results. We'll be sending results up as we see them, but you know, we obviously can't do everyone. And if you do want to ask us to find anyone, go by name, not by bib number. Cause we yeah, Adam, who are you looking name. for? Adam Everson, let us, uh, let us know. We'll, uh, we'll give a shout out. But yeah, so Tevis Butter at the start line, when everyone has their flashers on, on the back of their headlamp, say go. The race starts, the athletes spread out. You know, the faster, faster athletes are in the front, slower in the back. But it's this, you'll see like a quarter mile long string of flashers going off. And it looks like Christmas lights. It's it's uh, really, really cool. You can only see that. You won't even see that here at World Toughest because everyone's spread out overnight. That toughest butter at the start line is the only time you can see that overnight. It's very, it's very uh, fun to see. Welcome to Texas. It's so much fun. I said this, we're out in the hot lap, and I just kind of stopped and went, oh, we're in Texas. And I just love the opportunity that these events give to travel to places I would never choose. Sure. Not that I wouldn't choose to come I to Texas, never. but it costs money, doesn't it? Like, sure. there are holidays, there are family holidays to be done. Like, unless there's something here, unless we're going to come to NASA, maybe. Right. I, you know, even, uh, yeah, just races. In the UK, we used to go weekend after weekend to races, just to places I wouldn't have thought of going and they were marvelous so thank you i'm very happy to be in texas so, so granbury texas where we're at is about an hour west of dallas fort worth uh -huh. and dallas fort worth is probably i, I just imagine a popular tourist spot for, for if you're into cowboys and texas and um but so my wife and i last night we were driving through granbury to the community dinner mm -hmm. beautiful little downtown just adorable and my wife and daughter are gonna go do some shopping today uh, nice. check out the downtown area and uh a lot of live theater, live shows. I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to do commercials for Granbury, Texas, but uh, I mean, I, I can see why it's, yeah, it's fun. We're in a beautiful Airbnb on a lake. Love it. So let's ask a question. Any race photos or live stream? Well, I hate to break it to you. Currently Chris on Sebastian, the live stream. You're watching the live stream, buddy. This, this is the live stream. Um, Chris, for race photos. Here we go. The barefoot, barefoot runner. runner again. Vincent. Um, Raymond Vincent. Uh, photos will be later from Jack Goras, yep. and uh, we're also on Instagram. Carlo is doing, Carlo Costello is running the Instagram. Yeah, race photos, go to the OCRreport.com slash photos, and uh, see the photos or sign up these photos. So OCRreport.com, it's a link on the front page there. Here we go, Dublin Walls open. Dublin. So if you go to a regular tough mutter, you will see that black part of the wall. That, that yellow part of the wall, it's called an Irish table. That's why we got the name Dublin Wall for this version of the obstacle. When I, my, the first time I ran World Seven Mudder, I was like, well, 24 hours. It's a really long, tough mudder. And that's true. It is a really long, but it's also a really hard, tough mudder. Every obstacle, like this one, like Dublin Walls, that guy just soloed it. That's very impressive. I mean, that would kill he my made it look easy. The cramp I would get from that. He made it look easy. When you see these guys helping, that's much more than traditional. These guys that are soloing it, they're, you know, it's their first time at the obstacle. They're so, probably fresh. People who podium, are they allowed to get help? Oh, absolutely. Wow. And in fact, that's part of the fun is, um, I remember at Everest one year, I was running Everest. I was at the, you know, when you run a, approach Everest, Everest is the kind of the warped wall type obstacle. Yes. People are reaching down to help out. And they reach down to help you out, and then you get up, and you are supposed to help the person behind you. It's not a rule, but if someone helps you up, you turn around, you help somebody up before you go. So I went up, up the wall, guys helped me up, I turned around, and I helped up Ryan Atkins. <laughs> Ryan Atkins, the, one of the single greatest athletes to ever run in the sport of obstacle racing. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just helped Ryan Atkins win World Seven's <laughs> Mutter. And then, so That's I started, what we were talking about, about being able to, to run shoulder to shoulder. Now, I'm not saying I deserve all the credit for Ryan But Atkins most of it, winning. right? But And then, so I go down to, shout out to Jonathan Stern, two laps done, well done. I, I'm leaving, and I see Ryan Atkins turn around, and he's helping somebody behind him. And that is the one of the great things about World Stubbs Mutter is you will see elites helping, helping 
regular folks that are trying to get 25 miles, they're trying to get 50 miles, they're competing for prize money. Like this is their livelihood. They're trying to get 100 miles. They're trying to win the race. And they're still stopping too. It's a healthy athlete behind them. And you see these guys um, on their knee, on their knee, kind of taking a knee. And they're showing the athlete, okay, put you put one leg here on my knee, put another leg on my shoulder, watch this, and then boom. Now these guys, they may be just there for right now. You know, so Dublin Walls, significantly more challenging when soapy, wet, and muddy. Love the people helping out. Great community. Shane, I agree to 100%. Great comment. And you see that guy he kind of stood up to give the, the runner on top of him a boost. So some of them, they're there to help somebody out. They're going to get some help, and they'll keep going. So they'll be there six hours, eight hours, 12 hours. They're just like, my race today is going to be helping other people. And these guys, they look there. In fact, until there, that guy Francis Lackner, um, he his race, his world stuff is about a race. It goes to an obstacle like the walls, like butter. Oh, he's gonna solo it. With, with, oh, we missed it. With the, the, uh, the reverse sit up. There's Chris Roglowski going. Is that Chris or Katie on the right? Looks like Katie, That's Katie. Katie Knight on the right. She's got the front headband. I don't know it's French, yep. but it's red, white, and blue. And another. Um, woman alongside her it looks like I mean, it's hard to tell who the other woman is but Francis, so francis there with the uh with the rose he um he has a he, he runs with a giant rose to honor his mother who's passed away oh. but he also has that rose on his hat he'll find an obstacle like mudderhorn like everest like dublin walls where it's very difficult for anyone to do it by themselves and he'll be out there with with the crew of guys and they're just there to help and you'll see these guys if you're here, uh, if you're pitting, or if um, if you run. Um, Shane, to agree totally about toughest nighttime starts. Yeah, it's uh, it's something to see. It's hard to describe until you can see it for yourself. But uh, yeah, um, well, remind me in a minute. We'll talk about toughest butter. Um, I just want to say somebody's asked about a, an athlete called Damien Lera, Lera, and I'm trying to bring up his results, but for some reason. It might be me keeping on typing it wrong. Uh, I'm not getting him just yet, but I do I do have it there that you are looking for him, and I'll keep trying to find those results for you to bring them up. But you do have, you can track athletes as well on uh, tubmutter.com. There will be the live leaderboard. There. They have they have an entire World Subs Mutter kind of headquarters where you can uh, find links to the live stream. Now we are, because of you, limits from YouTube, we run an eight hour live stream. So we'll be doing eight hours and we'll do a second, we'll have to, there's a new link for the uh, second one. And we'll have it in the comments, but another guy soloing double walls are outstanding. Well done, well done. Uh, and then another one of our women. They're enjoying the commentary. This is the first sporting event. His passion is starting to make sense as you all fall in. It's disappeared. But, uh, it's a great event. Mitchell, I'm not sure if you're here. There are, there's people watching from the pit area. Um, yeah, if you're here, Mitchell, if you're here, come say hi. We're over in the booth by the finish line. Um, but no, it's it's. I every year we, we broadcast two road and you and I. It, I get them out. I, I talked about it with Amelia Boone a little bit. I see the athletes, and I feel like, and I'm not an elite athlete by any stretch, but being out there is a special, special experience mm. that. Uh, um, and I've run other, you know, Spartans, I've run Tough Hunters, I've run other, break, you know, non 24 hour events. Yeah, but, but this it, is different. This is a different experience to, to running it. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, if you are thinking about World Stuff is Better and you're like, man, 24 hours, that's just crazy. Well, you're right. It is crazy. It is. But if you want to build up to it, you have two other options. You have, um, and, and Giles is kind of talking to you a little bit yep. about it, or you were telling Giles your plan. Uh -huh. um, you can run Tough Butter Infinity, which oh. is um, a daytime version of World's Toughest Butter, but just the daytime hours. Or there's also Toughest Butter, which is nighttime. And uh, oh, let's make sure your microphone's on. We're welcoming a, a check, guest check, to check. the booth, DJ Fox. Hey, hey. 2022 World's Toughest Butter champion. Yeah, buddy. Welcome to the booth. DJ, what do you uh, what do you feel watching these athletes run around? Uh, it's fun. It's different to stand on the other side of the fence and, and play. Uh, a little, little, little bit, yeah. For sure, I was out there. Uh, I'm still a little beat up from the Colorado Trail, right? But I had a really good training here. I think it would have been. It looks like 
looks like a really good course to, sure. to throw down some good miles. So a little bit of FOMO, but excited to see how this one plays out. I think we're going to see some big miles this year. Hope we got a lot of orange jackets. Uh, yeah. So two years ago, your first orange jacket, they yeah. did not have enough. They didn't bring enough. Yeah. Whoa. So I know. Uh, they had to like uh, remind everybody that had one, hey, bring it because we don't have enough for you this uh, year. Okay. Nice. So um, I, was, I was bummed to hear you weren't going to be able to run this year because you are the only person to ever have a 105 mile streak. Oh, yeah. Of back to back years. Nice. This would have been your hopefully third year in a row to uh, to run 105 miles. Oh. Got Kim DeVos visiting us in the booth. Shout out to Kim DeVos. We've got Mudderhorn up here on the camera. Wait, Mudderhorn is now open. DJ, what do you think? Um, I mean, it's a really time consuming obstacle. It's not really taxing, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's simple. You just got to get up and get over, right? I mean, it's a climb up, climb down. They took the slide away. So that shot us out the other side last year and made it, made it pretty quick. How do you climb down Mudderhorn? Do you face the obstacle or do you face out? I face it. I face it. Yeah. I don't know if that's the best method or not. I've seen some people come down, like they're almost on steps, right? And like yeah. lean right way into it yeah. and they move pretty quick. I haven't practiced that, so I just kind of stuck to what I know so far. Last year, you guys had the slide, though, so that was oh, yeah. obviously the fastest. That's oh, it was, pretty it was, terrifying, that slide. It was pretty great. It was fun. It was fun. Yeah. It was almost like a straight vertical drop to start. Yeah. And it, then a it was like hard, a water park, hard turn. Like, and you know those you ones that, like, Raging Waters or water parks where they have the really tall side? Now, that was a tube for you guys. But at water parks, they have, like, where you you're physically come off the slide. Oh, yeah. Those are terrifying. Yeah, just, like, the, the pure drops. Yeah. Yeah, this is a smaller version of that, but you caught that like first little bit of you know yeah. adrenaline when it yeah, yeah. when it sent you. You just gotta grab the pipe and you're hanging. You, you had to let yourself go on that one. So what are you doing this year? What do you mean? I'm um, you're you're not running, are you? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm pitting for uh, my buddy Sam Siddons. Um, I had worked with a few athletes who towed the line today, so come okay. in and just have fun and be helpful. Sure. Yeah. A little pit crew. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. Cool. Hang out for 24 hours, have a party. So you're kind of. <laughs> Uh, you're pitting for Sam. Are you yeah. kind of coaching him too? No, he's my roommate. Okay. I mean, we like powwow on training and whatnot. So, sure. yeah, it's not like a direct coaching. Right. But, yeah. Do you give advice? Like, hey, here's yeah, how I bit. ran 100 miles. Here's <laughs> A little bit. A little bit, yeah. Some but, uh, things to consider. Oh, yeah. What advice do you give somebody who wants to run 100 miles? I mean, you need to, like, don't worry about too much speed in your training. Okay. Get a lot of time on feet. Sure. Yeah, yeah spend a lot of time moving. Don't practice like a little bit of hiking you're probably gonna walk some sections and you need to um have a durable upper body as well okay that's where i actually had the most problems in my last two years I, I would cramp in my chest and my biceps really yeah so major emphasis on high volume upper body calisthenics sure yeah lots of time locked off you know 90 degrees at the elbows and yeah so a lot of time on feet a lot of time on walking feet. hiking main running. priority yeah but then also miles and legs what was that? The legs. Yeah. How, when you were training to run 100 miles, or like training last year, leading up to your 100 miles, how many hour, how many miles a week or how many hours a week were you on feet? Today? Um, like 15 to 20, depending. My okay. my peak weeks were 100 miles, and I would say there were like a lot of them were you know in the 18 hour range. Sure. A lot of it better. Too. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. Getting ready for you know it's like. In, in the ultra world, it's kind of, it's a flat course, right? Sure. Yeah. So running a hundred, 400 miles a month. Yeah. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's a lot of miles. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, I mean, that was all PR weeks for me too. You know, like, sure. I'm, I'm still growing through this. I've had some really good weeks this year um, where I was doing, you know, 25 hour weeks, 110, 120 miles. Sure. Yeah. So we're, we're still, wow, we're moving. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've taken full time running. Yeah. I don't think. Yeah, I run 20 miles in a week in my life. That's like months worth of running for me. I mean, that's a that's, good month. That's, that's, that's a little yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's helpful. Making it easy for you. Yeah, we've been working out for like Got a visit from Team HQ with some more uh, data and stats for us. We've for the, got uh, so many computers and wires in front of us. I love it, <laughs> but also <laughs> there's a lot going on. Yeah, tight everything. Everything's got to keep working now. If it started raining, we're in trouble. I think we're in the clear so far. Right. It looks good. Again, like it looks like an awesome day for this race. Yeah. Not so in your normal world's toughest conditions. Yeah, it's it's good weather, right? Like you can see the blue sky, clouds out. I think we're gonna be. Oh, it's hot. Nice. I've already got factor fifty on, and I feel like I need more. 
and I'm going to get tan lines. I already do. Nice. Yeah, so nice and early. A whole two hours in. Oh so if someone wants to run 100 miles, um, what, what's your nutrition plan? What do, you, what do you do for nutrition to get that far? Yeah, so the last two years, I've tried to stick with liquid nutrition as long as possible. Okay. And both years, that's ended up in like the 10 to 12 hour range. Okay. Where I would do uh, 200 calories in a 500 milliliter soft flask that I bring with me every lap. I also have some sort of gel. I've been doing Morton gels. I really like those. They sit well and you don't need water with them as well. Sure. Just make sure I consume those every lap. Um, and then I'll be snacking on something at the pit. Again, often it's like still liquids where I'll like go in and I'll, I'll sip like some juice or something along the lines. Right. And then like once things start to call to me, I'm just eating anything and everything. Sure. Yeah. So like 12, 12, 10, 12, 12 hours in, you're like, I want some real food. I want to. Like you start eating like jerky. I'll start eating pizza and Snickers bars. Yeah, I mean, I think by the end of last year, like my primary food, solid food, is pizza and peanut butter and jellies mm. and candy bars. Nutrition is the one, not the one, but it's a very individualized, like personal. Because like what works for you may not work for anybody else. 100 percent. You have to test like, everything. Every athlete has to figure it out. Like you do right, test it. Like like to go out for a test drive and like been around a long time. I'm gonna test this liquid. I'm going to test this pizza. I'm going to test it. Yep. You have, everyone has to figure it out for themselves. Yeah, and unfortunately, right, you're not going to go out for a 24-hour training run. You're going to figure it out here, right? You're going to learn on the job Yeah. for the most part. Nutrition is like this. It's the one thing almost every athlete tells me. They're like, if I could get my nutrition dialed in, that would take me to the next level. Do you ever find that when you do something that's like the usual should and you're like oh, well, i'm gonna gonna eat this so sorry you're like, oh, well, i wish i could do this every day <laughs> um i don't know what that is but it can be hard to take on food or to want to eat when you've pushed yourself a bit harder than normal yeah definitely a lot of the time like the blood is in your muscles right it's leaving your gut so it's, it's harder to digest things you know initially like as you're eating i'm sorry is that why you like the liquid uh so i like i like the liquid because it is coupling as my Hydrate so, right? So I have, I have very few things to think about. I can just kind of get into autopilot, and uh, the longer I can stay away from solid foods, the longer I can likely stay out of the rest. Oh, nice. Sure. Yeah. Do you, when you say we were talking about liquid nutrition, is it like Tailwind? Is that? Yeah, I use a product from Endurelite. Okay. Yeah, so they have a product called Fuel Elite that I really enjoy. Sure. Yeah. I feel like I mean, not to get into potty talk, but. Chris Mendoza crosses the uh, finish line. Woo -woo. Woo -woo. Nice. Um, if you want to kind of schedule or plan out like bowel movements, like ideally you would not have to stop to sit down for the whole twenty-four hours. Yeah, ideally. Like that's, but yeah. that's an that's if we can wake a magic wand, which we can. Yeah, right. You never know. Um, last year I didn't have to stop, so sure. perfect. The year before, I think I, I made it quite a few hours, and then I actually ended up. Uh, yeah. I think I overdid caffeine. Okay. At some Ooh, point, that's yeah. Bad. Like, where? Let's talk about that. What What were the results? Uh, restroom stop every single lap. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, and that you know, that's gonna slow you down, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. It's it's dangerous out here too, right? Because you don't have if you get past one, like, you gotta get to the next one, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, that was tough. Um, and that happened. That was an accident. Um, and me kind of that was many hours days, probably like looking at the twenty hour mark or so. Sure. Um, I had a 200 milligram uh, serving of caffeine right. on one lap, and then when I came around again, I noticed that somebody had given me the same bottle, and it was 200 more milligrams of caffeine, and I was and I was trickling a little bit in as sure. well along the way, and I went, ah, oh, whatever, I just I can't stop, I need to go, I can't stop and put the right thing in the bottle, and I drank the extra 200 milligrams of caffeine, right. you know, um, and it was a pre-workout mix too, so there's like some other things in there that I also wasn't considering in, at the time. And it did not sit well. I was in trouble. How much is that? Is that to a cup of coffee? I think a cup of coffee is closer to like 120. Okay. Yeah. So you're basically shot out in a cup and a half of coffee. Yeah. And yeah, coffee will send you to the bathroom. Hey, diuretic. Does yeah. Oh, diuretic <laughs> on an empty stomach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. And like all the other stress that's combined in it, it's. You can yeah. overdo it easy. It's the whole day is problem solving and like avoiding catastrophes. Mm. Isn't it interesting? People don't talk. People don't think about that as much. A twenty-four hour race. There is so much problem solving. All okay, day. this is going wrong with my nutrition. This is going wrong with my shoe. Like, well, that's whatever. what Tyler said. Possibly last year, part of his problem was his shoe. It's like something that you use constantly. It's part of your kit, and that could end up being a big problem when you're doing a lot more than you know 
a, a lot more time for sure than you used to. It might not be the distance, but you're putting your body through a lot. There's a lot of circuses you can't control. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Only one opportunity every hour to check. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this weird spot starts chafing that never chafed before, and I got to oh, figure man. it out. Like, so, yeah, you just at, at some point during this, like, you just can't deal with it also. Yeah. And I had the worst chafing I've ever had last year. Really? And just kind of. Then you do about it. Just suck it up. Yeah. I, it was, I had my shorty wetsuit. Yeah, right. It's a tomorrow <laughs> problem at that point, right? Um, my shorty wetsuit uh, was cut just above my knees. Okay. And it was a really tight, thick fit on the bottom. Sure. So, as my legs legs were flexing like it, that tendon every time you run every oh dude and it was just i had gouges behind my knees from it the whole time and like getting in and out of gross water and it was it was uncomfortable yeah for sure and i, I uh, it was many hours of just like well do you, you ever do you ever pre-game with like body lube or that butt oh, oh yeah yeah i'll put squirrels everywhere i'll i'll flip if i'm anticipating using the wetsuit put sure. that bad boy inside out and grease it you know try to get some wet on wet and the best oh, you could do, yeah. yeah. And prepare, and I'm not going to stop and continue okay. to reapply though. Like I'll climb up there and just those things take time. Um, sure. You know, unless something is like, if it's getting, it's a really debilitating. Yeah, you address it. But ideally, you, you've seen these things coming, sure. and you can you can kind of get to them ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but once it's happened, like you it's don't have there. Time to, you yeah. only have to, the race. It's only it's only it's 24 hours long. A long, but it's only 24 hours long. Mm. You do not have time to play around. Yeah, um, the competitive field is, is too, right? So this is a race where you have to you have to be engaged the entire time, right? And there are moments where you're gonna have to push and, and like really push the limit. And the best thing you can you can really do is is time management, you know, and save your seconds and minutes and sure. everywhere, and they'll add up to yeah, to big numbers. When you ran 105 miles, how long were your pit stops? Last year, I think most of my pit stops were under two minutes you know very close to i had a bunch like right around 60 seconds where it would be like here's my empty bottle here's my trash give me a new bottle give me a new gel and i'm gone boom and it was just like that over sure. and over again i went ahead to put the wetsuit on it was it was difficult and i think i was i was in the pit for 13 minutes oh wow well, yeah wow. at that point um, there was a couple of long ones too outside of that um where i had used a neoprene top just to, before i had to get into the wetsuit just like a cheap thing like 20 bucks off amazon little zip up neoprene i you know able to get two more laps before you got to put the full wetsuit sure. on um and i think those were like four to five minute laps or sorry uh pits yeah sure. yeah but pretty short you just try to get in and out don't waste any time you're progressing and every second you stopped the, the clock goes the clock ticks and yeah you're running out of time you mentioned the field earlier when you're, you're looking at these the male athletes out here who are you going to keep an eye on the next 24 hours okay there's quite a few right josh fiore is going to do it Excellent. He's had a great year. You know, he ran 100 miles last year in really tough conditions. Looked like his training went really well. Uh, you got Tyler Veerman, who threw down 100 miles also. He came back. Um, let's see. You know, we got we got Psychos, who always pushes the envelope for 100 miles. Um, I think Elmer King is also going to do really well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Azar. Like, th those are names to always look out for, right? And then, man, oh, Doza previous champ he's out sure. here yeah it's it's pretty dense and then i think there's a couple of guys who are gonna surprise some people who nobody knows so far right but I think, michael I think we'll learn some names at the end of this he's, he's we're talking about him who's he was it? michael shop a european okay uh coming in yeah not familiar i think well europe's toughest mother winner i think correct me on that please if i'm wrong and he's currently in second i think I've seen his name on a lot of yeah. national okay. race results. Nice. Yeah. So it's exciting. Yeah. You know what? I th it feels like every year there's one person who kind of comes out of nowhere. Mm. Like, like we'll That's see one. Great, you know, the man's or woman's podium. There'll be one person whose name we've never heard. Yeah. And uh, it's always fun to. Well, like your first year, I was like, yeah, I've Fox never done guy. a tough mutter. Like I was, I think it was point. David Fox. And I'm like, yeah. Who's the Just whilst we're talking radar. about, um, yeah. And so yeah. I had to like, and everyone's calling. You were on the line. Yeah. So, yeah, it was good. Whilst we're talking about results, somebody did ask where can they see the results. We're going to share the link on our uh, Instagram page at OCR Report. Uh, so you can go on that and find the live links. It's, people seem to be struggling to find it. So if you're looking for an athlete, go to our Instagram page. Uh, in the stories, you'll find the live results. Sorry, guys, for interrupting. Excellent. Well, cool. Well, DJ, what's your plan for next year? For next year. So I'm. I'm eyeballing the Colorado Trail again right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, that cost you a world stuff this year, right? It sure did. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you gotta you gotta put things up, you know, and, and risk certain things to, to try to do, you know, to try to do anything, try sure. to get 
try to get the prize at the end of the day, right? Like um, this, it was a very difficult decision. Like sure. this, this pulls to me and calls to me. I love the event. I've done it twice. Yeah. You know, um, I knew I wasn't going to race a couple months ago and I, but I was like, I'm just going to go to the event. Right. Um, I got really close on the Colorado trail, you know, and I think if I, I go healthy, I, sure. I got pneumonia this time around. And I, had a, I, just, I don't think that I can really do much preventative maintenance for that one. Right. Um, yeah. It stays for 420 miles. So I would like to. To go and get that one done. It's yeah. got to eat that just a little bit. Is there, there's a certain time of year you have to do that one, right? Yeah. So I went the last week of September, which was a big gamble weather-wise, right? Like there's the potential for some serious snow up high, right? The, the trail is 485 miles from Durango to Denver, Colorado, averaging 10,300 feet altitude uh, with 90,000 feet of climbing and descending in it, right? So it's, it's way up high. Um, so I'll probably go about a month earlier this time around. End of August, first week of September, maybe, which would give me nine weeks, you know, to sure. potentially jump into this. Yeah. But we'll see. Again, like, I'm still even dealing with tendinitis from it, and it's sure. been four and a half weeks now, almost five weeks. So, you just, you never know. You got to pick something, though. You can't do it all, yeah. you know, and unfortunately, like, no, that's true. yeah, I mean, this was the first real, like, ultra endurance event I had ever done. Right. And you know, it's, it's led me to, to try some other really, really cool things, but yeah. I'm definitely not done here. You know, nobody's got that 125 miles, and that's that's what I'd be eyeing when I, I come even back. Have talked about that yet? That, that 115 is the record. Mark Batchelor said a couple years ago. Yeah, with again great course conditions, right? We need we need a day like that. You need you need, like a good the one. right course, you need the right weather, mm-hmm. and you need the right two athletes pushing like pushing the second place guy has yeah. to push that first place guy, right? Well, uh, yeah, likely, right? Unless you go into that, you know, unless, unless that's the reason you're there, I'm due to one. Exactly. I mean, I do 125. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. And then that could be a challenge on its own if you don't have somebody to push you. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Mentally, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's almost a guy that does 120. Oh yeah. So you can do 125. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like last year for the last few hours, I was running scared. Sure. You know? Yeah. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. like oh, like I realized I was in third. Was like, oh man, can't lose this. You yeah. Know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just don't get caught. Don't get caught. Don't get caught for the last three or four hours. Then. DJ Fox, we hope to see you back here running next year. Yeah. But if not, we'll hope to see you in the, in the pit area again. Yeah. Definitely be a pleasure. Awesome. awesome. World Sevens Butter Champion, DJ yeah, buddy. Fox. Only for 22 hours. You are the current <laughs> champion. Yeah. I'll hold on to that for now. All Thank right, you so much. Thanks, so whilst we've been talking, Kelly Schweikart has oh, done a uh, third lap. She's on yeah, 50 yeah. miles. Uh, she's currently guys, still yeah. first place as well. No other women have done three laps yet. Uh, we are bringing you pictures from around the course. We did actually have the SESA camera on Mudderhorn get kicked, so we sent someone out to go and fix that. And uh, we're getting some more out on the obstacles as and when they open. We have the two rabbits out on course, Jason and Justin. Let's see what's going on with Jason right now. Once the obstacles open more, there's obviously a lot more to see. But in the meantime, it's a lot of seeing seeing what the athletes are doing and talking about people coming through. Um, I'll show you the top ten men whilst we're at it. We go Joshua Fiore, uh, three laps, fifteen miles. His name has been spoken about a lot this weekend. James Burton also being spoken about. Just 10 seconds behind Josh Fiore and Michael Schott. I think someone said he was Danish. Again, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Grant Thompson, Christopher Mendoza, Christian Brown Johnson, Jonathan Stern, Isaac Sanderson, Tyler Berman, and Elba King. Tyler Berman did really, really well last year. He has the capability to run a lot. He's got a lot of miles in those legs, and he's as we spoke about earlier, kind of coming at it as a position of, he wasn't talking about what miles he wanted to get or what position he wanted to get. He was talking about wanting to get to the point where you really have to push and then keep pushing through that. So we've got uh, Mudderhorn on the static cam there. And let me pull up Jason's camera. He is on the sail, which is where I actually got myself uh, Get that up for you. I got myself some blisters on my hands yesterday. I went down too fast, and it's probably the easiest obstacle out there. It's not really an obstacle, and that was the one that did me the damage. Which kind of Mudderhorn takes it out of you surprisingly. Like it, it looks like oh, okay, let's just climb up this uh, car. But man, it's just the whole body is working to get up and then to get down that obstacle, and, and yeah, and it wears out your hands. It's uh, it's a great obstacle because it's epic. 
Um, and it, it wears you down. Um, you can pretty much do it no matter how tired you are. Oh, it's been kicked again. So, oh, they're kicking our, kicking our camera there. Yeah, I was just saying, we've already had it kicked and um, we sent out Mike to fix it. So we think we need to find... We need to find a spot that uh, can't be kicked, I guess, huh? And then you can see in our picture in picture there we got the uh the descent. That's a, a trickier descent than it looks. Um it is. You, you don't have to use the rope, uh, but it certainly helps. There yeah. are some points where it's quite rough. Well, so we got the Fox, reigning world toughest mutter champion. We talked about Giles Shader, the uh, world toughest mutter. Tough Mudder CEO, who uh, is very involved with the uh, the process here, everything going on with the with the event. Um, and we'll bring in some more guests through the, uh, through the course of the 24 hours. So. Absolutely. I wonder if we can change that view from the... Uh, oh, is that up there? That shouldn't be up there. I don't think you saw the top 10. I think you just, uh, I'll show you the men's top 10 oh, and what's sure. going let's, on. Oh, sure. Let's look at them. From the first place, Joshua Fiore could, if, if Joshua Fiore, when it's all said and done, is at the top of the leaderboard, it would not be a surprise. No, I'm, I'm hearing that a lot this weekend. That's what people are feeling, aren't they? Yeah, he's a strong, strong athlete. He's had a lot of success at, um, he won the very first Spartan 24 hour race, the Spartan Ultra Championship. Uh, last year, he finished in fifth here at World's Toughest Butter. Um, so, and, and we saw him this morning before the race started, and he is looking fit. Mm. Now, obviously, all these elites are fit, but he was looking strong. So. Feeling good as well. James Burton from the UK, in second place right now, just 10 seconds behind Joshua Fiore, Michael Schott. Uh, we need to find out. Um, I know he's from Europe. I'm not sure what country he's from. I think somebody mentioned Denmark, but I'm not entirely sure. Grant Thompson, Christopher Mendoza in fifth place. Um, Mendoza won the race in 2018 in Georgia. Uh, he finished second in 2019. He did not run um, last year, but so it's been it's actually been a minute since Chris Mendoza has been on the on the podium. So if Mendoza Mendoza could easily he's a past winner he could win it again. Christian Brown Johnson in sixth place. Uh, CPJ as he's called finished in seventh last year with 95 miles. Finished in fifth in 2021 with 100 miles. Um, Christian Brown Johnson, another guy you can we'll, we'll look to see at the top of the uh, the podium there. Uh, Jonathan Stern in seventh. Isaac Sanderson in eighth. <coughs> Tyler Veerman in ninth. Tyler is another 100 miler. Uh, Tyler ran 100 miles in. Well, last year, actually. Last year, he finished in third place on the podium. We've got some updates so, to the women as well. Let's put the women we, up big well, so we can see. Before we talk see. about those women yet, mm. one name we did not see on the top ten, Trevor Sykos. We did not. Trevor Sykos is here, and Let's Trevor Sykos is running. Doing. Um, he, Trevor Sykos is the one athlete who, he'll tell you, he's not here to compete against the athletes. He's here to compete against the course. He's here to run 100 miles. And if that lands him in first place, awesome. Um... And if it lands him in sixth place, you know he's here to get 100 miles. Hmm. So he'll uh, he'll be one to watch. We'll see him on the leaderboard as we uh, as the night goes on. Let's look at those women. Callie Schweikart, first place. Callie uh, last year, or rather uh, two years ago, last year she finished in eighth place. Um, with 70 miles, she was not excited about that finish. She. she she told us she felt she has more. She has more in, in her than that. Um, Katie Knight in second. Katie Knight won the race two years ago with 90 miles. She finished in second. Katie Knight finished in second last year with 85 miles. Chris Rogloski in third place. Chris is the is DJ Fox's equivalent on the women's side. She is the <laughs> women's world champion, defending her title this year. She's in third place right there. And these are all like Chris is in third. Callie's in first. These are all so close right now. This early in the race that. Uh, when does the race start again? The race starts at midnight. Oh, my Thank goodness. Thank you for asking, friend. I haven't said that yet. The race starts at midnight. Right now, it's all about positioning for uh, 
And Stephanie Bland just crossing the finish line there for finishing her third mm. lap. So that's filling out our women's top Fifth five. Place. Oh, we so missed far. Nikki Karamba. Nikki Karamba, so we talked about with DJ Fox. Every year, every year, there is one person, at least one person, who we've never heard of on the podium. Mm. That's one of the great things about this. It's, it's very accessible. Like if you're willing to pay the, uh, the ticket price, show up and run, you can win the race. And there's Trevor Persike in, uh, we've got three laps down in 107th place. <laughs> I promise you, I would, I would bet all the money in my pocket, Trevor Cyclist will finish better than 107th place. Absolutely. Running his own race, though. Yes. And that's, you, you hear that? It, run your own race. I need to run my own race. I, was, I, I messed up because I wasn't running my own race. And it's true for this race. It's true for most races. You've got to run your own race. Another look down Mutterhorn there. Don't kick our camera, guys. Okay. Shot is Danish. She lives in Jutland and on an old farm turned by him into an old school course. Um, Thomas Peterson, thank you for that information. That is an amazing story. I would love to, uh, to talk more with uh, with Shot after the race is over. Yeah, so this is the problem with one of with having static cameras is uh, understandably if they get in the way of an athlete they're going to knock it out of the way yeah, because that's, that's more important. The athletes have plenty of things to worry about besides our cameras. I get it. It's, we can't uh, fault them for that. So. Poor, uh, poor um, Mike's going to be in and out all day, I think, fixing that. <laughs> but, I mean, what, what are we getting to? It's half two. We're getting towards 3 p.m. when more obstacles open at 3 p.m. Devil Sack, Swinging Tips, Cage Crawl open then. So we'll be seeing more going on once those obstacles open up. Cage Crawl's a good obstacle. Uh, cage Crawl, you lie on your back, you're underneath mm. a chain link fence, and you have about one to three inches of breathing space. Mm, it's, it's pretty bad for claustrophobia and fear of water. And it's that one, that obstacle, which to me was always the most stressful obstacle mm. until one time I was on a regular Tough Mudder course. My brother and I were running in Arizona and we got to, and on a regular Tough Mudder course, it's not competitive. You're kind of doing it every, you know, doing it at your own pace. So if you want to do an obstacle, you do it. If you don't want to do an obstacle, you can walk around it without a penalty. And we were by ourselves and we came up to cage crawl and we're like, hey, I was like, hey, you want to race? Uh, maybe it's just like, I don't know. One of them was like, hey, you want to race? And so we raced through it. And I don't remember who won, except it was me. <laughs> so he was like, hey, let's do it again. And so we raced again. We did cage crawl four or five times on a Saturday afternoon. And that totally cured the fear I had of the uh, of the cage crawl obstacle. So now Tom Mudder doing what they do. They make it. Now, now they have mops that hang yeah. out of your face that make it. They, they literally, like, when you go under them, they're hanging in your face. Well, that's it's... what bothered me with it last year. Like, I, I don't particularly like cold water, and I don't, I'm not a huge, I like swimming, but there's something about water races that scares me. And I got in, oh, it was icy, although it was boiling hot running the hot lap. And I was okay, but I started going too fast. And then there was the area that was covered by plastic. And I was thinking so much of getting through the mop heads, I didn't think about the plastic. And I kind of... Almost, I felt trapped underwater. I didn't know what to do. It was, it was quite scary for a minute or two. It can be a very, very scary obstacle. So, And usually what I tell people is, even if you're stopped by cage crawl, all you have to do is stand up. You're in like two feet of water. You push the chain link fence up. It swings up. It feels very stressed, very claustrophobic. But there's no actual danger. Mm. Now this year, we walked past cage crawl. It wasn't set up yet. And the, the pits were like six feet deep. You can't stand up in that. So I don't know if they're just going to have cage crawl lower in that pit or what the exact plan is for that. But we'll see. Talking about Arctic Enema, another obstacle. Arctic Enema isn't exactly on course this year. We believe it's going to be part of the melting point obstacle where it's ah, hot on the and, front and end out. and then cold on the back end. We, I, on the hot lap yesterday, we ran past an ice truck. Yeah. And, oh, did you see, I don't know if you saw the ice truck. I didn't. It said ice truck on the side. <coughs> and we're on the hot lap. We're, we, our group that was with, with myself and Fran and uh, Dustin Durow, our cameraman, our are, are kind of our crew, we were going slow. We were so slow. On the court. You can, we can actually watch the whole hot lap if you go back onto our YouTube channel. But I saw the ice truck and I thought, I wonder what's in that truck. And, no one was around to ask, and so I had to open the door. Yeah, you had to. And I opened it up, filled to the brim with ice. So 
they're going to be using that ice on course tonight. Don't don't you worry, Shane. So someone just said, uh, Psychos is running with a smash big toe. The dude is a machine. Live results say he's in 26th overall right now. So I'm not quite sure why our ours brought him up as being 107th. That is a little weird, and I've just checked on the live results. They are our results are pulling it from those results. So it, it should be 103. Yeah, that's the right number. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Well, I promise you, Trevor will not finish the 26th place either. <laughs> I would be shocked if he's not in the top. Definitely the top 10, but I'd be I'd be surprised if he's not in the top five. I'd be shocked if he's not in the top 10 by the end of the race. Uh, someone asking again, link to the live results. We can't share it for you here because we're on, you know, we're in a different place. Uh, but if you go to our Instagram page at OCR Report, you will find it in the stories. And it's also at toughmudder.com. And I think someone posted it in the Tough Mudder community Facebook page. And then you can find the results there. But yeah, if you want to... Uh, <laughs> Thomas G. Peterson. We can't share links in the chat, but it's really easy to find via Google. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, if you want us to look up a certain athlete for you, please do send his or her name and uh, not their number, and we'll look it up and put it on the screen for you. Or also just kind of look through the results for you. Yeah, there are our Instagram stories. If you uh, if you're coming in and out, like you can't, you're like, oh man, I can't watch the whole live stream. Go to, jump on Instagram. Go to at the OCR Report. Um, Carlo Piscatello, Mike Stefano, uh, our whole team is, is crushing it on the uh, on the stories. Carlo's actually going through some of the obstacles. He's up on Mutterhorn, taking video, uh, and then you'll be able to find those uh, the link to the race results. As I'm talking to you guys live right now, uh, about 20 minutes ago, we posted the uh, the link to the race results. You'll see it toward the end of our current stories, so you can find out where your uh, your current athlete is. And again, but also like. Uh, Shoot us the guy's name, and we'll look him up for you. We're we're here for 24 hours, and uh, you guys. We got so. a lot of time to look up names. Plenty of time to do a quick race result search for you. It is. You know what? It's getting toasty. Um, is that Hannah coming through? Hannah Carter. Hannah Carter finishing another lap. Hannah Carter. That was her third lap. She's done 15 miles. How did she do last year? That's a great question. Last year she finished in fourth place. 80, 80 miles just off the podium. 85 would have got you third place last year. So, 80 just off the podium. She finished in fifth two years ago. So, fifth, fourth one ago. So, it's trending for a podium finish this year. Good, good, good. Weather in Granbury right now, 75 degrees, sunny, and right now it's about the hottest. It might go up to 76, but right now it's about the warmest it's going to get. It's going to start cooling off. I think sunset about 6.38 p.m. Tonight. What were they saying? That nighttime rules apply from 5 p.m., I think. That's when black ops begins. So headlamp will be required. Flasher will be required. A lot of people talk about uh, equipment required for World Stuff as Mudder. What, what gear do I need for World Stuff as Mudder? The only actual required equipment is uh, a headlamp and a flasher. Everything else is optional. Wetsuits are optional. Running shoes are optional. Nutrition is optional. Headlamp is required. Flashers are required. I think if you didn't show up with a pair of running shorts on, they'd probably send you away. I think, I mean, maybe because that's breaking the law. Yeah. So why, why also, is it there's that headlamp and um, flashes are required? What's the deal with that? That's that's safety. Um, out on course, especially like this year, you saw the cactuses that are right up course. Uh -huh, you need uh -huh. to be able to stay on course. Also, if something crazy were to happen and you were to get injured and you were unconscious, they need to be able to find you. So it's a safety issue um, for the runner's safety. Edgar Montenegro. Somebody was asking for Edgar Montenegro's results. There he Two is. Two laps down. Edgar ate more and you got yourself a brown bib. Whoop, Good whoop. Luck. Our camera out here on the course with some of the obstacles open. Uh, 
Day 12 now. Could be strong. I think it's snogging dirt. It's snogging dirt, looks like. Yeah. We've got Jason out at. Are we you thinking that's snogging dirt there? That's what it looks like. Every once in a while, there is a world's toughest mutter. I'm not sure if that's sunblock or face paint on that dude. <laughs> well, if it was sunblock, you think it'd be covering his head as well. That's true. That's true. Every once in a while, world's toughest mutter, there is a an event with or a, an entire five miles with no mud, and it's it's very very rare, rare, but it happens from time to time. That's great. This one has the mud. It really does, doesn't it? So I was looking at like showing these individuals in the place, but that's really not the alphabetic list. So that place is like where you are alphabetically. Right, why that was Yeah, there's a, another field that should be overall rank. Uh, that's not something I can think about. So. It's, it's the only one that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll figure out like, which field is showing like what place your overall place or would you rather have a gender place there? Probably gender. 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 Yep. Thank you. We've got the whole crew here, uh, Team HQ coming in to offer feedback on some some technical stuff. We got our social media crew in here. Shout out to Jack Doris, Mike Steph Piscatello, Javier Escobar. Making a guest appearance what? in the uh, 100 miler Javier Escobar. Yeah. Oh, hey guys. Hey, let's, let's show you in yeah, here a minute. Oh, here we go. There's the, um, there we go. There is everybody. A full Ted as they're all having their little snacks. Yeah. Crew taking yeah. a little minute there. Oh, wow. Shout out to the guys. Look, my new camera spot for you. You did a great job there. No, so, Mike Stefano in the back. Let's take a quick plug for some of our stuff. Mike Stefano in the back. Host of the Obstacle Running Adventure Podcast, the only podcast running every single week since 2017, including during COVID. Now, I know you, there's lots of OCR podcasts out there. Mike has the only one every single week, Sunday or Monday, you yeah, get a new so episode. Anyway, the field, we would want Jack Gorris there on the left, far left. Jack is the number one obstacle course racing photographer in the sport, works for the OCR report. Uh, you can find his photos. Uh, Jack, what's your Instagram right now? Images by Jack. Images by Jack on Instagram, or go to the OCRreport.com and click photos for free. You can download any race photo you want from all the rate, like literally every big race from the last five years. You also saw Carlo Piscatello in there. Carlo is our uh, social media coordinator extraordinaire. He's the one you'll see on course all day and all night. And uh, just bringing it home for us. Who else is in here? Javier Escobar. Yeah. You're looking over here, Javier. Uh, he can't find the camera, but he can find the podium. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> he's, uh, he's run 100 miles. How many times you run 100 miles, Javier? At least three times. At least twice, right? Yeah. Finished fourth in 2021. Third in uh, 2019. Third on the podium 2019 in Georgia. So Javier Escobar not running this year. Javier, why aren't you running this year? Uh, injury. Injury, but we will look forward to uh, next year. Next year, 2024, Javier Escobar returns to the podium. Good looking Mark crew out there, right indeed. Shout indeed. Out. Good looking crew right there, Mark. We saw your son earlier, I believe, and uh, he was doing well. So, yeah, so shout out to the crew here. They're about to head back out on course. And you do not want to be seeing rolling. more of our faces. Let's get you some interesting stuff on course, rather. 573 men, 129 women. Getting feedback from my crew in my ear here about the way I describe their skill sets. <laughs> Probably just because you don't actually understand respect. what it is that they do. See, like, he does yeah. stuff. Some of them I can't describe it in one sentence, so I have to... Oh, we're good. You're good. So 
So we just had a, a quick chat with um, someone came to see us about the, as somebody pointed out, the placements were incorrect. So we sure. will get that fixed soon. So where it says place, do not look at that. That is so just, actually showing that person's uh, alphabetical order. We'll get that fixed as soon as we can. So thank you for ever shouting that out. That's very helpful. So everything on here is correct, except that actual placement number. His miles, Jess McKay, for example. Shout out to Jess McKay. Well done. He's done 10 miles. He's got two laps done. Those two laps took him two hours and 12 minutes. Now, now Jesse McKay, he may be on course right now. He may have 13 miles done. But the, we only, in World Stop Sputter, only completed laps count. You either ran five miles or you ran zero miles. So when the finish line, the final, final finish line closes, 25 and a half hours after we started at noon today, you have to cross that finish line before that 20. If you are 50 feet beyond that finish line and you don't, Ooh. you do not get credit for that last lap. But well, do you remember last year when Chris was doing her final lap and we were sat here like, is she going to do it? Do it? And she did it really, really cool. But there was a lot of maths going on earlier in the day, working out like, is, is it going to happen? Has she slowed down? Is she going to make it? And then she did take that final lap. She, she knew she had it. And she was kind of remember in her wetsuit and like a hood, just chomping on a piece of pizza. Things going through the mud. So that mud, when you go through it, it's actually cool at the time. Like it feels cool on you. If you're, you're, you're hot, you're running. Um, you come to an obstacle like that, you get a chance to one, you slow down. So your your heart rate slows back down. Your green catch up with your cardio. You're not sucking wind as much. And the the muddy water, it cools you off. Like you're like, oh man. I like think this... right now, even just sitting still right now, I would be quite happy getting into some cold water. Right now, 12 hours time will be very different. But what happens is you get out of that mud, and now you have muddy water on your body, yeah. and you're trying to run again. You're short. You, there's a risk of chafing. Uh, of mud horn just got kicked again. That's all right. It's kind of part of the deal. It is. It's going to stay like that. Risk of chafing. Yeah. So he was... Um, PJ was saying about that, about the chafing that he got last year. I mean, there's a lot of unpleasant things people have to ignore, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, World Service Motor is, it's a, uh, Chris Mendoza told me this once too, it's it's about problem solving. Something is, you're not going to run 24 hours, go over all these obstacles, 20 obstacles a lap. So if you're going to do 10 laps, 50 miles, that's 200 obstacles. That's crazy. Yes, it is. And we all know that when we signed up. But something is going to go wrong. Like whether yeah. it's you're, you're getting a blister, a hot spot on one of your toes, or whether your um, your lips are getting chapped and bleeding, and that's affecting your running, or whether it's um, stomach issues, like your food's not, your nutrition is not in the way you expect. Something will go wrong for every single one of these elite athletes. But the problem being, as we spoke, their pits aren't very long. They don't really have time to be solving these problems, do they? A lot of it is, yeah, they're going to have to... Um, solve it on the fly. So they'll they'll come in. They'll come in for thirty seconds. They'll be like, "I need whatever it is to solve my problem. I need you to, you know, fix my shoe." Or there's, so there's a rock in my shoe. It's as simple <laughs> as that. Sometimes. So as we move through the day, there are going to be more and more obstacles opening up. So the local time here is two forty-five. We're 15 minutes for... until the next obstacle's open. Yep. They are just crawling through that mud and sliding through it. There's no real fast way to get through that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can kind of scamper through it, but if you've got people in front of you like that, you're just kind of at their mercy. This is a cool twist on it. It goes up and down. Oh. I don't know if y'all noticed that. No. You crawl, you go up, you go crawl, so you back down. And that's snogging dirt we're looking at. Noel Medina on the comments. Mm. Big fan of Joseph Izzy, it looks like. Should we look him up?
So the next obstacle to open is swinging tips. We're going to try and get somebody there <laughs> to have a look at it. But we will be at all the obstacles throughout the night. This is a very, very long race. And there'll be plenty to see. So we're looking at snogging dirt there. And ignore the place there. We are getting that fixed as we speak. And honestly, Bigger. the place doesn't even matter right now, right? No, it, Race it doesn't, doesn't start till midnight. We've talked about that. So, but if you're curious where Joseph Izzy falls in alphabetically, it's 289. Nobody in a says. miles, three laps done. Izzy's goal is 70, 75 miles. I'm just a fan boy. Love it, Noel. Glad you're watching, man. Shout out to Noel Medina. Funky Noel Medina. He would. A huge shout out to all Team Crabs doing WTM and the wheelchair team there. Loads of love from Simply B. B Wood, the adaptive athlete. B Wood, thanks for watching. So this is an interesting part of the race. We're uh, the adrenaline of the race does not. Mm -hmm. Now you're in kind of like, okay, it's time to go to work. I need to put in some miles. Because if you have any, ch if you want any chance of getting a high number of miles, right now is where you need to put them in. You need to. Just, the weather is good. Yes. Conditions are perfect. Very few obstacles are open. You have no excuse right now. Any minute you are spending in the pit is a minute you are not on course. Yeah, not running at this time is wasted time. Yeah. So even if you're like, just grab your food and go. Grab your go. Um, we're seeing some athletes here with their families and their pit, pit um, across from us in the uh, near the finish line here. You need to get back on course. And, I, and I say, if you're thinking about running World Steps Butter and you're like, um, <laughs> shout out to Kim Rivetti. Um, Kim, Kim brought her jokes to uh, watch the show with. <laughs> she woke up and chose sass. Kim, um, <coughs> if you want to watch the whole 24 hours with us, Kim, let it, keep, a, keep a little running tab of, of how many times we say that. That the race starts at midnight. I know that's at least the second time I've said it. Um, <laughs> but right yes. now, time to get those miles in. Like, you've got to be literally just pounding pavement. Even if you're just... You, might, you can't run 24 hours. Like, it's very, very few people are going to run for 24 hours. Mm. But right now, you need to be at least jogging. You to be putting in miles while everything is perfect. We don't know what the weather's going to do. Crazy stuff can happen. You don't have a wetsuit on right now. Your legs are feeling fresh ish. Like, you've got to get out there and, and put some miles in. Because you're going to slow down once it gets cold. Once you get cold, you're going to slow down tomorrow. But if you're like, oh, I need to save energy. That is a lie, lie, lie. So you need to use the energy whilst you, you have it. You, yes, because tomorrow morning, no matter what happens, you're going to be exhausted. Oh, you yeah. You will be exhausted tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. Well, no what you said, which is, this is the best they're going to feel. That's true of every minute of the race. Yep. This is the best they're going to feel. Unless yep. they go through that low point around 4, 5, 6 a.m. Right. And then peak up. But even right now, they're not going to feel better than this. Now, some people, when they hit uh, sunrise, they use that sunrise, gives them a little shot of energy. And a lot of people talk about that. Like, we had some beautiful, beautiful sunrises in Las Vegas, especially, I remember. The um, sunset here is gorgeous. Yeah. And we Over that way. Honestly, the, with the terrain the way it is here, it's, it's real open, real flat. In Atlanta, there were so many trees, and it was just the terrain. You didn't really get 
a, a good view of the sunrise, right? Well, I'll finish a very peaceful sunrise in three hours and 45 minutes. But you're, no matter what you do, you're going to be tired tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Use the energy while you got it, and you have it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember, Allison Ty told me, Allison Ty, World Cup's mother, legend, she told me once her goal is to finish the race with nothing left in the tank. She wants to cross that finish line spent, exhausted. I remember running a race once, uh, Toughest Mudder, eight hour, 12 hour race runner. I was running it and I was, I remember thinking like, oh, I could be, if I run right now, I'm gonna use all my energy up and I'm gonna be really tired when I'm done. And then, I, and then the, my next thought was like, you dummy, that's the whole point. Yeah. You're here to run a race, not to feel good when you're done. Like you can feel good without running a race. You're here to run. What? You need to run while you can. I think that's a really valid point to make. You're not going to feel good. Don't expect this to be an easy ride. If and I firmly yourself. believe there is no such thing as saving energy like that. Like, it's not like that. Uh, if you guys already... haven't already, please explain why there's several people still on lap one. Hint, Francis. Oh, sure. No, Glenn, Glenn, you know the answer to this. Why are there people still on lap? If you're looking at the, finish result, the race results right now, you're scrolling through them. You're like, Francis Lackner, why is... Why is it taking him three hours and he still hasn't finished his first lap? We talked about it a little bit. We had video out there earlier. Um, there are guys that will go to an obstacle and just hang out literally for 24 hours. Uh, so the harder obstacles like Everest are not. Uh, Mutterhorn is an obstacle you see people at. Dublin Walls is where we saw them earlier. But at Everest, they call them the Everest Angels. They will hang out there and literally their race, their race isn't about getting miles. Their race is about helping people up Everest or helping people up starting Mutterhorn. Beginning of Mutterhorn is very difficult to start by yourself or to get over double walls. So Talk Michael Shot has just come through on uh, for his fourth lap. Uh, but Joshua Fiore came through just about a minute before as we were chatting. So we have two men currently at 20 miles and elapsed uh race time two hours and 53 minutes and they're they're literally a minute apart mm. they've run 20 miles 20 miles and they're one minute apart they are running twice as fast as i can run without obstacles can we just can we just look at that for a second you know what? that's if, how that is impressive if i start looking at the elite elite level athletes men or women doesn't matter and comparing them to my times, it is so depressing. Oh, it's so depressing. When I ran to 50 miles at World Stoppers a few years ago, I remember comparing my fastest times to Mark Battress's slowest, slowest times. And it's just not a thing. Again, there's there's several different categories. It's, it's All are welcome. There's elites here. There's regular folks here. There's people in wheelchairs here. There's people who are like uh, just walking they're literally walking every lap they're done it all everyone uh, who takes part counts yes. it's not on a it's not an elite race where there's so really if you start but if you start comparing yourself to the elite elites that are, they're, they're on the same course as you right like they're doing the same thing you're doing oh man it will you'll you will cry yourself to sleep the next time love the uh participation in the youtube yeah. comments you guys tv kagan is smash it so proud of you all be out on course smashing it next year so much fomo thank you yeah, you got a good good not good enough we need more but a good uk contingent here yeah with james burton top of the uh leaderboard right now he's just coming he's just done a he's just hit 20 miles let's have a look at the top five there for the men yeah four laps james burton well done representing strong for the uk Message there from Faye Kaylee in the UK. Hi, Fran. Hi, Faye. Faye was on the uh, OCRC in like old school. Oh, okay. Sure. Been around a long time and supported a lot last year whilst we we're doing this. So, hi, Faye. And thank you. I guess Faye lost your phone number. She couldn't text you. <laughs> Fran, call Faye back, please. <laughs> uh brian has asked a question sunset 6 38 so i assume 6 p.m uh assume what 6 p.m uh brian you're talking about um night ops and i believe we're starting at 5 p.m this uh, year. i believe we're starting at 5 p.m yeah so and that's when what that means is when the athletes start a new lap they will be required to have their headlamp and flasher on so starting at five gives everyone time to have it 
out on course once it gets dark. Exactly. Because this want... course, you definitely do need it out in the dark. Yeah, there's no, there's, I mean, there'll be lights at obstacles, but when you're out there in the middle of... Uh... It's that track, it's the, it's the, the rocky downhills that kind of, they, they scare me a little bit. Yeah. A little spooky out there. Lots of cows. I didn't mean of, scare me like that. Lots of barbed wire. So we've got a camera waiting at Swinging Tips, which is in a minute, so we'll bring you back there. Okay, this is a great part. This okay. is a great part of the race. So this obstacle opens in four minutes. Some of these athletes know that it opens in four minutes, and they're trying to run past before the obstacle opens. Some of them have no idea. They're just not they're not keeping track of that. So they're maybe walking in the distance. If they get past the obstacle before it opens, they don't have to do the obstacle. But if the obstacle opens before they get there, they have to do the obstacle or the penalty for it. So it is in everyone's best interest. If you're not running at all, you've got to get past the obstacle right now before it opens. We lost our feet there for a second. But that's so I talked, we talked earlier about how it's not to help out uh, Sue Harvey Brown crossing the uh, finish line here. Shout out to Sue Harvey. It's not worth it to kill yourself mm. in general. Unless it's to get past the obstacle. When close to this, close like this, and you're five minutes from an obstacle opening, and it's right there, it's a difficult obstacle, and it's going to have a difficult penalty. You've got to get past, like all of these people you see on screen, need to get past this obstacle before it opens. Well, talking about penalties, not every obstacle has a penalty, but Swing Tips is the first one to open with a penalty. The next one to open with a penalty is at 4 p.m., Coach's Corner. So what's the difference? What does, it, what does it mean, yes, it has a penalty, or no, it has a penalty? Does that mean it's if it doesn't have a penalty, it's mandatory completion? So, or? Yep, so if, a, if an obstacle does not have a penalty, you must complete the obstacle. So the obstacles that do not have penalties will be obstacles that anyone should be able to eat. There will be obstacles like Dublin walls. Mm -hmm. like maybe you can't do it by yourself, but, but you can get over help. that wall, right? Obstacles like just uh, hang, swinging tips here. You cannot... Not everyone's going to be able to complete it all 24 hours. Right? So, could you? Are you not allowed to have help on obstacles that require penalties? Because I could complete it if you held me up and I went along. Yeah, you can't. That's a great question. I don't across the board. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'd have to look at each individual obstacle to to tell you. Mm -hmm. But swinging tips, for example, this one we're looking at right now, mm -hmm. you cannot have someone hold your legs up mm -hmm. while you go across. <laughs> now that's something like on a regular tough butter. Like you might have like someone helping you out, like. The goal at a regular tough butter isn't to finish the fastest. Like, there's no clocks at a regular tough butter. Mm. They're not there to finish fastest. They're there to finish together. So, so for regular tough butter, you might have someone kind of hold your legs underneath you while you did this obstacle. For this one, um, you absolutely cannot do that. For a big though. no no. You can see the crew's pulling up there. I don't see the volunteer. I feel like that's going to open up though any minute, right? A uh, minute, yeah. Here comes the uh, here comes the crew. Let's let's stick. Get past it, fellas. You got to run two fifty nine. They can't hear us, but man, they got to get past that obstacle. I feel like the most exciting view at the minute, but I feel like I kind of get it open up. Right. Yeah. Just why? Why? All right. Oh man. Okay. Here comes uh, Mario across the finish line. Again. <laughs> Christian Brown Johnson just crossed the finish line again. Five laps done. Oh. Let's get the finish line up there oh, so we can go. see it. Get past it. They're getting past it. Go, 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 fellas. I still have 259. He's looking. He's literally looking at his watch. Ten seconds. I got three o'clock. It's open. It's open. Ooh. You missed it. Oh, that you missed it. Say. So close. So close. Who's our first person through? It looks like a lady. Adam Dolinar, thank you for this coverage. Which coverage was like this five years back in Vegas? Is that that's Deanna Brass, I believe? Jack's like, try that one. So Deanna Brass, the first year of Tougher Mudder, she was the almost tested, like best Tougher Mudder champion. Like she won all of these Tougher Mudder. Well, there goes Mudder Tyler fights. just crossing. Tyler Beerman just crossed the finish line again. Oh no! Well, this is a really tricky obstacle, isn't it? Because it swings. Very, it's not yeah. just difficult yeah, grip, that's, that's it Deanna moves Brass. as well. Yeah, so we've had just the tip and talking about fingertips. 
hang on to the those uh -huh. wooden platforms you can see there's quite a good grip on that yeah and there, there's a good spot to grab um halfway through you get to these knobs sometimes those are doorknobs it looks like they're metal posts this time they, they, they weren't it wasn't, it wasn't open yesterday we couldn't yeah. see it yeah. so we couldn't actually try it but you can see that that's free hanging and so not only are you trying to hang on, but that entire structure is swinging while you're going across. Mm. This guy's got a great form going across here in the foreground, moving right to left on your screens. He's doing great. And we did discuss yesterday how oh, it would no! be. Oh, no! He was no. so close. He was so close. Uh, how the... Just tip. Swing and tips. Obstacle would be impacted by someone going on the other side, which they can. Yeah, so you can, you, you'll see like, what, there's an athlete here. She's on the left side. It's hard for me to tell. Left or right. Anyway, this athlete's on the left side, but there's another side of the obstacle, and you can have two people. Oh, it's a, it's a, a lot of people are failing this. Difficult obstacle, and they're failing it early. Mm. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. We have 21 hours left of. There are not this. many obstacles okay. open. That looks like Trevor Psychos. No. Oh, he. Okay, have so we seen anyone do it yet? It looks like there's not a bell to complete it. You just gotta get to the end. Yeah, that's they're good. doing it. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, oh, that's already. a bad sign for that guy. They're holding his hamstring. Hey, from Simon Winstonley with a comment. Absolutely gutting watching from home. Simon, love to have you next year, man. Come up and say hey. It starts to get a lot more fun when everything starts to open. Yeah. We can see people so this going through. This is a great obstacle because it's hard, doable. I always struggle with this one. You see the guys who are fresh and strong, mm -hmm. they're maintaining that 90 degree angle, that keeping their L's, like mm -hmm. they say. Um, when you're hanging, easy. just hanging vertically, like with your arms extended, locked in a 180 degrees, mm -hmm. it's a lot harder. So Deanna Brass was the first athlete to do uh, tips. She made it about halfway and had to do the penalty. So Deanna, I'm sorry. I tried to get you past it. But... Mm -hmm. I'm hoping we'll be seeing some of the women coming through soon on their next lap. If they kind of stay steady with what they're doing. Sure. Callie's uh, first three laps were 40, 33, 43, 45, and 47, 07. We just had uh, Austin Azar and Christopher Mendoza come through. Austin Azar has a lap, one lap. I'm sorry, they both have four laps done. Austin Azar and Chris Mendoza, four laps, 20 miles. I'll stick the finish line on here. So if we do get any of the women coming Elmer through, we'll hopefully catch them. Elmer King just came through, four laps done, 20 miles. Nice, very nice. Elmer King, I believe we watched him last year. But then moves back. Um, so Elmer King, he could he could do uh, could do well this year. Well, this well this year. At home. <laughs> it's too early to not making sense. Well done, Logan. They're saying falling because hands are already wet. Well, maybe, but people are going to be wet throughout the night. The grip should be the strongest it's going to be right now for these so, obstacles. This obstacle, swinging tips. I don't know if their hands are going to be wet. They're coming out the obstacle before this operation, which isn't open yet. That doesn't open until 9 p.m. tonight. Um, I mean, maybe if they're still wet from snogging dirt. So, swinging tips is the eighth obstacle on course. Um, the only okay, the fourth obstacle, snogging dirt. Is a wet obstacle. They'll get wet for that one. Ladder to Hell is the fifth obstacle, which is it's also open. They will not get wet on that one. The grass not open yet. It's a dry obstacle. Operation is not open yet. But even if it was open, you it's only wet, wet. your feet. Like you're gonna stand in water. I mean, I, I do feel like even if their hands are wet, they it's still too early. So I wonder. We're seeing a lot of people fail it. Be great to see what the penalty is on this. Um, yeah, and not to be unkind, but they're not. It's not getting any easier in the next no. 21 hours. So let's see if we got a camera on the penalty loop. See what happens. Chris Berenger crossing the finish line. 
shout out. Callie Schweikart. There we go. We were kind of expecting job, to see Callie. around now. Callie just ignored me. She gave me a little head nod. She's running past, running to her quick pit, getting some quick nutrition. So that's our first woman at 20 miles. Callie Schweikart, the first first place woman. So let's Shame. see. The last time it was Katie Knight coming in second. Christian Ross be in uh, third. Let's have a look at the women's top 10 quickly. I believe that's Logan Nagel. Common, perhaps. There wasn't a huge gap between Chris and Katie. And like we say, Chris is really good at running her own race. And uh, the race doesn't start till midnight. <laughs> I said the race doesn't start till midnight. That's right. <laughs> so Callie Schweikart in first. Now, Callie has run a lot of races. She's won a lot of Spartan Ultras. Mm -hmm. So she knows what she's doing. She also has experience at World's Toughest Mudder. Last year, she finished in uh, last year. She finished in eighth place. She's run this race before. She's got experience. So sometimes when we see athletes that are in first place taken off. You know, what are we looking at? We're looking so at this, a penalty here. Uh, so this is the uh, penalty for swinging tips, hammering sticks into the ground. It looks like. Unfortunately, starting the new construction project. Right? Near Ranch, Granbury. No, they are absolutely hammering stakes in the ground as part of their penalty. That is hilarious. What an obnoxious penalty. Wow. That's, that's, that's painful. With a little sledgehammer. So the other obstacles that opened were Cage Crawl and uh, Devil's Sack. So Cage Crawl is open. Devil's Sack is open. Devil sack. The sack in reference is a sandbag. So yes. Out there. So here we go. Let's have a quick look at it. This is devil sack. So the athlete has to go under the devil's beard obstacle, but he's holding a sandbag, holding a sack. The rule for that sack is it cannot touch the ground. It can touch the ground. Oh, can it now? Yeah. Well, they've changed I that. I think so. Today. The lady yesterday said it can look touch at the an ground. Look at there. Looks like. But you can't let go of it. I think that's what she said. Because they're all touching the ground. Yeah, you're right. All right. The key, the secret to this obstacle is go through with other people. Well, yeah, because I was struggling yesterday. You just shot through. I was like, I can't keep up with you. Tim, I'm he's, laughing. He's so taller than me that I, I could just walk. So, yeah, the secret is to go through with other people. They have one kind of, well, the guy in front kind of breaks the, uh, the not breaks, but opens it up for the people behind him. It does get tricky here at the end because it's, Extra. Samantha Thompson. Yeah, Will. Five stars. Five stars. Love it. Hey, Samantha, podcast coming back next year. Tune in. Nice. It's going to be a crowded penalty loop. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You are it not is. wrong, Glenn. Um, I would say off the bat, 50% were failing it. There's Austin More. Azar. That guy will have 100 miles under his belt before this is all said and done. Uh, he's from Canada. He seems like a really nice guy. <laughs> he looks like a uh, a Greek statue. And long flowing hair and strong with this. jawline. <laughs> like if that's what you're into. I mean, I didn't place I didn't place commentary on a Greek statue. I just said he looks like a Greek statue. Uh, no, he's a great guy. I'm um, yeah. happy to see him do well. He's run hit 100 miles before. Uh, let me see what his best performance has been at World's Toughest. He got 100 miles in 2016, finishing second to Trevor Psychos. Austin was actually part of one of the coolest moments I've ever seen in World's Toughest Motor history. Mm -hmm. When... Uh, um, he was he was actually up ahead, and he was being passed by Chris Mendoza, and they were maybe two miles from the finish line. Now, this is not the time with Chris Mendoza and Trevor Cyclos. This is a different time. Is, that was in Atlanta, the one, another one you're thinking of. This was in, in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Austin Azar was being passed by Chris Mendoza. 
Chris Mendoza is passing him. Austin, he's, he's running, but he's tired and he's spent, and he knows Mendoza's going to pass him. And so he kind of yields. He's kind of like, all right, you got it, man. He reaches out, gives him a fist. Chris Mendoza gives him a fist bump as they're as they're like kind of running together. Mm-hmm. And uh, you fist bump, kind of congratulate each other. And then Mendoza keeps going. Turned out Austin actually passed Mendoza again and Austin finished oh, wow. in second. But it was a cool moment on the course, kind of a recognition of like game recognizing game or like excellence recognizing excellence. It was uh, it was fun to watch. Nice. I do. I love those moments. I love those moments where people are pushing each other on and there's a, a proper battle. Someone's asking about Isaac Anderson. There he is, seventh place. Four laps in three hours and 37 minutes. <laughs> I think this is referring to um, Austin. Oh no. Oh, David and Sarah, thanks for watching. Isaac Sanderson doing good. He's in seventh place, it looks like. Thank you, Lee. All right, ladies. <laughs> Keep focused on the race, please. The Keatles beard. The leap prop with what else. Person in front lifts, letting others move forward with ease, then switch positions. Fortunately, this devil's beard is a very short version of it. A lot of times for World Cup, most better lab. It sucked last year, didn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah, it did. A lot of times we'll have two or, or three devil, regular devil's beards back to back to back. Mm. No, last year it was um, it was dark. In the middle. I feel like some that? of the obstacles last year were a fair bit nastier than this year. Really, well, no, actually, because I think Chunky Monkey with the tires and the bananas, that was really tough going up and down. Yeah. Um, Devil's Beard with the, the, the black, that was really tough. Uh, Mudderhorn with the slide, that's a bit of fear going on there. Yeah. I feel like they... That slide last year was terrifying. I'm yeah. Move that one out. Well, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So we just got our cameras out, finding some more uh, things going on for you. Yeah, if you want, if you like Devil's Beard, oh, look at this. you got a train going through Devil's Beard right now. On the picture that picture. is the way to do it. Yeah, you really need someone in front of you to kind of break it, like, hope, like, get it up for you. And that, that guy in the front's doing the most work, but he's definitely helping out the guys behind him. There we go. Back on the penalty loop for uh, swinging tips. So you got to run out. You, you have a penalty. You can't even see swinging tips from here. No. you got to run out to the... Uh, I guess it's probably about the halfway point. Well, I think that's a big change is not the penalties this year. Last year they were fun and silly in the Tough yeah. Mudder style and, and difficult as well. That guy does not look like he had fun on that penalty. But they were just right, <laughs> fun for us, but they were right there and you could see them. And this year they have more distance as well. And uh, they're, they're wanting to avoid people choosing not to do obstacles. Giles, we, we had Giles in here, Giles Shader, the CEO of Tough Mudder a few hours ago. Mm-hmm. It's very clear that they want to re- not so much punishing people for failing obstacles, but they want to reward people for completing them. Well, I, I agree. I think, you know, there is an obstacle course race. There should be options for people, absolutely. But I think those who are getting high numbers and competing for the top spot shouldn't be choosing to not do obstacles. And then you have to pull it out after you hammer it in. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? I mean, I guess the holes are going to get pretty big after a while, aren't they? Yeah, there's Jack Horace, our photographer. I saw him here earlier. He's enjoying that too much. Hey, Jack. Jack, Jack. All right, Jack, stay behind the camera. <laughs> so you got to hammer it in there to a certain point. And then you got to pull it out. That's, uh, this is the first time that we've seen Are you guys this obstacle. Are you guys looking to interview uh, leaders? Here. Jim Campbell making an appearance. Shout out to Jim Campbell. Penalty. penalty there. That's going to kill the shoulders, isn't it? World Summit 2014 had an obstacle called Way Too Tough. 
<laughs> and it was a barrel, or a, I'm sorry, okay. a five gallon bucket. And I don't remember exactly how it went, but like you got a, there was sand, there was rock, Oof. and there was water, and you had to weigh. They're like, give me a uh, five pounds of rocks, and so you're like trying to figure out about what five pounds of rocks is. And you go there, and if you're wrong, you had a percentage. Oh, yeah. If you were wrong, you had to go do the penalty. Oof. Or they'd be like, "Give me ten pounds of water," and so you'd have to like. That's really unfair for European estimate. athletes. Oh, that's not anything with like that. I don't know what ten pounds is. I don't even know what ten pounds is in kilos. You'd be like, "Those are dollars." We call those dollars. Two point two pounds to a kilo. Ooh, that would be some really wrong. I spent more time doing maths than I would doing the. Um... Let me have a quick look at. Um... We do have a static camera up on a uh, spunky monkey it's not open yet but you can see people running past that'll open in a couple of hours All right, so this is actually hanging rough, and we do have a camera on Spunky Monkey too. So hanging rough will not open till eight. Uh, but we do have people running past it, and Spunky Monkey opens at six. Here we go, barefoot guy coming through again on the finish line. Our barefoot oh. runner coming through again. Second woman has come through as well, Stephanie Bland on twenty miles. Stephanie Bland, outstanding. These ladies, these ladies, everybody finishing 20 miles by right now. Three oh, hours. Oh, here in. comes Chris Rogowski. She's just passed us as well. Chris Rogowski. I'm guessing that's uh, trotting third place through. for her. Yep, 20 miles. Trotting, literally, just like bounce, bounce, bounce through. So we don't have a camera on it, but we can see Chris taking a quick pit stop with her uh, grabbing some nutrition. Looks like. Looks like she's. She's got a whole tray in front of her of what she can have. Now, one thing I'm kind of surprised, Chris is stopping to take her nutrition. And now she's walking out. She's uh, heading back out for their lap. I mean, I guess she's got a plan in her head of what she can do and what's, you know, what's safe, how long she can take. How is the temperature there? It is so hot. And it's, I mean, I'm sitting here. I keep spraying myself with sun cream. It's The sun is fierce. But the really dangerous thing, which I will always talk about, is it's breezy as well. So people aren't going to feel that sun, I think. There's going to be a lot of overheating and sunburn and discomfort going on. So it's 76 degrees Fahrenheit, which is uh, 24 degrees Celsius. Mm. So that was some fast maths, right? Yeah, I checked on my watch. You're exactly that right? right. 24. That's really impressive. Yeah, you know, Oof. we it's Americans are known for being versatile with our measurements. Are you? Are you really? But it's it feels hotter than 76. It's weird because there's a breeze, but it's not like. A cool breeze. Hi, Jason. Should we turn Jason's sound up? I think he might want to talk to us. Yeah, absolutely. So Jason's over there. Well, if my sound is up, I was just looking to share what uh, Will Klong is. Will Klong is yeah. actually, you know, Will Klong went into this nice cargo net. That is... Looks like a lot of fun. That looks tricky. Uh, I want to jump in that water right now. <laughs> distance Go wise. Why don't you try the opposite? It looks like a pretty good distance. There are some of them that are obviously well higher than others. But mm. I don't know. I'd be curious to see if I could reach that right now. I want him to have a go. But it looks like a good time. Either see. way. <laughs> I have to wait until it's officially open for that. Yeah, fine. All right, thanks to Jason. Jason's our producer slash rabbit out there on course. Well done, Jason. There's Chris, already out there. How do you think Chris looked coming through that lap, that, that finish line? She looked quite bouncy. Like, she looked, like, full of energy still. 
Did she look a little how, slower than I don't know. I don't, she didn't look like. I don't know what. Nick. Maybe there wasn't much spark or something. I don't know. It's like she's doing it and she's probably going to do really, really well. We know that because she's got it in her. Right. Uh, there's another woman coming through, I think. Mickey Caramba just came through again. Um, fourth one of our ones we're keeping eyes on. I don't know. She didn't. Maybe she's just got a head in a game and just doing what she needs to do and going. Corinne Colon just came through. Nice. She has the second most lifetime miles to for the women. Wow. Second only to a million women. Wow, that's incredible. That is a that is a um that is a bit of a record to have, isn't it? Yep. Jeff Lippert is another name we were hearing. Jeff's coming through. Finishing his fourth lap, 20 miles. Out on course, it looks like Tyler Bierman from the back. And uh, he's moving, I'd say, pretty strong right there. Mm. Jason doing a good job keeping up with one of our 100 milers. Uh, no, I'm really not sure. Yeah, I know Fiore and like a couple of other people have already passed 20 miles. Okay. I think I think Fiore's in the lead right now. All right. Followed by uh, James Burton, I think. British. Michael Shaw. Having a little chat out there on course. Yeah. Problem with well swung, Will Chung says, if you, if you complete it, you will get wet. Yeah, so well swung is uh, an obstacle. It looked very much like the one that Jason just showed us. But well swung, instead of having a car grenade out there that you can grab onto, well, well swung has a bell. You pull the obstacles to hit that bell. But even if you were successful, like Will Chung just said, mm -hmm. you hit the bell, you're still getting wet. Yeah. Which doesn't matter right now, 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a hot day. But it day. does matter at 3 in the morning. It does matter for now. So, um, what's, I'm trying to remember the name, Well Clung. Well clung. you got to cling onto the, the yeah. mat afterwards. So, so perfect. we're going to send a camera out into the pit right now. We didn't get to see the pit much last year, did we? We did, and out there a little bit. I went out there a little bit when it got dark. I've not been to see the orb. Here. Yeah. Event. So here's the pit area at World Stop's Butter. DJ Fox. Nice tent. 
some crate setups. That's like a, a parking, you know, a carport. It's all right, no worries. Beautiful, beautiful setups with all the food and stuff laid out. Hello. <laughs> yeah, decorations on pits are awesome. Oh, I see a, a double Eskimo tent. Dude, I think the thing is clean. Kids hanging out, having a good time. Well, these are really fancy Eskimo tents right here. And then these, this double one over here is nuts. That's some luxurious uh, ice fishing right there. Go to the back. Man. I remember my first World Stuff is I was not quite, in, I'd say about halfway in. And it was definitely a, a little bit of a, a distance to get over there. And since then, all the other uh, pits that we've got, we've been pretty lucky and gotten some pretty good spots being right by the, uh, you know, the entrance. Julia, too, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, this is only halfway down the pit. Oh my God! Holy cow! Food trucks close around six. Food trucks around six. Okay. What are there two two trucks? I see. Oh, this is the uh, race center where they got, well, not the, whatever they call it, the kitchen, basically. So it's, not, it's probably too early for caffeine. Right, right. What is this? This looks... Oh, chicken and waffles. That sounds good. I'll give that a try. Thank you. Get your, get your goods there. In a whole other section? Oh, man, this is easy. Yeah. Dan, I'm walking through. Oh, we got Phoenix raised in the house. Oh, nice. Graver raised. More guys are discarded. Saw them pushing around. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. This is set up with the wetsuits. How's it going, guys? This is awesome. I love the rocket. Got a little bit of everything available. That's cool. A little, getting a little sparse back here. Yeah. How's it going? Got their stuff hung out and ready as well. Yeah, not quite as many in the back here. It's interesting. I, uh, it's interesting that people would choose these when all those were available. Yeah. Huh. There's the entrance. Oh, uh, there's merch over there. Yeah. Awesome. All right, we'll go walk back through. I'm assuming they walked off to take a break since we're since we're on camera. And I, I'm assuming they got the audio up. People just chilling out, waiting for their ass to sleep. There's a pin that's way back here. Because 
I mean, obviously this is different for everybody. Everybody, uh, everybody like I just want to do everything myself, and I don't know what to tell my pit crew to do. So if they could read my mind, that would be great. So that, that you know, if that's possible. And you have everything laid out well, and they they know where it is, then they can grab it super quick. Very helpful. Thank y'all so much for volunteering. Oh, there it is. Was it? Um. Oh yeah, it is rough over here, isn't it? Um. So. It might have been frozen when you asked, but you were asking for advice for a good pit crew. Uh, can be Yeah, I mean, Someone asking if there's any possibility to see the whole ranking online. Yep. Uh, so if you go to our Instagram page at the OCR report in our stories, we have the live results. They're also on uh, toughmudder.com and you can just find them through Google. We'll be putting up the top five and top ten every now and again, as we just did. Uh, not much going on out there in terms of picture. I think we've got a camera heading to Mudderhorn. Let's have a quick look at yeah. yeah. Saw a comment from Tamara Forrester. Shout out to Tamara Forrester. Tamara was a member of my pit crew for several years when I was running with Team Bat Boys. Bat Boys. So what happens is you run World's Toughest Mudder and you get these these bibs, right? These cool bib, white yeah. bib, orange bib, black bib. And then a lot of people, when they run a regular Tough Mudder events throughout the year, the next year, they'll wear their World's Toughest Mudder bib just so they can like. It's a little bit of a, it's like, hey, check this out. I ran World's Toughest Mudder. I would. Um, but it's also, so you can identify other members of the community. Like, hey, you ran, I was there last year in Cranberry. Um, and it's just kind of cool because you wear it on course. People you see your name. or And it, anyway, it's just a cool thing to have that bib the next year after you run World's Toughest Mudder. So I was with my team. We call ourselves Team Fat Boys. Me and three other guys that we've known each other since we were all like 16, 17. We went to school together. We worked together. Uh, good friends, Scott Forrester, Nate Swanson, uh, Joel George. So what happens is you get your bib, and then the night before World's Toughest Mudder, 
should bring it. Should bring it. Yeah, should bring I started in the middle. I was like, four <laughs> letters. Boys is four letters. Fat is three letters. It's very easy. Unless it's fat with math. a pH. What's that? Unless it's fat with a pH. Well, we were just fat. So, F A T in the middle, easy. Boys, left to right, cool. So then I'm starting to write team fat boys, but for team, I have to write it from right to left to keep it centered. Does that make sense? Okay. So, except team is spelled T E A M. And somehow I screwed up the backward spelling of team. No, I had I had to I had to go with them fat boys. <laughs> I was so mad because I was like, I'm gonna wear this bib on course for an entire year next year. Them and fat it says boys. Fat boys. And I'm running by myself, like my team's not out there with me Aww. in like Temecula, California <laughs> for the next year's race. So I was gonna say them, but that makes no sense. Anyway, I was very upset with myself. So bring the, the moral of the story is bring a sharpie so you can your name that I'm <laughs> Talking about teams. Yeah. That's, uh, that's going around. It's called going around your elbow and your thumb. That story. <laughs> uh, how, do we, how do we see what's going on with the teams? Teams. Let's have a look. Teams. So how do the teams work? Well, uh, World Stuff is Mother. So with your team, you can have two, three, or four people in a team. And the entire team has to do the first lap and has to do the last lap together. Okay. The Every lap in between, however many laps there are in between, at least half of the team has to be on course at the same time. So you can so, have two run a lap, two run a lap. So you can have two run a lap, two run a lap. Oh, wow. And you'd be right, they do. In the past, there were different categories. There was a two-man team. There was a four-man. They had at one time they had three or four different team lot, categories. It? it was just a lot to keep track of. It was a lot to to follow. So, uh, starting last year and going forward, there's a one-team category, two, three, or four people teams. D Fit Black, Crazyn Divas, Cristelli Fitness, Maximum Effort. These Minna sound Floor. like these sound like we're repeating what happened last year. I remember these names. Yeah, and, and I remember saying these names a lot. The, the thing is, these are all kind of family friendly too, right? Jack and the Beanstalk, Florida's Ultra Cross Country Team, Splash. Free, but sometimes people they like to go a little uh, not safe for work with their team names, and uh, we're glad these top ten teams keeping it uh, keeping it a family show here. Appreciate you guys. <laughs> well done. Yeah, we just popped the race clock up. So we have been going for three hours and 39 minutes. So up nearly four hours. We talked about it at the beginning, but we can talk about it again. This weekend is daylight savings. Uh -huh. And so people have asked us, well, man, are they going to go 25 hours instead of 24 hours? And no, it's a 24-hour race. You have an hour and a half to finish your last lap. But we will, especially once midnight comes around, we're going to be referring to the hours of the race. Yes. We're in hour number 12. We're in hour 15. We're in hour 19. So currently we're in hour number three. We are. We're in the third hour of the race. Well, actually, we're in the fourth hour of the race. Okay, three, that's going to confuse the heck out of it. So essentially, we are going to pretend like daylight savings is not even a thing. We're going to... Uh, I guess everything we've got, this digital will update itself anyway. It's yeah. just going to be sad going through 2 a.m. twice. Yep, yep. I always wonder for those people that work hourly, like how, like, if you're like an overnight security guard working an overnight shift during daylight savings. I hope you, you get paid extra. You can't not be paid for that extra hour. I right? know, I hope they'd pay you more for that extra hour. I think. Also, shout out to anybody who's watching us all 24 hours. Let us know. Um, mm. uh, we'd love to. I don't. We don't have a test or anything, but let us know. We'll give you a shout out. Lee says, uh, gutted they didn't make it 25 hours. 
a a cheeky sprint power hour as the clocks went back. That would have been good fun. So somebody asked, what do the black bibs represent? So the black bibs, let's talk about that again. Um, oh, Scott Forster, Team Fat Boys representing. Whoop, whoop. Love to see you, Scott. Um, them fat boys. Them fat boys. So three color bibs you'll see on course. There's the white bibs that most people have. Those are the open bibs. Actually four for being, well, I mean, I guess we can get into it. There's three <laughs> standard bibs. There's the white bib for open category. There's the orange for contenders. And there's the black for elite contenders. Okay. Um, the can, open wave, anyone can sign up to run open wave. Yep. Uh, contender and elite contender bibs, they've earned those based on performances at Toughest Mudder Infinity or um, Tough Mudder Infinity or a Toughest Mudder event. Um, there's higher standards to get the elite contender, those are harder to get. And you can also get those by uh, previous qualifications and other events. Even some Spartan events, there's different ways you can get it, but basically the elite contenders have, have done a little of uh, performance in the past. And so they, and what, what do you get for a black bib? Great Is that question. Josh Fiore just going through? And Michael Scott was Josh shot just Fiore right behind him. Literally seconds apart, three seconds apart, Michael shot, Joshua Fiore just came through the finish line. Those are the top 10 shows the time again, it's as well. Early, and there's a rumor going around that the race doesn't start till midnight. What? But those are two guys to definitely keep your eye on as the uh, as the event goes on. Looking down the list, James Burton from the UK, Grant Thompson, and Brian Brown Johnson in third place, or fifth place rather. Tyler Beerman in sixth, Isaac Sanderson in seventh, Christopher Mendoza drops a little bit in eighth, Austin Azar in ninth, Elmer King in tenth. Now you, now you think, oh man, Mendoza was in sixth place last time we saw him, and now he's in eighth. But look, he's literally two minutes behind Tyler Veerman. They're at the same mileage count. That There's so much happens out on course that we don't see. Yeah, it's, so it's like right now, uh, Fiore and Shot, three seconds behind between each other, but five miles. And, and yeah. honestly, what's what's happening with Fiore and Shot right now is those two guys are pacing each other, uh -huh. and they're both going faster because of it. Which so, they could burn out. Which, we we kind of saw that last year, didn't we? With Tyler Veerman, 100%. We thought Tyler Veerman was going to win a race last year, and he ended up uh, dropping down. So this is a valid question without us being facetious. Uh, you said the few times that the race is until midnight. You explain that. Everyone's yeah, absolutely. Me. Rich, we don't want to, it, it might seem like kind of a joke, but um, the race, the race starts noon on Saturday. The race ends at noon on Sunday. Take, throw in daylight savings out and you have an hour and a half to finish your last lap. When we say the race doesn't sign, what we mean is that the elite athletes who are vying for the podium, we're trying to, to win the, the $5,000. competition $5, doesn't start. Exactly. They are, these whole first 12 hours, everyone's just keeping pace with each other. And at the 12 hour mark, at midnight, is when is when they will start looking at, at where they're, they are in the standings. Clint Jackson going across, finish line here guy for Tough Mudder. At midnight is when they will start seeing like, where's my competition? Like, am I ahead of them? Am I behind them? So it feels um, slightly concerning for Joshua and Michael Shot to be like three seconds apart, but quite ahead of everyone else. Are you pushing the racing too early? You know, well, Chris Rogowski, she's still sitting in third place. She got a hundred miles last year, record breaker. Is she, you know, is she pacing herself sure. sensibly to go for the long game? And what's the actual? We saw this last year. People going out too fast. And it's it, you're, you're not wrong. It's totally up. It's totally a, like a, a personal individual decision. Because some athletes, they're like, I just got to go. I got to run. We've seen this with like like Will Miracle in shorter courses. Mm -hmm. She's got to run, right? Her her pacing herself is running. And some of these athletes, they have one speed, and it's not that's not necessarily a good thing. No. They it's hard to change your pace. Now, it's Joshua, really hard. Joshua Fiore, like, and uh, and Michael Schott, in, in, I'm not as familiar with, with, with Schott, but Fiore, he knows races like this. Like, he knows how to pace himself. He's he's won 24 hour, hour races before. Mm. Uh, not this run, but other, other uh, he won the Spartan um, Iceland 24 hour race mm. several years ago. So, it's, what I mean, um, Rich, that's a great question. Some of the athletes will tell their pit crew. I don't even want to know what the other athletes are doing. I think I wouldn't want to know. I think I think it's like just... they're literally like, "Don't tell me. I'm just trying to run my race yes. for the first 12 hours." Now, at, once that's, that's when when runners will start evaluating the competition. Mm. They'll start. How long are his pits? 
Like, what are what are that guy's splits? How fast is he coming in each lap? Like, what do I need to do on my next lap to catch the guy in front of me? Mm-hmm. All of those competitive race questions or race decisions that the elite athletes need to make, they, they are literally ignoring those for the first 12 hours of the race. Midnight is when the the competition and the race strategy begins for those elite athletes. Great question, Rich. Somebody else asked, world's toughest mudder is only a five mile loop. Now you spoke about this with uh, Amelia Boone earlier, who is obviously a well-seasoned champion of world's toughest mudder and the difference between the five mile and the 10 mile loop. Now saying only is, uh, <laughs> saying only is, uh, is a strong thing to say. What did Amelia have to say about the difference between five and 10 miles? Great question, Stephen. Why, why is World Toughest Mudder only a five-mile loop? The very first year of World Toughest Mudder, it was an eight-mile loop. 2011, the raceway That's park. really hard to do the maths. Yeah. You had to be eight, 60. Like the, uh, Not for you, for me. The people who won the race, they did like 48 miles. Miles. In 2011, Jun Young Pack ran 56 miles. Julian Sprouls won the race with 48 miles. I have a quick question. Sorry, just a sidetrack. Sure. The mileage we see nowadays is far, far higher than that. Has the race easier, or have the athletes really got that much better? Um, well, the reason the miles were so low in Raceway Park, the race was in December. Yeah. We're in the first weekend of November. Yeah, so I mean, we're it's, watching this race. Burning hot. The sky is blue. It's 75 degrees. There are pictures. The first year at Race Park, they had to, there were water obstacles, mm-hmm. but before they could jump into the water, they had to break the ice wow. to jump into the water. It was brutal, brutal conditions. And it was the first year, and it was so, it was very, very difficult. Okay. And it was in New Jersey. In right. December. Oh, gosh. Blimey, so, yeah. Um, so, that's, I think, what you're going to show you most of that, too. So, first year was eight mile loops. The second year was 10 mile loops. The third year in 2013, Raceway Park was the first year they went to five mile loops. And I think. I, I, we'd have to talk with some people who like were making the decisions back mm-hmm. then. I think the reason they went to five mile loops is it's the math is easier. The maths are easier, <laughs> right? Like five, ten, fifteen. It's very easy to calculate. I think as somebody who would do this race as a, I mean, probably one of the slowest people, I would be more likely to go out for an extra lap if it was five miles. But I think also for elites they're more likely to go out for an extra lap. So it's probably going to push the results much higher. It's like, you know, at an auction and the auctioneer will bid you up by a pound at a time. You're going to get up to, you know, half a million very quickly, but sure. faster than if you go by 10,000 at a yeah. time, because it's less And you'll scary. still get there. You'll still get there. But it's little steps. Mm. Yeah. And also, um, yeah, I think round numbers, I think getting, getting people up there. Uh, tough butter is a uh, take. You are away from the start area, from the from the pit area, from the dick, from Melissa Duke just coming through. Uh, ten miles, you're on a journey, right? You're gone, and then, and then when you come back, it's a big deal. Like, oh my gosh, the music's playing, the people are here. I'm back. So why? Like, I don't really want to leave. Five miles, yes, you're gone for a while, but it, it just. It's also, and as well, talking about those problems that people have to solve, five miles is half the amount of time that you have to suffer before you can solve a problem. And whilst these events, you know, there are things that make people suffer. There goes James Burton, 25 miles. Um, the, whilst there are things that people suffer through in this event, and we're talking about how the spirit of the event is finding that point and pushing past it, it's also not necessarily about punishing people and making it harder than it needs to be. And it is still a very athletic, competitive event. And maybe maybe it's just too long to leave people needing the toilet or having a rock in their shoe or without a wetsuit. Tyler Beerman coming through. Fantastic. Yeah, I agree. And it, after so many years, I think five miles is, is really this, like three miles would be too short. So there's top 10 it's, men up. So we can see the timing. miles is definitely too long. So those top 10 men again. Joshua Fiore, Michael Schott still first and second. James Burton, we just saw come through mm-hmm. 25 miles. Tyler Beerman, just saw come through with 25 miles. So four men right now, 25 miles. And those four men, the 25 miles is a quarter of the way to 100. And 
right now we're at three hours and 50 minutes of race time. So, so in less than four hours, they've already run a quarter of a hundred miles. So people at home doing the math, they're like, well, man, if you could do, if you could do 25 in four hours, like four goes into 24, how many times? Six times? Six times you can do 150 miles. That's if you keep picking your pacing. I'm just looking at the uh, lap times for Kelly. Uh, her last lap was five minutes slower than the lap before, and the lap that was also in turn four minutes slower. So people do kind of their laps change. Their laps get a bit slower, and then they speed up again, we found. Orion um, James just came through, Mark James' son. So, you know, looking at that, we might expect to see Kelly here on the hour or just after the hour if she stays consistent to just losing a little bit of time. But I just want to tell people, if you're doing the math right now, no one is running 150 miles today. No. No one is running 150 miles. I would love it if someone ran 125. That would make my day. Well, we spoke, chatted with Chris earlier, didn't we? And uh, we asked her what is her goal. Again, she was one that was very uh, reticent to give a number. But she said, it's a big number. And you said, Does that, is that number three figures? And she said, yes. And you said, does it have a zero on the end? And she said, no. So what are we looking at? 105 or 115? <laughs> I think I think going one is, you know what? I don't know if she's going for 105 or 115. I would guess 105. 115 is the men's record, though. It is. Mark Batcher said that yeah. two years ago in Laughlin, Nevada. So maybe, uh, I don't want I don't want to, I would never... Well, 105 was the men's winner and second place last year. DJ Fox and Mark Clark Gadet. Yes. And yeah, they did it in 24, 27, 25, 09. With Tyler Vimmen in third at 100 miles. Interesting though, what did Tyler Vimmen do? 100 miles in 23, 18, and Chris Glossy did 100 miles in 25, 16. So two hours difference. Uh, but she's, she's always got the miles in her legs. You know, she works really hard. That's a great way to say it. She has miles in her legs. Yeah, I mean, how many hundred like miles does she do every year? I've never run hundred miles in my life. She does it like seven times in a summer. She did it and then she came here and did a uh, hundred miles here. And uh, yeah, now it's just becoming so often that I've lost how many hundred miles as she's done. So, uh, Steven, that was a long answer, but that was a good question. Why is it? I love your question. Other questions about World's Toughest Butter, shoot them in. We've got... Uh, good 20 something hours to uh, to talk about <laughs> we absolutely do um, jason's out on the course now let's get a camera rather than looking at the finish line you're looking at mutterhorn this is the athletes are coming away so these athletes just finished mutterhorn that you see here and it takes it out of you like it's it's not a complicated obstacle, but it is not easy. I really, really like the Tough Mudder obstacles for this. Uh, and especially this year, they seem quite pared down and simple. I'm a big, big fan. Anyone who listens to me talk, I always say it in just about every podcast, I'm a big fan of the simple but tricky obstacles. Sure. I don't think obstacles need to be overly convoluted. And I think the beauty of obstacle design and where the real brains come in is being able to just do something simple that's devilishly tricky. You know what else? A good obstacle does not have to be impossible to complete. Yeah. Like it has to be completable by, I don't know, 60%, 65% of the, like you can't be so hard that 5% of the athletes are finishing. I That's also not, think a really good obstacle shouldn't have to have any rules. Or should not have what? Shouldn't have to have any rules or explanation. Oh, that's true. You walk up to it. You know what you're you know doing. What? Mutterhorn's a great example. You walk up to Mutterhorn, like, okay, get up and over. I get it. There goes Austin Azar. Austin and Thompson and Christian Brown Johnson all coming through at the same time. Um, they're all finishing their fifth lap, 25 miles down. Those are guys we're going to see at the top of the leaderboard mm. as well. No, that's a great. That's a great. You walk up to Dublin Walls, okay? I got to get over it. Even some of the ones uh, like um, with the barrel um, that we saw, the barrel and the strap, uh, barrel chested. Mm. That was tough. We haven't seen athletes on it yet. I'm not, it opens up at 7 p.m. Mm. That's a great, it's a very simple obstacle. It's a strap over water, and there's a barrel in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And you have to, now there, you are, you do have to stay under it. So the only explanation would be you can't go on top of the strap. But yeah, get from I think Giles said you could go on top of the strap if you can go on top of the strap. He said you can go on top of the strap if you can go on top of the strap. Which would mean slacklining the whole thing. 
Oh, like... Yeah, which I'm pretty sure no one can do. Oh, good luck. You Um, crawl on top, though. I think you'd swing back under. So Jason and Mike had a go yesterday on the hot lap, and the going across the barrel looked like it would, again, give severe cramp. And uh, Jason commented that the strap was really quite painful on the fingers. That strap, man, that's a good shot of Mutterhorn right there. Mm. Those guys coming down. So, um, that guy's the producer there, Jason. He's going to adjust the uh, static camera with the non-moving camera. I have a, my theory, someone told me this, and it sounds ridiculous until you do it. And I tell anyone who listens, and nobody listens, when you come down Mutterhorn, the fastest way to come to you, everyone you're looking at is going down. Forward. So, is you I, face I agree. forward. I would go down forward. Have you, have you gone down face? Have you done it? No, it's, but similar obstacles, if you want to go fast, go down forward. And also you can see your feet. You can see your feet. And you're going, it's, it's like basically going down steps, mm. like rope steps. It's hot. Um, and, and you can see the top two thirds there. There is a, a rope, uh, or not a rope, but like another net that's holding you against the obstacle. So your hands, you're facing forward. You're you're not your butt's not even touching like your feet or you're standing vertical mm. you're standing on you're, and you're stepping down like you're going downstairs and you're reaching forward with your hands and using that net as a safety then when you get to where the net ends you can see it about a third of the way from the ground mm-hmm. then you turn around and you finish the last third of it facing the obstacle but it's literally three times as fast you can see one guy um, as uh as he's going down legal is that it may not be faster but i promise you if you guys get to a tough mutter or world toughest mutter uh-huh. you get a mutter horn put your back to the obstacle when you're going down it feels scary the first time you're like what am i doing it's Imagine. not it's, not it's a tall obstacle how, how big is it you know what i want to say it's 50 feet tall mm. Mm, 40, she says as if she knows what 50 feet yeah, means 40 to 50 feet you know a good uh uh, 13 meters. <laughs> I think that's bad math. Though. 13 to 16 meters, let's say. Really? Oh, wow. Okay. We Americans are known for our measurements, translations. Very impressive. I don't know what a yard is. It's uh, it's where you keep your pets. And that's your yard. Haley Malott just came through three laps with Zach Malott. Congratulations, Zach and Haley. Oh, we're running together. We're running together. That. Husband, wife, brother, sister. We don't know. Sweet either way. Right. My very first Tough Mudder was with my family. Oh, I, I love did it with that. Uh, my brother and two of my sisters. And, oh, yeah, uh, are you one of four? One of five. One of five. Yeah, I remember I gave him uh, gave so him a little start one line speech. Out. I was like, I don't remember exactly what I said. But we were all excited. Like it was our very first tough mutter. We got T-shirts. We wore our crummiest shoes, as you do. Oh yeah. For your first tough mutter, generally. There's another shot of uh, Mutterhorn. Mutterhorn from the top. Mutterhorn. If you have a trouble with heights, it's a scary obstacle. Mm. It's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's one of the tough mutters best. It's a good one. Mm. So uh, I remember my first tough mutter. Tell me about it. Not done it yet, but I will definitely remember it. I mean, I've done the hot lap. That counts. You've done the hot lap twice. You've done more hot laps than most people. Boom. So four hours. We're literally seconds away from the four-hour mark. Four hours Oof. in the book. Twenty-one to go. Twenty-one and a half to go. <coughs> this is this is where we put in the miles. We talked about it. The next, I would say, the next. Uh, Four hours. You want to get as many Ooh. miles under your belt as you can. Now, you, obviously, the whole twenty-four. You want to get as many as you can. But night op starts in one hour. Yeah. And it's unbelievable because it's so hot and sunny now. But I mean, only from experience of last year. Once the sun went down, it got cold quickly. We'll be we'll be putting on our trousers. Trousers are what we call pants. Um, I'm already wearing and pants. Our dry robes. Oh yeah, staying cozy in the crinkly robe. Man, that's a good shot at all, so I can look at that all day. It's good, isn't it? So if it's your first time, or maybe it's not even your first time, you're watching this, and you're like, why should 
I want run World's Toughest Mudder? I think I can give you a few reasons. Mm-hmm. One is because it may be the hardest thing you ever do. Now there I are, agree. There are things you can quantify, like having children or like raising children or sending a child to the child to college like a lot of child related things family related things are probably harder right yeah but physically like causing pain and again i mean like physical pain i don't mean like well child it's it was mental pain it's race wise i mean listen i've had one kid it took two and a half hours this is 24 hours could i do that for 24 hours probably not yeah, but i didn't have to <laughs> This is tough. Like, at this point, push you to the 25 and a half hour point. Whoop, whoop. At this point, I'm like, yeah, this would be loads of fun. But I know the feeling I had last year at like four in the morning. And I was like, heck no, never happening, never doing it. No, 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 no. A lot of people <coughs> mentally inside, they'll say, you know, how tough am I? Like, like, can I, do I have what it takes? I don't. <laughs> and there is nothing better than this event to test you physically, to test you mentally. Mm. And it's, even if you come out here and you have a bad performance, it's not a failure. Like it's not, literally getting to the start line is a win. Um, The hardest obstacle is just signing up. Not because it's expensive, it is an expensive race. (laughs) Give or take, it's 500 bucks. Like you sign up, if you sign up tomorrow for next year's race, you'll get a discount. Mm. If you wait till the last minute, to sign up for next year's race, five hundred sixty-nine. I think it's basically five hundred bucks. Yeah, but no, the hardest obstacle is signing up because it's very scary. You're committing to something that you know is crazy. Running twenty-four hours is a crazy. We're not designed for this. You're like, I can't do that. No, I can't. Like, it's insane. Um, multiple times when I was running regular tough butters mm-hmm. and I read stuff about world stuff is butter, and I would say to myself, "It's uh, Phoebe Yap crossing the uh, star line there with Elmer King." Elmer finishing his fifth lap, Phoebe on her finishing her third. I would say to myself, I said this multiple years in a row. I'd do a regular tough butter, and I would say, I'm I'm not going to run this year. I'm going to run next year. Mm. I'm going to train really hard this year, and then I'm going to run next year. And then next year, I'd roll around, and I would tell my, I'd I'd do a regular tough butter. I'd see the signs and the ads for World Seven's butter, and I would say the exact same thing. Mm. I'm not going to run this year. I'm going to run next year. (laughs) And I did this, I think, three times. And then one year I was finally tomorrow like, never comes, right? Yeah, literally. Like tomorrow is the, your enemy. Like don't someday is death. But it's absolutely the way. I think you have to sign up when you get the motivation. Like people watching this. Um saw a woman, I was just seeing who that was. Here's a good shot of the start of Mutterhorn. Yeah. Um it's so there's that board there, but that's a, it's a two by four. It's very thin. The uh that's why there's guys that are there helping you uh get up to the top there. We're kind of losing our signal there. It's a shame because it's a good shot of the uh start of it but so multiple times i told myself not this year i'm gonna train really hard this year i'm gonna run next year and but you have to sign up in order to train and you have to sign up when the motivation is higher you've just 100%. watched an event you've just been in an event because otherwise you're never going to find your way back you don't sign up when you're ready you commit before you're ready and then you get ready yeah and then eventually one year like i was like you know what fine i'm just signing up i'm just doing it and mm. i signed up and i did it and i finally went to world stuff butter it's 2015 and it was a, I was super excited, and I was looking forward to it all year long. And it finally came around, and I did terrible. <laughs> Define but, terrible. But I've been back every year. Nah, I missed one year, but every year since. Every year that I didn't have a major arm surgery, mm. I've been back every year. So it's a great event. Love it. Okay, so here we go at the bottom of Mutterhorn. You see these guys at the bottom? They're just kind of like assuming this position. And then when, when athletes walk up, they're like, all right, step one, put your foot on my leg. Step two, put your foot on my shoulder. Step three. How difficult is up. it to do that on your own? Say it one more time. How difficult is it to do that on your own? There we go. Very There's an difficult, athlete doing it by himself. you don't himself. have much to grab. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, what, like a tube of six or something. So here you go. One, two, oh, they're at three. And they're up. And these are the kind of guys that we spoke about who they'll be on their first lap still. Yep. Because they stay there all night, which is really hard work and some of those guys i didn't i didn't catch their bib numbers but we could look them up they're probably on their first lap maybe their second lap and this is again something that we were talking three two two five let's have a look at him three two two five um that we were mentioning earlier with giles 
this is a community initiative. This is these guys deciding oh, yeah. to do that. They pay, these, these guys, they all paid their full race ticket. Mm -hmm. None of them got a discount. None of them, um, none of them got free passes or whatever. They all paid to be out here, and this is their race is to help other racers, other members of the community. You'll see, tomorrow morning there's a uh, community brunch. It's an award ceremony. It's a celebration of the event, of the community, and of the of the winners. And you'll see these guys. Their shoulders look like hamburger. <laughs> like literally, they're chewed up. They have certain shoes. There's certain brands that mm. they don't like because they're like when, you, when runners come up and they're wearing their shoes. I don't know which brands they prefer, but they're like they're worse for them on the on it on their shoulders. Those certain brands. Of I shoes. always see when I stand on someone's shoulders. But this, they're there. Like and then literally, like a ton, most ninety five percent of the racers could not finish this race without these guys' help. I just looked someone up, but I don't think I got the number correct because they appear Joe to be. Joe Perry going up there. One three six seven. Another one. Let's have a look. One two six seven, baby. Looks like that was Chris. Is that Chris Mendoza? Another elite contender. There's a good shot of the that second net, that safety net. Some of the picker out there watching athletes. So, just for interest, um, our ladies are still at the start on the course. Callie passed Mudderhorn literally a minute ago. Uh, we missed her. Uh, Stephanie Bland passed Spunky Monkey seven minutes ago. And Chris Rogloski just went through Spunky Monkey. And uh, that's obstacle 60 of 20. I'm not sure on what mile that is. I love timing what's out on course. Right, let's see. Let's see if we can get some of these uh, bib numbers and give people a I shout. I think I saw out. one three six seven. There's three three six seven. So the there's three two two five. Um, this lady, unicorn lady, you know what? Typically, we only see the uh, the fellas doing the mm. obstacle help there. So, interesting to see the ladies out there. Uh, three three six seven is Kay Zarowski. No laps. No laps completed. Yeah. So, so she's gone out there and has stayed there. I, I'm not a I'm not a small person, and I man, if I walked up there and I see I see these ladies, I'd be like, I can't do that to you. I'm sorry. There's Sue, Sue Harvey Brown walking up. More power to these ladies, though. That's awesome. Mm. Check her out there. Foot on the shoulder. Boom. And you're up. Well done. That was good technique by Sue going up. It was good technique. There's Evan Preparis. Um, Evan's written several OCR books you can find on Amazon. And oh. he's uh, he's always, I'd say, almost always in the top 10 mm. for finishing. Look at this one two so so one foot goes on the guy's knee or guy's thigh the right foot goes on the guy's thigh left foot goes on the lady's shoulder and then the next step is up onto that two by four that's nailed in there it's not felt like he's trying to get his knee on there that's just not enough Callie Schweihart just got uh, 25 miles Is that there you 408.23, so she's just Kelly gone Schweikart through. in the lead. <laughs> mm -hmm. Out of interest, because I like doing this, let's see the time difference. So Callie's the only woman to finish her fifth lap. Mm. She's in the lead. How do you think have... she's doing 
time wise do you think she's pushing it do you think she's taking it being sensible so she just finished five laps in four hours that's that seems fast it does right? seem fast but i'm not I'm, i'd never tell someone to slow down I no it's their there, own race they it. know what they're doing they're grown-ups um Man, that's. I have to do you know, it, man. Thinking through, if I was, this is hard for me to even imagine. But if I was winning World Cup Mutter at the four-hour point, and I know I've got Katie Knight behind me, and I know I've got Chris Roglowski behind me, and I know I've got some of these other women whose names I'd never heard of, but they're they're beating Chris Roglowski on my tail, a constant pressure. I I don't think I'd want to slow down, right? I want to at least. I'm in front. I want to stay in front. Well, if you do, um, there's always going to be that moment of, I could have gone faster at that point. And if you, you know, if there's just that little bit of time that you needed to finish a lap or to take the win, uh, the win, you're always going to kick yourself, I guess. It's difficult. It's part of the it's, it's not just a running race. So I've interest, yeah. her, this lap was another six minutes slower than the lap previously. So she's gone from the first lap being 40 minutes and 30 seconds to the fifth lap being 8 minutes 53 seconds. And kind of a fact, not, not, not skewing, but changing just the context of those results is obstacles have been up. Yes. So each lap is going to be slower and slower. Like naturally, each lap will be slower. Well, Josh Fiore, his first lap was 38 minutes and his last, his fifth lap was 49 minutes. So each lap's getting, you know. Yeah. It's kind of what you see. It must be so difficult to do that math in your head, though. What what do I need to be achieving to achieve my goal? I firmly am against doing math on the race course. This is where we disagree. Yeah, we, we talked about this yesterday during the hot lap. Uh, I, I think once you start doing math on the race course, one, you're tired, and so it's good, high potential to be inaccurate. Two, if you start doing rate math on the race course, and now this, this may be skewed by my experience as a regular guy racing versus an elite athlete racing, but in my experience, when I start doing math, it's loser math. It's how slow can I go uh, right. to still reach my goal? You're like, oh, as long as I, I think, finish. I think of it as what do I need to do in order to reach my goal? Yeah. yeah. You're, you're probably, uh, I mean, more elite than I am. So. Absolutely not, buddy. I'm, I couldn't get the miles that you got. I, yeah, so I can do, like, all that math, all, all the splits, the calculations, anything I can do with, with that, I try and do it before the race starts, while I'm, like, sitting in my hotel room or sitting in my house, and I'm, I'm comfortable, and I'm awake and alert, and I know I can think clearly, and also but, I'm not but, worried I about... Mean, you said it yourself, World's Toughest Motor is about problem solving. It is. So there's, you're never going to get those um, splits that you're necessarily, you might... But are you going to get the splits that you're hoping for all night long? Or is there going to come a point where you go, right, this is what happened. What do I need to do in order to reclaim? So one of the, I don't know if everyone does this, but like, I feel like everyone that runs World's Toughest Mudder has done this at least once. If you run it multiple times, I feel like you've done it at least once. Is you sit down with a notepad and... Chris Mendoza walking by. Say, oh, he's so not sick. feeling good. 75 miles left, man. You got it. Mendoza not doing, not feeling great. That'll be it. Some... Just interrupting you for a minute. Uh, Stephanie Bland in the second man. Stephanie Bland, a new name. I, I told every year there's someone that ends up on the podium who we've never up. heard of before. DJ Fox, who's won it two years in a row. <laughs> he was like in his first year. We were like, DJ, who is this David Fox guy? <laughs> he won the race. Stephanie Bland, she may end up on the podium, I, I, but I don't think I've seen her name before. So it's exciting because we always have fresh blood coming. And Chris Roglowski was like that a few years ago. Mm. Katie Knight, she, she was not from the, uh, well, not, not a I mean, athletes example. have to come from somewhere, don't they? Yeah. So, sorry, I interrupted you. What were you saying? So if you've run World's Toughest Butter, or even if you even thought about World's Toughest Butter, maybe you did this, you get out a notepad and you're like, okay, I got 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And actually, I've got 25 and a half hours because of that last lap. That last. So if I want to do 50 miles, how many? That's 10 laps. 25. And so you start doing this math, and you start looking at it, and you're like, Oh man, 50 miles. As long as I just keep walking, I can make 50 miles. 
and it looks like that. If you look at it on paper, it looks like, oh, I can walk and I can make 50 miles, but I promise you, you cannot. And that math is a lie. You're not thinking about pit time. You're not thinking about obstacle completion time. You're not thinking about bathroom time. You're not thinking about eat some food. Like there. I was really unfair about running. Tell me. You don't have to slow down a lot to lose a lot of time, but to make time up is very, very hard. You know, it's like it's like it's like calories. Like, oh yeah. Like oh, I think I'll have one M M&M. and M. Oh, now <laughs> I have to go run for a mile and a half to burn off that M M&M. and M. Yeah, no, I get it. So anyway, when you do the math, like when you plot out your splits and everything, it looks it looks so easy. Fifty miles. That's a. I'm gonna get that my first year without even trying. I cannot tell you how many people I've talked to. I host World Stubbs podcast, and I talk to people in the community all the time. I talk to first timers all the time. And if you have not run World Stubbs Butter, you're thinking about running it this year. I I would not. I'd be shocked if you hadn't had this thought. What I asked them. What's your goal for your first year? If you've had this, it's super common. Don't even worry about it. What's your goal for your first year? Here's what they tell me. I'm gonna my my goal is 50 miles. My stretch goal is 75. I've heard that. If I've heard it once, I've literally heard it a hundred times. I mean, from men, I guess. Lots of women are 50. That's a big goal. No, 75 miles is is a big one for women. 75 is big. Um, Now there's nothing wrong with that goal, and it's super common to have that goal. I think. This is if you have never run World Stubbs Butter. Here's what I think your goal should be for your very first year. I think your goal should be to be on course for 24 hours. Yes. Now, however many miles you get, whether you get 50 miles or whether you get 75 or whether you get 25 miles, if you are on course for 24 hours at your very first World Stubbs Butter, I mean, like, I mean, you're going to be in the pit, obviously, but you're not sleeping. You're not um, sitting at a campfire, or you're not. Um, smoking and joking with your friends. Like, you are you are there to run. You're there to race for 24 hours. I think that is a great, great goal for your first World Stubbs Butter. Now, your second year, let's talk about mileage goals. Like, 50, 70, but whatever you want to do based on how you did that first year. Let's talk about miles the second year. But for your first year, if you're a regular, if you're not, like, Christopher Glossy, she won in her first year, right? Yeah, Most of us aren't going to win World Stubbs Butter our first she's year. She's already had a lot under her belt. Talking of Christopher Glossy, she went through Butterhorn uh, just a few minutes ago. We missed that again, even though we were watching the camera. And here she comes uh, through the finish line. There she is. Well done, Chris. She's just trotting along. Just trotting, like a show pony. She doesn't. She's from Texas. Yeah, she is from Texas. She's from. Uh, I'm going to say it's not sure. She absolutely is from Texas. She's got a little picture break or a video break there. See, I think for me, the hardest thing about doing this event would be going through the night. I'd finish would be my first goal, and running during the night would be another goal. Sure, staying on course overnight is it's not easy. It's absolutely hard. That's I, think, I, I think I could, I think I would be able to do a bit, hit, and then finish, and not get a huge amount of miles, but doing that overnight running is what would You know, we were kind of joking with Giles, but I think it would be interesting to, like, get you on like an infinity during the day and then a toughest which is all night it's just the nighttime it's like just the worst part of world stuff is butter yeah, you, just, you don't have all the hours leading up to it you no. so, so you have like uh, a little head start yeah. but you're doing good let's do it let's let's uh take my tough butter first time in us <laughs> see, see how it goes <laughs> no i think it'd be great and then and then and then next year when we're sitting here talking there here comes uh katie knight running through so K-9 past champion and Trevor Psychos. Also nice and bouncy. Trevor Psychos, how many miles is that for Trevor? It's gone very quiet in the chat. That's his fifth lap for Trevor. Fifth lap for Katie. They came through not at the same time, but they came, I don't know, they came well, they came through the finish two seconds apart. But it was kind of weird. They weren't really running together. No. Like. So there we go. <laughs> so those are definitely two. Yeah, those are definitely two people we'll uh, keep an eye on throughout the uh, the event. Katie Knight and Trevor Psychos. Absolutely. So all these athletes finishing their fifth lap. When you finish your fifth lap at World's Tempest Butter, you mm-hmm. check in with the timing tent. Ooh, yes. Go, go ahead. 
You get a special bib. Is, is it silver? No, no, you get a wristband. Oh, is it a wristband? It used to be a bib, didn't it? The 25, mi- 25 gets you a, a wristband. Oh. That's an obstacle bypass wristband. Oh. Well, where's the silver bib? Silver bib, 75. What bib did you get for 25? You get a big hug Patronized. from Clinton. He's Clinton. Clinton Jackson, yeah. <laughs> so at 25 and every lap after that, you check in with the timing tent immediately after you finish your lap and you get a wristband. So what do these wristbands do? Those wrist they're called an obstacle bypass wristband. They will let you bypass one obstacle on course. Any obstacle. Any obstacle you want. So there's some strategery in the wristbands. So I guess people some people will save them up until overnight or until the morning when they want to do I suppose could you save them up to do like a final sprint lap? Yes. So so one train of thought is I'm gonna save them all, I'm gonna do all the obstacles. And then when it gets to 11 a.m. and I need to finish that last that fast, I'm just going to bam, I'm just gonna bam, run. cash them in, cash them in, cash them in. The other train of thought is which obstacle takes the most time? Not the hardest, necessarily. And can they be used on any obstacle? They can be used on any single obstacle. So one, one wristband gets you past one obstacle. So the athletes, they will time, the elite athletes will time to see which, which obstacles take the most amount of time. Again, not the most difficult. But just which which yes. physically take the most time out of my lap, and they'll use the wrist the, the bypass bands on that. And you will find elite athletes on both sides of that argument. Uh, for have you ever noticed a trend of what is the most successful technique? I have not, but I think as a regular guy doing the course, <laughs> my strategy is to use them on the most difficult obstacle that has the worst penalty. Okay. So that I can bypass the obstacle and skip that penalty. We don't really know what that is yet this year, do we? we? Don't you and I have not been on all the penalties, so. But I know, like, last year, two years ago in Laughlin, Everest had mini mutter as a penalty. So, like, you had to run the mini mutter course, a one mile mini mutter course. Cute. Adorable, but terrible. So. That was one I use it on sometimes. Um, I'm trying to think of the other one I use it on. Because Everest, I can get up it, but man, I don't. I feel bad for the guys that are having to pull me up. <laughs> I mean, that, that's what they're there for. Yeah, but they're volunteers. They're just regular guys like like you and me, just trying to help out. Great shot of going up Butterhorn there. These guys. It's a long, long climb. So we're just having a bit of a problem with the comments on uh, YouTube. So I'm actually just trying to get myself to YouTube to see if people are commenting. So it's like, no one said anything for a long time. So we won't be able to throw comments up for a while until we get Jason back, which I'll come back when he's ready. And uh, but there has been some, there have been a few comments, which is, which is fair. Um, yeah, as Boone said, going back to the 10 mile thing, uh, runners had to do their own food and change of clothes. No pit crews were allowed, so that took time off running laps. Yeah, that's very fair. It was really interesting when pit crews were first introduced in 20, see, 2013 or 2014. It was kind of controversial because mm. the first couple of years, pit crew was not allowed. Mm. And so, that, like that's Amelia, a, that's a, makes it a lot tougher race mentally as yeah, well. And like Amelia, and yeah, you don't have family out there, you don't have friends. And like Amelia said, if you didn't have pit crew, you were at a severe disadvantage. Mm-hmm. So now pretty much everyone has pit crew or some of the, like Trevor doesn't really need pit crew, right? Like Ryan Atkins, when he runs, he doesn't really need a pit crew. Like they, they have everything set out and they're like, I'm going to, I'm going to get this. Um, I'm going to kind of take care of myself, my nutrition. Mm. And uh, Tyler didn't have a pit crew. Tyler, no pit crew. Yeah, just a Barely little anything in his tarp pit. on the ground. Tyler could, like, we brought in more food, and we're sitting in a, in a booth not running for 24 hours. I've probably hours. eaten more than Tyler will eat overnight. In 24 hours? Yeah. <laughs> Which is why he is an elite athlete, and I'm not. I'm not exaggerating when I say athletes like Tyler and Brian Atkins and Trevor Psychos, they literally show up to World Stuff as Butter with a, a box a little bit bigger, like a little plastic bin, like a little bit bigger than a shoe box full of the stuff that they need. They might have one change of shoes. They'll, they'll have like a thin wetsuit and they'll have some water or Pedialyte or Tailwind and they'll have some food. 
and like they literally can carry it one trip from the car without a sweat. Why? Why? My first year World Stop Sputter, I drove from San Diego to Las Vegas in a Lincoln Navigator SUV, and I ah, literally was like squeezing stuff into the eyes. Like, I might need this. Yeah, the worst is I might. And I literally did not I use admire people who can, uh, of it. I admire people that can pack light. Kim and Betty, we're still watching and cheering people on. Thank you very much. I should have noticed earlier there was a bit of a problem there with the um, with the comments, but we'll get those back on the screen when we can once uh, Jason comes back. But I'm watching. I've got it open on the YouTube app on my phone, so we will be able to see uh, what you're talking about there. Okay, Dave, number 3349 is stationed at Mudderhorn 2. Nice. Yeah, those guys at the bottom of Mudderhorn and the bottom of Everest isn't open yet, but bottom of Everest, they were in Dublin Walls earlier. Yeah. Like the elites and the Everest owes them a debt. And they and they get recognized. Like they are beloved by the community, but there's no recognition that's enough for those guys. No. Is Jason running behind Fiore? Joshua Fiore. Putting in miles. Look at him. He's still moving. He's moving well. He's a really nice guy. It doesn't really matter whether an athlete is nice or not. Although, as far as I'm aware, everyone, that, I mean, everyone in the sport of OCR, don't, um, but, but it doesn't matter if an athlete is good. Actually, no, I disagree. I think that's one of the things that makes you like an athlete. Like, tennis, Federer, I like him because he seems like a really good guy. He's also sure. an incredible athlete, but, like, personality goes into it. Pitch is a little bit, uh, isn't the pitch a little bit there? So let's just head back to <coughs> Butterhorn once you can. I mean, we do have the camera in the booth, but the last thing you guys want to see is us. Uh, if we lost all picture, you would have to. And we're constantly trying to find pictures to show you out on the course. So even if it can be a bit glitchy or it's the finish line with not many people coming through, it's probably still more interesting than our idiotic faces. If you're wondering, Fran and I are in a booth about, what do you think, 30 feet from the finish line? Fran? I don't know what that means. Booth? Feet. That's oh, feet. about uh, eight meters <laughs> from the finish line, about 0. 0.002 kilometers. <laughs> Does that help? Sure, sure. Yeah, so it. like, we actually can't see the whole finish line from here. From where I'm, I'm sitting, good at my British maths. The, uh, the, the booth cuts off about half the finish arc, so we're not seeing every, we're not seeing the finish stretch. But we see people as they run through. But it's amazing. Uh, like, literally every single athlete, every single athlete can run past us. And it's, uh, it's like, you and I have literally the best in the place. We really do. Like, can and, you and imagine got... a better place to watch this race from? You can't. You can't. We, this is, this is an honor and a privilege. And we are just excited to be here. But as well as that, we also have a ginormous screen in front of us. With what, like nine cameras going that we can see what's happening on every camera out. And it's course. crazy, but now we have sometimes we have one or two usable shots just because of signal or coverage. Yep. And sometimes we got, you know, seven, but uh, some of the I mean, we've got shots, a couple of usable shots, it's just nothing happening yeah. in them. Uh, Thomas G. Peterson, starting to feel a bit worried about Chris Mendoza. It seems early for someone like him to have such a slow lap. Now he did run past earlier, didn't he? And said he wasn't feeling tip top. He he told he actually slowed down. He like looked at us, we gave him a thumbs up, like hey, good job. And he was he motioned to his stomach and with both of his hands and kind of made like a crinkly fingers over his over his tummy. Like I'm not like feeling a, like good. a kid would do when they're yeah. like, oh my tummy's hurting, mommy. <laughs> and he's like, I am so sick. He said. So we've talked about problem solving. Chris specifically has talked to me about problem solving on course. Mm. So we'll see. Uh, to solve those problems. I hope so. Chris and Trevor Sykos have had epic races before. Back in 2019 in Atlanta, Georgia. Back in 2018 in Georgia. Mm. Jason's still following Josh Fiore there. Oh, coming through. He's coming through there towards the finish, isn't he? He's just going to come around the corner. Yep, we're going to see him Very in a shortly, second. So let's, right past let's put a... Picture, picture of the finish line. Mm -hmm. 
So the sun hot here, like half my body's in the sun. I sprayed myself How so hot much. is it? So hot. Oh, okay. Um, I'm just trying to find you. I'm actually now having to cover my leg with something, so like I'm going to get burned. Like it's, it's tough for those athletes. So 24 Celsius, as we all know, 76 Fahrenheit. Yeah, we all know that. I am here for the diversity. You're here for the 98% of the world that doesn't use uh, <laughs> Fahrenheit. There's a group coming in. Mm. Who are we watching there? Four, five, six, one. Let's have a look. She's running strong, though. Oh, Ginny Overstreet. Oh, nice. Yeah, four, five, six, one is not her number because that's Ian Cask. <laughs> Ginny ran 85 miles last year, finished in third place. She's heading towards the... Right now, she is as well. in, She's not in the top five right now. Can we have a quick look at the... Well, we should be getting um, Joshua Fury coming through any moment, wouldn't we? Unless, just, uh, unless uh, Jason left him elsewhere and that was someone else. We'll give it a few minutes, and then we'll look at the top 10 men, top 10 women. Sounds good. So maybe you're thinking about coming out here, but you're like, I don't want to run, but I'd like to help. <laughs> can I do pit crew? You 100% can do pit crew. You can find a friend of yours that's running, be their pit crew. You can help with what's called the orphan tent. Mm, the orphan tent's super cool. The orphan tent is a community-led uh, project led by Tracy Watson, mm -hmm. call her the pit mama, for people, for athletes that don't have a pit crew, they can sign up and they pay uh, they up to be part of the orphan tent and they'll get, the orphan tent will provide them food, provide them water. I think it costs, There's Hannah. I'm not sure what the cost is, there's a little cost. Is there a cost? Um, I mean, there should be. Well, it's, I think it's voluntary, but, but they'll give you food, they'll give you water, they'll give you nutrition, they'll give you support. Tracy Watson to scream at you to get back on course. Um, everyone in the, in the orphan tent, they can wear a special little thing on their bibs. They're identifiable. And, oh, uh, Michael Scott, Scott's just gone through. Fifth miles. Did, did, did he go in and move into first? Yep. I was just about to say, we've got all top five men and top five women at 25 miles currently. And just as I said Michael that, Michael Scott moves into first place. 4.33 p.m. Make a note of it. Joshua Fiore is still in second. I say still in second, now in second. It's being passed. We're looking to see. There he is. Smiling. He is. You can see by the background, he's coming in close to the finish line uh -huh. here in a second. He's already got gloves on. Look at that. Gloves serve a couple purposes. One primary is warm, which is not an issue right now. But also it prevents your hands from getting beat up or shot, cut up on obstacles, on ropes. I There's always a lot of discussion about gloves, should gloves be used, but I think an event like this is so different from doing a sprint or something like that. Yeah, it, if you Google, like, what are the best gloves for OCR, the answer is none. Yeah. World Stuff is better, so a little bit of a different animal just because you're... As you there he goes. Woo-hoo! You know, one of the best gloves that I used for doing an obstacle course race was um, the woolen horse riding gloves that have little rubber dots on them. They're oh, woolen, sure. so they keep warm. So you say gardening or horse riding? Horse riding. Okay. That you know, that that knitted gloves like regular gloves but with little dots on sure. yeah so generally you though if you're if you're on any obstacle horse race and you're like oh what kind of gloves should i get you don't need gloves to do a spartan sprint yeah. you don't need gloves for a regular tough butter but world stuff is butter you should bring some some light some thin gloves at least for overnight um, I've seen people run in neoprene, like scuba diving gloves. Mm. That's probably overkill, but if you need it, if you're if it I mean, you... for me, I probably would need it. Yeah. Like, my hands would get so cold that I wouldn't be able to use them. Um, but yeah, because you're using your hands on obstacles. 24 hours, they're going to get beat up. It's a different beast. you got to get through it. Yeah. 
Should we have a quick look at the top men, top 10 men and the top 10 women? We just had Josh Fiore come through. It's just about a minute, 10 seconds behind Michael Schott. So uh, the lap before, Michael Schott was three seconds behind him. He's... So it doesn't look like they're running with each other. No, I don't think they were. James Burton in the lead, a big group of men at 25 miles. Seventh, third through tenth place, all at 25 miles. Mm -hmm. Uh, still no Trevor Cycles on that list, but we're not concerned. Four and a half hours into the race. Yeah, Sean of... says, I'm learning a lot today. Good. And ask any more questions that you have, because there's, there's always a good question. Yeah. Well, that's very kind. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the kind words. We'd love to educate you as well as bring you the... Uh, Bring you these single oh, and here's, here's somebody OCR. educating us. Hey, I know a couple of times Stephanie Bland was mentioned as an unknown, so went and looked her up for just a minute. Toughest pit, I guess it means Pittsburgh. Sure. Uh, winner, eleven hundred milers with some podiums and at least one win. Stephanie Bland, we apologize for any disrespect. Like, love to love to learn more. Thank you for that uh, information. Good stuff. <laughs> Wouldn't it be a shocker if a day in podiumed another OCR champion, eh? Oh, and it just especially considering how small like the European countries are small. You get a lot of good athletes to reach to them. And Lee wouldn't be the first athlete to be sick uh, at WTM happened to the mighty Alban in twenty seventeen. Yeah, John Alban got sick. He was running with Ryan Atkins, part of a team. Top ten women. So look at all those women, women with twenty five miles, miles. Four hours into the race, four and a half hours. First through eighth place already have 25 miles. We're going to see some big numbers here, Frank Girando. Um, we are. It's early to say. We're only four hours in. We all know when the race begins. Um, and maybe I'm going to wait. Maybe I'll wait till six o'clock before I start making proclamations. 25% into the race. I would really like to know what mileage we were looking at as it went dark last year. Last the year? Athletes. It's not information we're really going to be able to find out, is it? Yeah, I don't have I don't have those. But look at all of these. Callie with twenty five, Stephanie Bland, Thomas Mutter, Pittsburgh winner, Christian Blosky, world reigning champion, Katie Knight, twenty twenty one champion. Nikki Katie Cor only a minute behind, Chris. Duh. Yeah. Judy Overstreet podium last year. Hannah Carter, fifth place two years ago, fourth place last year. I feel like Hannah Carter, there's only three spots on the podium. I don't know where all these girls are going to go. <laughs> like, they're, look at this is a a murderer's row of women World Seven Mother athletes. Really? It's a pretty stacked field, isn't it? Like, when I can't remember who it was we were talking to earlier, and they just kept listing athlete after athlete. And I was like, yeah, it is kind of anyone's game. Yeah. And it is still at this point. Anyone's game. Oh, literally any one of these women. Marlene Waldman in tenth place has absolutely has a chance to, to win the whole thing. So, uh, so Brenda's asking, show the Matterhorn, the Mudderhorn camera. Uh, Jason is now back with us, so we only have a. Uh, that is the view we have of Mudderhorn right now. We are going to move the cameras around the course during the night. That poor guy did, did not realize his bottom was going to be broadcast world ride right now. So, thank you guys for sticking with us when we didn't have you. Tim Rivetti. <laughs> Still watching and cheering people on. We appreciate Tim, that. we're going to see you at 3 in the morning, right? 24 hours. Let's do it. Do you think we should get an award for who stays the longest? Oh, absolutely. If you watch all 24 hours, you get an OCR report goodie bag. A sticker. A sticker. I need a sticker. Let's see what we can do. Switching back to the finish because if you there wasn't great. We are kind of getting to the time 
and when what will start to open their eyes. And and Carol and Clifford, yay! Let's pull her up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good idea. People running through waving at us as they go past and there's quite a few grimaces, aren't there? Like, uh, I'm so happy. They were four hours ago. Or as they will be in like 12 hours or no more. There is not an event, OCR or not, like this in the world. It's, it just, it's the single greatest 24 hour event in sport. I mean, there are, you know, distance events. 100%. You know that there are multiple day um, there are endurance races, events. 24 hour races. But there's something, yeah, there are. The Le Mans 24, seven, uh, 24 hours. It's a really, really good race, actually. I like a lot. Um, would you rather be there or would you rather be here? Not even a doubt to me. I'm not a, I like car racing when it's live, not so much. Um, it's Jason heading out to uh, find, uh, change the motorhome camera so we'll see which whilst he goes. Just trying to bring up Anne, but not getting it. A lot of athletes coming through, finishing their 25th mile in those obstacle bypass race bands. So, yeah, there are a lot of long races. There goes Tyler Beerman. Tyler but Beerman. It's laps. Uh, Tyler Beerman looks strong. He's just around 25 miles. He looks like he's run 25 feet. He's strong. I think the for about a mile and a half. That's the best uh, attitude I've seen on, on an elite today. He was like, yeah, he's a Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, I'm feeling good about my pace. I mean, he's like, he's got plenty of time to make it. What's yeah. Up? I'm trying to get, get on. Um, Samantha Thompson, love to hear it. Hey, let me give a plug. If you enjoy live coverage, live OCR live streaming, check out our Patreon page. Uh, Patreon.com slash the OCR report. For less than five bucks a month, you can support sport you love. We, uh, we do this on listener, on, on viewer support. We'd love to have you uh, on board as part of our Patreon team. Become a member of the OCR board today. Mm. Don't tempt some of us. We are competitive. Lots of crazy stuff for a stick. Owls, you watch 24 hours. Shoot me a message on our Instagram. We'll get you a sticker. Hope you're prepared. Shipping costs the UK. I'm booked off work and into the next 25.5 hours with you guys. Hope you're prepared for shipping too. costs to the UK. You know what? Now, Simon, I'm going to give it to Fran. And... Uh, you need to find Fran over in Manchester, and she'll uh, she'll have your sticker for you. Oh, she's like everything's good. Okay, so we're starting this late. We're starting at 4:44. If you watch all 24 hours of the live stream, you will get an OCR report sticker. But that means you started at noon with us. And that means you're watching till 1.30 p.m. tomorrow or 12.30 p.m. tomorrow with Daylight Savings. We're watching 24 hours, no breaking coverage. We are How am I going to verify it? Someone asked in the booth. Great question. Well, we trust people, and it's a sticker. First of all, we trust you. Second of all, it's a sticker. So if you're going to lie to me for a sticker, that's on you. Santa that's a you no. problem. Not a problem. I'll send you a sticker. So but you better be, watch all 24 hours. It's not going to be a breaking but the coverage is split up into the different... That's a great point, Fran. So here's here's the only exception. We're going to switch coverage a few times. YouTube has an eight-hour live stream limit. So we're going to have to switch a couple times to go from you know the first eight-hour section to the second eight-hour section. Um, our, our crack production staff has that all taken care of. I think we need to uh, provide stickers as a Patreon gift because people are going crazy. Rosalinda Lira. What, Ooh, what stickers? All right, here's the deal. Bring some other viewers, too. They can jump in. You, if, if you vouch for them, Rosalinda, you can bring in other viewers, too. I'll send out stickers. I'll buy, I'll, shoot, I'll send stickers out all over the world. I don't care. I got stickers. For, you want stickers? I, I don't know why I love this shot of Mutterhorn. It's, it's so epic looking. Look at that. It's from the back side. Man, it looks good. Look at that. I wish I, I should have told Jason while he was here. You see Jason 
can go in back and go there on the left side. Jason's our producer. He's also positioning our cameras. Tell these elite athletes, go down, face out, and you will be like 30 seconds to two minutes faster, depending on how slow you are. I haven't seen a single person go. Clearly, I need more episodes of the podcast to tell people this because we've got to get them, get them down faster. Carlo Piscatello in the booth here with me doesn't seem to agree. You do? About what? Going down, mutter horn, face first. Oh, 100%. It's scarier, for sure. 100% scarier. Glenn Almost, Rosalina. Oh, question about, I didn't see Rosalina. I did not see your question. The, the, this Glenn's right there, podiums, uh, prizes. 5,000, 2,500 cash prizes for first, second, and third for the individuals. The team races, team racers do not receive cash prizes. Good team as well, right? We've not checked in with them for a while. Yeah, let's check out our teams again. Oh, D-Fit Black, 25 miles. I feel like they were on 25 miles the last time we checked. Crazian Divas, 25. Cristelli Fitness, 25. Maximum effort. Make it ache. I already do. So the teams, the teams have another one little rule that the individuals do not. Is that I, I told we already talked about how teams have to run the first, the entire team has to run the first lap and the last lap together. And then the teams have to have half their team for every lap with a minimum of two people. But also they have to run the entire time. So when you cross, when one member of the team crosses the timing mat, the other member has to cross within something like 10 seconds. Like it's very, very short. Like they have to. That's the idea of a team, right? Exactly. So I used to run with my team, Team Bat Boys. We talked about a little bit earlier. Yeah, that Bat Boys. And we would cross, someone would cross, sometimes you wouldn't see the timing mat coming. Especially the first few laps before you yeah. kind of know where they are every lap. And so you just start running. At, I think if someone trail, is trailing back 10 feet or 20 feet, you're like, come on, come on, come on, come on. We're going to get DQ'd. We never had a problem, but just another thing for the teams to Oh, think Isaac about. Sanderson just passed the finish line. He's got 30 miles. James Burst dropping down into fifth place there. So the, let's have a look at the top five men right now. Michael Short, Joshua Fiore, Tyler Veerman, Isaac Sanderson, and James Burton. But we don't know what's going on, of course. In fact, do you know what? If we look at the live results as they go, we can see. Um, James Burton was last seen at Spunky Monkey at 440. Anthony Brown Johnson was also seen at Spunky Monkey at 440. 20 seconds between James Burton and Christian Brown Johnson. That's monkey monkey. And that's kind of the bottom. Oh no, Austin, bottom half of our podium. Austin there. Azar was seen at Spunky Monkey lap six, which is the lap the others are on at four forty and twenty four. So that's James Brown, Austin Azar, and Christian Brown Johnson. Oh, they're close together, those guys. Another shot of Mutterhorn there. So obstacle to show. So we got ten minutes till night ops begins at five PM local time, five hours into the race. So that means any lap you start after five PM you have to be set up for night ops, but if you're on the course Exactly. Okay. So if they did not want to have their head headlamp on, they can do it in the next. If they get out on, if they cross the start line in the next ten minutes, they're uh, they're okay. And you might say like, oh man, it's daylight. It's still blue skies. I see the blue skies out there. Why are they making more headlamps? It's not because of right now. It's because it happens it, soon, and, be, and laps can take a long time. Exactly. It'll be dark before they finish that lap. They want the the powers that be want the. Uh, Want the headlamps on it for earlier. So that was just a comment there that I threw up. Let's, let's put it up again. Uh, let's stay up all night. Great coverage. We will be up all night with you. Could you give a shout out to Matthew Ritchie, please? His family is watching from Wallaceburg, Ontario. Ontario. Shout out to the Ritchie family. So I have been trying to pull up some results to show the individual stats we had earlier. I've had a few problems with that. So when Jason comes back again, I'll check that with him again. 
when uh when we can get that done i will get that um and get, Kim, get your whole family on youtube and have every one of them like our video and hit smash that subscribe button as they say love to have you on board for 24 hours so when i do this race next year i'm gonna have to figure out how to run and watch you guys uh, uh rosalinda you, guys. you are too kind um, you know, we would love to uh, to see more people out here next year. Every year, it's amazing. We'll be here next year as well. Um, and yeah, Rosalinda, let me know. Austin have you ever all run coming through. World's toughest mutter, or an obstacle course race like this. All ah, Austin Azar and Christian Brown Thompson, kind of that top ten. Was that CBJ that just top uh, just changed very quickly. They came through a second. Here comes our barefoot one. Just gonna... Raymond Vincent, the barefoot runner. So our men's top 10, Michael Schott, keeping that first place, right above Joshua Fiore. Have six men at 30 miles so far. Pretty good. Okay, so so we haven't talked about this yet, friend. The rule of thumb for figuring out how many miles you're going to run. Are those James Burton passing? When when you when it is 10 p.m., that is 50 percent of the miles you can expect to run over 24 hours. So at the 10 hour mark, whatever your mileage is at the 10 hour mark, you, you can it. expect if you double that amount, that's what you can expect to get. So, we, so st we've still got five hours until now. Yes. These athletes are flying. So I, we expect them to slow down, obviously. More obstacles are going to open up. A few minutes up. each lap. They're going to get tired. They're going to get cold. You know, it's very, very rare do you see reverse splits at World's Toughest Mudder, where uh, times are faster the, the longer the race goes. We did see last year Chris got quite quite slow. She slowed down significantly during the you know, period. And it was at that point we got worried she wasn't going to make 100 miles because we were really hoping it. And then she sped up again and she got faster. But so we're halfway to that 10 o'clock mark. Yes. So we're going to see, like, we're, they're putting up miles so far. And that 50% that rule is, is the 10 o'clock 50% rule. It's not, it's not a law, it's not hard and fast, but it's something that it's, it's definitely a rule of thumb that we watch. So. Oh. For the regular folks watching, if you're going to run World Service next year, you think, okay, I want to run 50 miles. How do I pace myself? Mm. Well, the first, pay, the first, the biggest mile marker I can put out there for you is you want 25 by 10 p.m. Okay. If you are going to slow down overnight, 2 a.m. is tough, 3 a.m. is tough, 4 a.m. is tough. That's if you can go all night. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, if you want 50 miles your first year, you're going to have to go out. Valid. I don't, I don't encourage anyone to sleep at World. You can sleep on Sunday. You can sleep on Monday. It's hard. It is so hard to go back out for another lap. Um, I would say it's almost impossible if you have. I mean, people do it. People do it every year. I don't think I could do it to, to like take off my shoes, take off your like. No, it's once I'm done, I am done. Yeah, like, you don't want to stop anything. Yeah, I, I highly. If you want 50 miles, you got to get 50 miles. It's funny that that's the goal that people go for for their first one, but the bibs is the bib 55 miles. No, no, the bibs too. Actually, once you've earned your first brown bib, the goal for the next year, a lot of times, people say, I want a dirty brown bib. Because you get your brown bib once you finish that 50 miles. So a dirty brown bib is five miles. You wore that bib on oh, a lap. Like like so you that. come, you, you go home with a dirty brown bib. Everything is getting so dusty here. <laughs> you know what? That's that's kind of if I had to describe the weather here, it's it's dusty. It's hot and dusty. Can I get a shout out for Luna, the Malibu in UK watching? She's zoned out on the YouTube channel right now. Hi. Hi, Luna. Luna the Malibu. Who is it, good girl, Luna? Luna. <laughs> Luna. Luna. Luna, you want a treat? 
Luna, you want to walk? <laughs> you're trying to you're, you're trying to jeopardize people's <laughs> chances of winning a stick of hair, aren't you? I don't think so. Simon's staying with us. Go, Matthew Babe three six four four. We're all proud of you, and we'll be watching the entire night. Matt, good luck. We will. Someone asked, yeah. So, um. Vincent, what's that? I keep forgetting. Raymond Vincent. I'm not sure whether it's Vincent Raymond or Raymond Vincent. A running Run, barefoot. barefoot runner, yeah. Every time he comes through, to great celebrations. He did it last year and got a really good amount of miles. Running barefoot. It's, you know, like, it's a thing. People do it. Not me. <laughs> I get so nervous every time a uh, foot gets close to the camera. I guess that's the static camera on Mudderhorn. Who's the lucky one who keeps climbing to fix it? That is Jason, the producer. Jason Dupree, exactly in here right now. Jason's our producer slash rabbit slash uh, general all round climber. guy. He's uh, our producer. He's he's in and out of the tent. He's on all over the courts all night long, and uh, he's he's keeping track of his mileage on a Garmin. And what's now, he done so far, Jason? So far, he's got twelve coros. Not a Garmin. Oh, excuse Coros. me. Not a, not a Garmin. That's a Coros. I've done the 12.58 miles. He's done two and a half laps just uh, going back and forth on the course. You got a you got a Coros on you, Dustin? Apple Watch. Apple Watch? Ten, Ten miles so far? Fred, how many miles you logged so far today? Ooh, I have done a total of 1.70 kilometers. I don't have that. That's not a mile. It's in, not in even a mile. Huh? I walked from the Airbnb to the car. Yep. And then from the car to the booth here. So yep. I've done about and, um, 500 feet. Parked behind the booth. So. Maybe we'll get the prize for lowest mileage. We'll from our team, definitely. But I mean, we're standing up more than we did last year. That's good. Somebody commented that it seems like a fast course this year. You know what? It does seem like a fast course. And I think there's a couple factors. One is it's low elevation. Mm -hmm. Two is it's firmly packed. Last year, or in past year, I don't know if last year is a good example, but in past years there's been like sand or um, not like if, if it's hard packed, um, you're you're able to get more miles. Like you're able to transfer that energy from your body to the ground. You're able to do more miles. Um, Sarah Fox crushing it. Shout out to Sarah. Um, factor is. It seems like, and I'd have to, to verify this, but it seems like more obstacles are open later. It feels like the obstacles are open later. Now, there have been years in the past when everything opened at once. I kind of feel like last year we had more obstacles to talk about at this point. Yeah, we're five hours in, and we still have, you know, half, well, we have one, two, three, three more obstacles. Oh, toes, ooh, about to open the in just a minute. The grappler and trench press are about to open in literally one minute. So when those three obstacles open, they'll have... That'll be half the obstacles are open. They're just over half. Smoky Monkey and Everest open at six. Oh, Barrel chest in Augustus Loop at seven. How the obstacles are, because it feels like last year some of them were a bit nastier than they are this year. I, you know what? I feel like the Devil's Beard one was nastier last year for sure. Um, Ladder to Hell was about the same. Did we have Ladder to Hell last year? Might not have. Yes. Butter we did, because uh, I remember going up and over it. Um, but a slide, which, whilst being faster as a slide, got you colder because it was wet, and also if you're scared of heights, it slowed you down, I guess. Yeah. I think, so there was, so two years ago was the record for most 100 milers ever in a event. We had six six athletes around 100 miles two years ago. Last year was the second most. We had five athletes, including Chris, for last year, the women, run um, 100 miles. And but so the, I still want to point out that last year the difference between the women's most miles and the men's most miles was very small. Sure. So let's just say, I mean, like if we had four men run 100 last year. Uh -huh. We had six men run 100 two years ago. Uh -huh. So give or take one Chris Roglowski, it was still a almost record year last year. Right? You, you can look at the uh, at the stats. Yeah, well, 2022 was 105, 105, 100, 100, 100. And 21 for the men, 115, 110, 105, 100, 100. So there were more miles done. There were, there's... If you 
if you look at those... Uh, last six, year, there were six men who got over 100 miles and above, and last year, it's five men who got 100 miles and above. You're right, five plus Chris. There were six last year. Oh, yeah. Six, just Chris took place of a gentleman. Man, but you, there was more combined miles in 21 than last year. Of those, of those 100 milers, yeah. You know, going down to like 10th place, 10th place in 2022 was 90 miles. 10th place in 2021 was 80, 85 miles. 10th place in 2019 is 80 miles. And that's, that's you, you keep looking back years over years. Basically, 10th place is about 80 miles. Mm, you're right. That's how fast 75 to 80. Well, apart from 2011. Maybe 85. Yeah, 2011. Totally different, yeah. yeah throw that one out. Um, if you look at those numbers, though, for 2011, I'm looking at the top six men for 2011. Mark Battress, 115. Trevor Psychos, 110. DJ Fox, 105. These are all names we know. Javier Escobar, who was in here earlier, 100 miles. Christian Brown Johnson, who we're watching today, fifth place. Fifth place, 100 miles. That's crazy, isn't it? You ran 100 miles. You weren't even close to the podium. And then it comes down to how fast you're doing those 100 miles. Sixth place, 100 miles. Ian Caskey. Ian Caskey is the Eugene Cernan of World's Toughest Mudder. Caskey ran 100 miles and finished in sixth place. Eugene Cernan was the last man to walk on the moon in 1972. You heard Eugene Cernan's name before? Didn't learn about you, you know Neil Armstrong, you know Buzz Aldrin. Dude walked on the moon. It's the first time you've ever heard his name. Ian Caskey, I remember you. Six, 100 miles, sixth place two years ago. All right, clock, we've got new obstacles open. Woo woo, what opens now? We've got Twinkle Toes. Mm -hmm. We've got, which is a balance beam type obstacle we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. We've got the grappler, 5 p.m. That's the throwing the ball on the rope, yeah. kind of hoisting yourself up. Trench press. We can talk about the individual. You know, before we talk about it, let's talk about these obstacles in a minute, though. Let's look at the results one more time because we're halfway to that 10 o'clock point. So, like, just, to, just to review, whatever your mileage is, at, at 10 p.m., you can expect twice that. that you can expect that to be 50% of your total. So we're at five hours in, which is 10 p.m. Do you have the math for that? So I don't have, I mean, we, you know, there's not a number. Like, you can keep having it, right? Like, what about 2.30? Oh, what yeah. about at 1.15? We could keep going back. And eventually, like, you're going to, so even now, this is probably too early to extrapolate. But if Michael shot at 30 miles right now, after five hours. Well, actually, that's at four hours 33. That's true. That's true. So, Elmer King at five, uh, 30 every, miles at 5.01. Every single one of our top 10 men right now, Michael shot through Scotty Campbell. Scotty Campbell uh, making you know his what? first debut. Let's make a note of a man and a woman as they get what they're getting at five hours in. So, Elmer, Elmer King, oh, he's taking a picture with his camera. I'm getting my. Uh... Oh, wait, at the time, 5.04. Okay, so. Every single one of our top men, you can see, you guys can see this as well as we can. Michael Schott, Joshua Fiore, all the way down, Elmer King, Scotty Campbell, top 10. They've all run 30 miles in five hours and two minutes or less. Does that mean they are going to have 60 miles at 10 I would say 55. I'd say that's, that's fair, 55. And if that's true, if, if, if guys can have 55, say nine of these guys have 55 miles at 10 p.m., can we say... Eight of them will have 110 miles. Seven of them. Seven of them. Six of them. So we could have multiple. Again, way too early. We are to be massively doing this. speculating here, and it's great fun. We could have half a dozen people run 110 miles. Mm -hmm. Now, I know, way too early. Way too early to even say that. And this is just like. Because well, of course, when does the race start? The race starts at midnight. It does. So, ding, so, ding, for whoever, like Kim, keep a dragon that for us. <laughs> so we've not had any women kind of hit the five-hour marker here. What? Because we've not had the women come okay. through. I want to talk about the women. I'm going to take a picture. Of, I'm going to screenshot this so that we can talk about ten hours or five hours from now. I like but that. But just, just to, to, to wrap up the men before we yeah, – yeah. 110 miles, just so you know – Ryan Atkins ran 110 miles in 2017. That was the first time 110 had ever been run in 2017. Mm -hmm. Other than Ryan Atkins in 2017, 
the only other time 110 has been broken was 2021. Mark Battress ran 115, and Trevor Cycles ran 110. Uh, DJ Fox has run 105 twice. The guys running today, no one has run more than 100. The only, uh, the only people that ever run more than 100, DJ Fox 105, Mark Adette 105, Mark Battress 115, Trevor Psychos 110, DJ Fox again 105, these are all fills 2021. Robert Killian, oh, I take that back. Robert Killian ran 105, he's not running today. Ryan Atkins ran 110. But Trevor Psychos has run 105 twice. How does it compare to 2021 with 115? Laughlin, Nevada. Laughlin, Nevada was my 50 mile course. So, so are you podiumed? Uh, no, my podium. Thank you for asking. Thank you for bringing that up. That's no great. Problem. My podium was in 2018 in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, um, you're back. We do the gather sometimes. And I've never Shout out met. to Miranda. Never actually met her, but seen her on screen a lot. Nice lady. You have to catch her next time she comes through. Absolutely. Miranda well. Huber is Fran's broadcast partner for she is. Uh, some of our other races here on the OCR board. So, yes, uh, your podium and 2021. So, my podium, 2018. Brilliant of you to bring that up, uh, but no, 2021 was my was was Laughlin most recent year I ran, and so the Laughlin course. The one thing that sticks out about that course versus this course, the first mile and a half was very sandy. And right. Run, I don't know if you ever run in sand. It's awful. It's the worst. So they difficult. They say soft sand makes hard men. It's, soft it's sand. Very very difficult to run in, and that's. And I was telling you, um, plans all year long. Like I'm going to run 50 miles. And then 15 minutes into the race, I'm like, guess not. Yeah. It's because of that sand. I could not run in that sand. Now, it worked out, and we got that 50 mile done. But it was a it was a tough, tough, tough race. Yeah, the first time that Spartan uh, had the World Championships in Abu Dhabi, and I was looking at people's kit, because I, I like the desert. I've been to the desert a few sure. times. You've really got to wear the right shoes to be in sand. And there were people running without gaiters. I just think you'd be better in boots than running on trainers like aces. And they paid for like their feet were ripped to shreds afterwards. Sand yeah. is really cool. Sand stuff running. So if we get twenty twenty one is the only year we've ever had more than one person hit one ten or more. Twenty twenty one we had Mark Mattress with one fifteen. We had Trevor Psychos with one ten. We've had one ten before with Atkins by himself, one ten in twenty seventeen. But just to reiterate, we've had three people in the history of World Stubbs Mutter run 110 or more. And I know it's 5 p.m. on day one of 24 hours. We're, we're five hours in to the I'm, I'm going to get, I'm I know gonna get my camera out and record early. you so we can play it later. Will, talk to me about what's going to happen. It is far hours. too early. We're five hours into a 24 hour race, 25 and a half hour race. It's far too early to even speculate. But there is a better than a much greater than zero chance that we have multiple five, four or five, six, 110 mile runners, finishers at World's Toughest Mudder 2023. Again, far too early to speculate. I'm just throwing it out there, it's possible. We told you last year, we were watching Chris Ruklaski all year, all, all day, all night long. We're like, can Chris make, okay. I wanna come back, we're gonna come back to Chris Ruklaski in a minute. Let's talk about the women. We're looking at the women's top 10 results now. Callie Schweikart in first place with 30 miles at five hours and eight minutes. Um, Callie, when we were talking with Callie before the race, you and I were talking with her, she was one of the few people, her goal was not mileage base. She said she, her goal is position base. Yeah. Like she wants to win the race. She doesn't care if it's 90 miles or 110 miles. I mean, I'm sure she does. But she wants to, that's that's her goal is to win the race. Her goal is not to run 100. Her goal is to win, which it's a race. You're going to win. Like It's very, so Callie with 30 miles, just over five hours. Doing that same maths and taking into account all the differences that we have as human beings, could you see her possibly achieving 100 miles? I, I 100% because we just talked about the men I know, and I running be, 110. I I mean, this is the thing. Women are better at endurance, and I have to give that to women. But there's a lot going on here, and women do tend to get fewer miles than men. And and because we've seen, I mean, she's coming in uh, 30 miles at 5.08, which is six minutes slower than Scotty Campbell, who did 30 miles at 5.02. 
So we can be measuring them reasonably similarly, but the, uh, you know, let's be fair. Okay, so let me tell you what's different this year for the women versus in past years. Yeah. Last year, Krista Glotsky ran 100 miles. Ran 100 miles. No woman's ever run more than 90. Krista Glotsky permanently raised the bar for women at World's Time Mutter. Yeah. From last year, we're really starting this year, going forward every 100 miles is in the conversation. Now, we always talked about it like, we know it's possible. Is this the the year? That's, that conversation is over. Like, the conversation is how many? So, and... Well, how far now? So, we, we talked about before the 125-mile bib. There's a bib for 125 miles at World Stuff's Mother. Somebody asked earlier, does 125 miles still win you, like, entry for life or something? It used to. I don't know. But they, I mean, they bring they that... Could. I'd say let's, let's get someone to 120 first, right? We'll talk about it. But they bring out this 125-mile bib every year. No one's ever got The closest we've had is 15, right? And when the year he the year Mark Rapp just ran 115, I said, for a man to run 125, it's going to take three things. It's going to take perfect course. It's going to take perfect weather. And it's going to take two men that are like 120 plus, right? Because why would you run 125 if second place man is running 105? To be the first person to do it. Absolutely. To be that first person to do it. But man, you need someone on your tail. Put even even the most motivated guy, it'll help them to have someone else ride on their tail, Absolutely. right? So maybe there's two people that run 125 that first year. Whenever I think with Callie Schweikart, and again, five hours into the race, people are at home are gonna be yelling at me. It's fine. It's way too early to talk about this. The race begins at midnight. 100. The race begins at midnight. We're five hours in. At the 10 hour point, point you double those miles. That's what someone should. And it's reasonable. It's not like an uncrate 10 hours into a 25 hour and a half race, 25 and a half hour race. It's not crazy to think about. So if Callie were to double her mileage, and we could really talk about this for second through ninth place, all these women have 25 miles at the five hour mark. Again, it's going to get cold. More obstacles are going to open. People are going to slow down 100%. But let's just say Callie and maybe through... Okay, so I was going to say Callie through Robin, but then Jenny Overstreet, she's going to be up in this mm-hmm. top group. Hannah Carter is going to be in this top, up in this top group. Let's just say first through eighth place has... Looking so at, out of interest, this is uh, Callie's lap times. Lap number five was 58.53, lap number six, 57.41. So she went a bit faster. She's, she's reversing her splits? I she's mean, she she's getting it. faster? She, she got faster. The last lap was a minute faster. That's impressive. Now's the time to book some. And then we just had. Was that Stephanie Bland come through? Yep. Stephanie Bland with 30 miles now. So let's just say, again, I'm waving a magic wand that does not exist. Let's just say we have first through eighth place. They all, they all have 50 miles at 10 p.m. Could we have five or six hundred mile women? I think that's crazy. That's too much. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to see Could two. Could we have three, two? I think two is. Callie sensible. and Chris. Katie and Chris. Callie. Oh, uh, but Stephanie's. Oh. Uh, which uh, which woman are you going to say is not going to run a hundred? There's a. Uh, they're all crushing it right now. Uh, One through nine. Even I, ten, like I don't, I don't want, want to throw pick, anyone out. No, no. I, do you know what? Right now, I don't want to pick names. Right. It's just, it's just probability and likelihood. Sure. Let's just say numbers then. Let's just say two. like two are these, are these top eight. You think two? I'm going to say two women could okay. get a hundred today. Two women will get a hundred. Uh-huh. So your, what was your prediction on the man? On the what? Well, okay, uh, it's not a prediction. Yeah, it's I'm possible. saying two women get one hundred. My job isn't to predict. My job is to tell you what's possible. I'm like a weatherman. This is what's possible. I think it's possible we have multiple 110 mile men. We've only had two, uh, three ever. How many? Give me a number. I'll say, I'll go out. I'll say four. I think four men. I think you could run. Okay. I think someone's going to run 110 miles and not be on the podium. Ooh, Way too early to say this. Way too early. It's not even dark. We get so overexcited so quickly. The obstacles aren't even all open. <laughs> what are we talking about? <laughs> Okay, here's what I want to see. I want to see four men with 110. I want to see. I want to see eight men with 100. 
That's what I want to see. You want to see eight men with 100? I'm going to, I'm writing this down. I can't even read your, you should have been a doctor because your writing is illegible. Thank you, thank you very much. I take that as a compliment. Okay. Way too early. To, I, I literally love Ooh, this stuff. Oh, Lee says, I, I'm going to say it. I know it's early, but 125 miles this year. Oh, Lee. I would love it. Lee, Lee, Lee. I would love it, Lee. Oh, I would love it. I'd love to be here just to watch it. Uh, sounds like a weather friendly year. Yes, I mean, but it is breezy. It's still breezy. What is it, like 20 mile an hour? Yep. The and TV so, and screen we have in front of us keeps kind of shaking a bit. It's, so, so how do so we talk, keep talking about the wind? Like, how does that factor into the weather? It's it's a factor kind of correlated with the cold because when you, you wear your wetsuit, if your wetsuit's thick enough, it'll help be a windbreaker. But a thin wetsuit will not break the wind at all. Mm. And so you'll see a lot of people running with like the cheap windbreaker they yeah, got at yeah. Goodwill or they got at Walmart last night. Evan Preparis coming through, crushing it. Uh, Mendoza's been in the pit for an hour. This is where things start changing as well, isn't it? I know he had stomach issues, seems like it's my day, maybe not. Oh, done. that'd be a shame. And, that'll, and that can happen. That's how we'll lose some of my 110 milers. Stomach issues, turned ankle, like Loads of different reasons. Happens. They can where... have it in them, but they're racing. And for athletes like that as well, it's not finish at all costs, is it? That's not their event. It's achieve my goal. Also, or... Chris has run, won this race before. He's run 100 miles before. Some of these guys have never won. Some of these guys have never run 100. Now, if you can't, if your stomach is bad and you can't run, you can't run. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what your goal is. You can't do it. So, um, okay. So let's go back to those women's time again. Let's way too early predictions. All right. So I said two women You're to get 100. Two women hit 100 miles. I'm gonna say four women, 100 miles. And I told you this last year. I believe one of them will be Chris Roblowski. I believe in Chris. I am a Christian. Christina Roblowski. I think she's going to do it. I'm looking at names and I'm like, You made no. some big predictions there. Four men so, get again, it's way too early. These girls, these kids, everyone, they're putting miles fast. Like they are crushing the mileage. So the ninth, tenth place woman has 25 miles at 515. Mm. This is I mean, the top nine women have got 25 miles under five hours. Under five, Significantly right. under five hours. Right. And the reason we're talking about this, if you're just tuning in, if you're if you're trying to do 50 miles at World's Toughest Mudder, you want to have 25 by 10 p.m. The rule of thumb is whatever your goal mileage is, you want 50% of that by 10 p.m. So 10 hours into the 25 and a half hour race. And that's reasonable. It's not... It's, that's a reasonable like mile post on the way to your final goal. I'm gonna say two women get ninety or above as well. So two additional women get ninety. So you kinda of, you're kinda of saying two of my women aren't as fast as I think. Yeah. I think so. Well last year we had hundred miles, eighty five, eighty five and eighty. The year before ninety miles, eighty five, eighty five and eighty. You know? You've gone more with the men, which is good. So with, with Chris breaking the 100 mile marker for the women last year, that's really left the last major barrier. Not not the last, I guess women still do it, but the men breaking 125. So someone's saying, show the people, we can't see races for the leaderboard. There's not much going on out there at the minute that we can show. Let's bring up the finish line for a bit, see the people coming through. Yeah, we got a bit overexcited to talk about um, leaderboards yeah, that's for a me. while. Sorry, guys. That's on me We're too. not here to, to listen to... Will and Fran talk. I know that. I want to see the Razors. Oh, here's a prediction. There will be eight with 100 miles this year's Woo! winner, 120. I think with more obstacles opening later, it allows for more mileage, plus it being uh, warm. It is warm. Yeah. That's, you're not wrong. It's It was like a week ago, I was looking at the weather for here, and it was cold a week ago, like in the 40s overnight. I mean, we're in Texas, so it's generally going to be warmer than, you know, wherever. But it's been trending warmer. Every night has been warmer over the last week. It has been. It is warm. I mean, right now it's you know five thirty, five twenty, and we're in. UA I remember last year there was a bit of drizzle though, stage. wasn't there? Around three or four p.m. Last year got cold fast. Yeah. yeah, I remember shivering before I had a chance to put on clothes. Yeah, I feel like we were wearing our uh, dry robes by now last year. I've, I've even brought a hot water bottle with me this year. Yeah. 
we got that call. Let's do it. She says, sitting in the pit eating snacks. You know, we've been, we've been, we know we're going to talk for 24 hours about this race. And I was kind of concerned that my voice would hold up. And so I was talking to my wife last night. And I was like, is there anything like cup of noodles, but for tea? So I could just like pour hot water in. And, and my wife's like, uh, that's called a tea bag. She's like, ask Fran about it. She's and probably, then, she's and then he did. And I was like, well, I have a kettle, I have tea bags, and I have oat milk, which is good for congestion. I also have fruit tea with sugar. And then we found your little polystyrene cup. And uh, as soon as you want tea, I'm, I'm your gal. So I think we're good. I think we're good for our voices holding out. I was concerned about it. Same here. I've been really, really sick this week. I have dosed myself up on these incredibly powerful American drugs. Apologies if you hear us coughing every now and again. Don't make me laugh. If I laugh, I'm done for. Um, but yeah, we, we'll, we will lose our voices by the end because we always do. But so that's it's, fine. Like, we'll be better than uh, these 700 men and women running the race. <laughs> yeah. So we do have two set of cameras up um, on obstacles that will be opening soon. So soon we'll have a lot more to kind of show you. Um, Uh, so Spunky Monkey at six and Hanging Rough at eight. So we're just chatting with Jason, he's going to go out and uh, refill some batteries in the cameras, move the cameras around a little bit, get one to grappling hook, grappling hook, is that what it's called? And uh, trying to get some more pictures of people racing, I know we've been kind of static finish line for quite a while, or switching between that and Mudderhorn. It's, uh, I mean, five miles doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot to cover athletes. It looks like, in our, in our live feed here, it looks like the sun's setting there in the background. Mm, That's which... actually just the reflection of the sun. The sun is getting lower. Oh yeah, it's still way high, isn't it's it? The, what you see on the screen there is the reflection of the sun on the lake behind those two tents there. The sun is actually in the sky, like above this finish line arch, like above above the arch. Like it's uh, still up in the sky. So that lake there is where Statue of Liberty should have been happening. Yep. Which would have been really nice. Still not sure. Oh, there comes Chris. Chris Rutlowski coming across the finish line Christina again. Christina Rutlowski at 5.24. She's in third place. Oh. I'm going to write still. In Chris, we trust you. She's got uh, plenty of time before the race starts. Oh, really? Yeah. How long? <laughs> It's funny, there's things like that, that that saying, the race starts at midnight, that everyone, and not everyone, almost everyone at World Stavis Motor knows. I'm trying to think of some other sayings like that. The 50% rule at 10 o'clock is pretty well known. Um, another, another rule of thumb everyone talks about is you push your wetsuit on before you get cold. Yeah. Uh, like the headlamp. You put the headlamp on before it gets dark, because once you need it, you need it. It's going to be hard to measure when that time is, though. I mean, I guess I would want to be wearing a wetsuit before it was dark. You're right. It's going to be tricky this year because if you were if you would start right now, I don't know if you would want 
Well, if I was starting the lap right now, that would take me two hours. So I would be putting a wetsuit on. Or at least I'd be wearing compression gear and probably a windbreaker. Across the finish line there was that. women 30 miles so far i think you should bookmark those pictures you took sure. make a little file for next year oh yeah so good. then we could know what was happening at this point in the race last year yeah you know, you know what we'll make note of it at five o'clock we'll do it at ten o'clock do it at midnight when the race starts when the race starts <laughs> and then uh maybe maybe 4 a.m six that you're near. <clears throat> Rosalind, I saw your comment. It feels good now. Us Texans were saying we're not going to complain about this year's cold weather. It was a hot summer. Rosalinda, if you're in Texas, you should be here. Is she saying this is cold weather? This is summer for right Texas. now. This and this is, is this is the heights of summer this in the is a UK. Cool evening. Cool summer evening here. I think it's probably about three degrees at home. So it's 74 here in Granbury, Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. which is 23. Uh, what, 22, 23 Celsius. That's nice it's in London and raining. So a lot colder than it's here. Huh? So it's like, I'd say they should, like, do a, they should do a British world's toughest. British, well, we have toughest mother. We do, we do. We have Europe, Europe's toughest mother. I went to Toughest Mudder Berlin in, I think, 2018, and uh, it was great. I enjoyed it. They uh, they don't call them Berlin Walls over there, because Germans don't really joke around, joke about the Berlin Wall. They just call it Hero Walls. Also, no national anthem. It's more of a U.S. thing. That is a very U.S. thing. Do the national anthem at events? UK doesn't play a lot of God Save the King, huh? No, not really. Saw it last year for the Trifecta weekend, people doing it. It was the first time I died. It was a bit weird, but that was a whole big, like, every country got their anthem with their flags. Every country got the, You know, like at the Olympics, when there's medal ceremonies, everyone plays the national anthem. Like, that's a thing. And that's not a US thing. That's an IOC thing. Yeah, they're great. But yeah, no, we don't. We don't do. Um, okay, tonight just crossed the finish line there. Now it's Katie through. Knight, fourth place, thirty miles. Last year she was she was pretty close to Chris, wasn't she? Yeah. Throughout the, and, throughout the race. And we talk about it. The race starting at midnight. It's not. We say it, and it becomes a joke because we say it so much. But like all these women right now, all with thirty miles, top four women: Kelly Schweikart, Stephanie Bland, Chris Roglowski, Katie Knight, top four women. And then the next four or five with 25 miles. Mm -hmm. They're all just kind of keeping pace. They all just want to be within fighting distance of each other. So that at midnight, when it rolls around, they can say like, okay, how far behind am I? How far ahead am I? How much faster are her laps than mine? Or how much faster are my laps? What do I need to do the next two laps to move myself into a better position? Do you think Chris pays any attention to what other people are doing? Do I think Chris pays any attention to what the other athletes are doing? You know, if you asked me last year, I would have said no. She doesn't. But this year, she there's not a woman out there who doesn't know who she is or what she did last year. Yeah. So I Pressure's think, on a bit more. I think she might uh, be a little, little pressure. Rosalind Lear, I hope WTM goes back to Vegas. You know, we haven't talked about that. The speculation, or what, what uh, Tough Butter has told us, mm. is that next year is going to be the beginning of uh, Nikki Karamba, she's finishing her sixth lap, 30 miles, five women with 30 miles. Speculation, or the, the what they've told us, not only really speculation, I guess, because they told us. <laughs> Next year, it's going to go to a permanent venue, Joe Perry crossing the finish line. I what does permanent Chris, mean? I asked Chris Maldi, the Tough Mudder Global Director of Product. Chris Maldi is the guy who 
essentially designs World's Toughest Mudder. Do you see an obstacle out here? It's because Chris Baldy came up with it, or his team. He, he is, is doing a great it. job uh, he really with, is. with Tough Mudder. But I asked him, I was like, permanent venue, like, what does that mean? Like, are you going to construct stuff and leave it up? Are you going to buy a facility? Are you going to buy a, like, what is, you say, moving to a permanent venue, what does that mean? He said, well, three to five years, kind of like Vegas was. Okay. Like, Vegas was not a, never thought of as a permanent venue. Every year we went to Vegas, we're like, where is it next year? Oh, it's in Vegas again. I kind of feel that whilst we're at the event that we're at, it seems weird to be talking about the next one. It's like, yeah. Not enjoying the day you're in and always looking forward. Yeah. And honestly, that this is probably a conversation for post brunch. We'll, we'll talk about it more then. But yeah, we're all looking forward to next year as well. Crushing it, man. Wristbands that way. Sometimes you might go quiet in the middle of a sentence. A lot of people are thinking where the tent where you get wristbands from. And we're like, no, please go that way. Oh, that's Josh Fiore. Uh, you can talk to him, see how he's doing. It doesn't look like... Uh, yeah, go, run, run. Will's going to go run after Josh and see how he's getting on. Uh, he's just got 35 miles. Did you speak to Josh? How is he doing? Uh, he's, he's doing well. Uh, seems to be... Yeah. Okay. But he's happy? Oh, yeah, no. Like, Justin says fine. he just spoke he's to fine. Josh. Uh, yeah, Josh. He's, uh, well, full of smiles, but in a bit of a rush. So one year in Granbury, then moving. Yeah, uh, Shane, will be, we, the event will be moving next year to what they call a permanent course, which is more likely to be a couple of years. Uh, some speculation over what that's going to be, but everyone's got ideas, haven't they? So we've got our top five women with 30 miles, top two men with 35, and everyone else in the top 10 with 30. Jason out there at Mudderhorn. I wish I had the stats on when the obstacles opened last year because it really feels like they're a lot later this year. I feel like we had a lot more to show you at this point. The problem is for the rabbits as well. It's, it's really hard work for those guys going out and running constantly. And Jason goes out, runs a bit, comes back, sorts out the technical issues, and then coming back. Uh, Rosalind Linda, how it seems like they're
Hey guys, we're back. Uh, so you've been having a feed throughout this time, but we kind of lost audio. Wi-Fi went down here. You're still getting it because Jason does something magical with cloud computers <laughs> and his own little Wi-Fi hotspots, but we weren't able to give you any commentary. And I may have lost you again, but we'll put a note in the YouTube channel so you all were uh, kind of back. They patch you. So yeah, welcome back guys. Uh, changes, um, top five women with 30 miles. Let's see if there's more than top five. Apologies if things are slow. It's just Wi-Fi issue today. Top eight women with 30 miles. So I just talked to Chris Maldi and we were talking about the mileages, what everyone has and I kind of gave him some of my way too early, like, hey, and again, not predictions. This is what's possible. Don't call it a prediction. Don't call it a prediction. Been here for years. And he said, well, once some of these other obstacles start opening up, dingleberries, grappler, um, I mentioned the third one, I don't remember what one was. It's like they all have their high failure rates and some stiff penalties. So. He's like when I was telling him my number, like the numbers we talked about like five minutes ago, like we could have four guys hit 110 miles, we could have four women hit 100 miles. He's like, he's now he loves to see big numbers, but he's more, he's I think not as he doesn't think it's as possible as I think it is. Well, so I mean, just think, so we've commented a few times that yeah, this is the screen's paused again. We're going to assume they can hear us and we're going to keep talking and hope for the best. Um, We've commented a few times about things feeling like they're opening later. Do you think it could be, a, uh, what it could be is, yeah, things are opening later, but once they're open, when you fail, if you fail, uh, you're going to suffer more for it, so it's going to balance out. Now, we absolutely know that it's going to get colder. Maybe not as cold as last year or other years, but it's going to get colder. And we know people are going to get tired, and they're going to start running slower. Like, that's going to happen. We know that there's still a few obstacles left open. There's going to be some opening up. We are at you know, almost 6 p.m. So Spunky Monkey and Everest should open up soon. We've got a camera up at Spunky Monkey that will be opening in just under 15 minutes. So we got about if we're able to control the cameras by that point again, we'll get that up. And that will bring us a bit more. Um, I think we'll be getting a camera out at Everest as well, which will be great fun. So we'll so be getting a bit absolutely more. Absolutely, everything's going to slow down. But that's why that 10 o'clock time is, is used in a rule of thumb and not midnight because we know people are going to slow down. So you, you build in that extra two hours, plus you have the hour and a half on the end, then uh, we'll see what happens. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, the, uh, I don't want to say the glass is half full. I'm like the, uh, <laughs> the cardio is half run kind of guy. <laughs> like, I, I think they can do it. I 100% believe Chris Glass is going to get 100 again. Not a doubt in my mind. There's a little doubt, but it's. I think it's going to happen for sure. Callie Schweikart, I think she's on track for 100 also. She's at top. She's running straight. Now, if, she, if, if this was Callie's first year and she was doing what she's doing right now, I'd be more concerned. I'd be like, oh, Callie. She's run it before. Like, she's what the 24 hours feels like. She knows what to expect. So I, I think we may see Cali with 102. Um, I don't want to start getting into individual name, like a ton of names, but those are two that I, I look at and I'm like, okay, for sure. Like that's not for sure. Nothing's for sure. Like, no. But I, I could absolutely see that. So with the pictures just started moving while well, it moved for a second. It's coming in and out. We've no idea if you can hear us or not, but we're going to keep talking as if you can. Uh, and also, we've no idea if the comments are refreshing. Uh, so we've got a few internet problems here. We just wait for it to go. You can hear us. So y'all can hear us. When will we see more obstacles? Uh, when they open. When they open, as we've said a few times, they're opening later tonight. So we're, we're taking a camera now to grapple up. Uh, Spunky's going to open at six.
So we're taking a camera now to Grouch's uh, open. Uh, take the camera to Grappler, which is open. We have it on Spunky Monkey, and we're probably going to move our uh, camera from Butterhorn to Everest when that opens. Hey, special thanks to everybody in the comments. Rosalind, Linda, Allison Walls, Easy for me. Uh, you guys can hear us. Hey, um, yeah, you know, it's kind of a, everything is set up like in a, we're in a 10 by 10 pop up by the finish line. We're, uh, Got electronics getting dust all over them, and cell coverage coming to go to see us across the finish line. Good job, Diana. Yeah. I talked with Diana Brass uh, before this started. She said she's having hip problems, Oof. so her plan was to do one lap, mm -hmm. then hang out in the pit area, and then go out and do one another finisher lap. But we've we've seen her. She's done. I'm not sure her exact mileage right now, but she she was just one to do the obstacle. We were watching. Yes, them. yes. Um, tipping point. No, not tipping no. point. Um, no swung. Well, oh, no, no, tip, the tips. Swinging tip. tips. She was the first one to do that. First one to do the penalty for that. Tipping point isn't even an obstacle. It's a point. That's a point. totally different Coming one. Soon. So it's good to see, yeah, it's good to see Deanna just finishing a lap here at almost 6 p.m. At 6 p.m. we have a few more obstacles opening. We have trench press and we have spunky monkey. Mm. So we've got a camera out at spunky monkey, so we'll get that to you before it opens, if we can get the connection. At uh, Everest, we're going to get a camera over there as well, Everest as well as, well. as Rappler. So I was like, we knew I, yesterday we were going through the house because I saw Trench Press. Trench Press is trenches dug out by a, like an earth mover. And then it finishes, it looks like you go through some water and then out of a cargo net. And I was like, they should do an obstacle with trenches where they soak you as you're going through the trench. And they could call it Drench Press. And then I was like, you know what they probably do? They probably start with the obstacle name first. They're like, hey, Augustus Gloop. That's a funny two words put together. What kind of obstacle can we come up with that? I mean, I think there's a lot of skill in, oh, you can see it when people like, come up with obstacle ideas and you're like, oh, that's not going to work for this, this, and this reason. Uh, you know, we all have ideas. I've had a ton of ideas. None of them would ever work. But there's something extra special.
Guys, we're hoping you can hear us now. We just had uh, Jason come back and refresh things and taught us how to refresh things as well. Hopefully you can hear us. Somebody was asking in the comments, um, they wanted to see the, what was going on with the leaderboards. I think you've had some quiet time with just uh, obstacles for a while. We're still getting those obstacles out there. The camera's out. Um, we hear ourselves coming through the phone. The obstacles cameras have been slightly delayed because Jason had to come back and fix them for us. So here we go. Seven men, seven laps. Six seven hours in. Brothers for seven wives. What's, what's that one? Seven, seven rides for seven brothers. Laps for seven runners. All under six hours. Yeah. Yep. All right, we're at six o'clock, so we are 25% of the time into the race. Now, does that mean you can take these numbers and multiply them by four and boom, you got your finisher? It does not. It does not. But we are on track for a historic night of mileage, I believe. So just in case uh, the audio wasn't running when you were talking about, when you were chatting, uh, what was Chris saying about the obstacles, the obstacles opening, and what he thinks is going to happen? So I was talking with Chris Malby. He is the World Subs Butter Race Director. And he's the, basically, he's the guy, like if you see an obstacle on course, it, he either created it or it, it passed through his fingers. Like he was the one who, who, who heads it up, heads up this part of the event. And I told him when we were talking about the mileage, I was like, you, we could have six people hit 110 and we could have four women hit 100. And kind of the, again, way too early predictions. And they're not predictions, they're just possibilities. I'm just saying, hey, this is out there. This, this could happen. There's a greater than zero chance that this could happen. And he was, he did not think it was as possible as I thought it was. He started talking about, there's three obstacles that are opening up here at six o'clock that are, um, that will have difficult penalties and that'll slow him down. And he knows about getting colder and he's like, yeah, all those things. But he was talking specifically about obstacle, obstacle difficulty coming up for the obstacles opening and the literal difficulty, penalty difficulty for those obstacles that are like easily available obstacles. I think you are being very uh, optimistic with your ideas. Oh, I, I would say I'm not a gambling woman, but I absolutely am. And I would be very happy to put a bet on you not being right. Well, as, as members of the production team, I, I think it's probably frowned on for you and I to gamble on I will. Results. I will gamble you this pen, which doesn't belong to me. <laughs> um, I, I do believe we're going to have... Excuse me. More than one woman get 100 miles yeah. before this is two. over. Two women get 100 miles. Sure. And I think we're going to have more than one man get 110 miles. So we're looking at the at the race results. Count, um, ladies are, are crushing it. I mean, everyone's crushing it. Top men, top women, everyone's crushing it right now. Here we go. There we go. And it's here open. Here we go. Spunky Monkey is open. So... Racers start at the far end of the obstacle. You see those ropes. And these athletes are on the back half. So the but, first half is the rope. Then there's the trapeze bar leading into the ladder downhill. But it runs in both directions. So well, does right it now, switch at some point? It may switch overnight. I haven't heard that officially. But yeah. that's a that goes Heather? Heather Bodie path or Heather Olson path right now. Heather Bodie. You see our report's own Heather Olson. So here's a good start. You see the, uh, the athlete, you gotta hook your feet in there. And then there's two ways you can do it. You can pull yourself along and let your feet kind of drag, or you can do it with this, what this guy's doing. Your, your feet kind of walk and do half the work for you. Your lower body's walking yourself up mm. and your arms are just kind of keeping pace. It's a steep rope. It is a steep rope. Jason did this half. yesterday and flew through it. But alternatively, when it switches directions, which means you start with a ladder, it's a steep rope down. You can just slide down, probably. Yeah, but you got to keep control so you don't touch any water. Oh, you know what? I'd imagine if they switch directions, it will be overnight. And I would imagine most people have their wetsuits on by then. This guy is working hard, but he's doing it. He's, you can tell he's, man, I hope this guy makes it. He's, he's working hard. Swing it. Get and there we go. Swing. Twinkle there toes go. as well. We've got a camera up. The downhill is the easier part, obviously. Going downhill is easier though. That's a lady. Was that Kelly Schweikart, maybe? Um, good, good for her. She was working hard. And Twinkle Toes open up. Twinkle Toes, every single person has found a herb 
That's a two by three and a half inches wide. It could have been Cali. She was last seen at Melbourne. I feel like that. I don't know. I that. They've had variations of twinkles where there's electricity on the sides. Mm -hmm. So you can't sit down and shimmy across. I don't see any across. They've had variations of it where in the middle. Oh, oh, ouch. That guy took a spill. One of your, your twinkle toes. They've had a variation where in the middle they had little steps. Twinkle, little twinkle toe steps you had to climb up. So. You had to, when you got halfway through, you had to climb up a step. They were short steps, but still, you're not really into that when you're trying to cross a three and a half inch wide thing over water. And then they've also had this obstacle where it's just, uh, just ground underneath it. So, join again in the booth by Amelia Boone. Amelia, you want to take a microphone? We got a third microphone in. Sure. About the way I come here. Make sure there's a button on the side. Make sure we get all you. You love Auditing the media. The media. Oh, are you? Yeah. You're all right. Yeah. Amelia Boone, welcome back to the booth. Huh? Thank you. Good to be here. So let's pull up the uh, race results to show Amelia what we're looking at right now. All right. Are you ready for this? Let's do the women. Let's do the women. So count with 30 miles, six hours in. Nice. Or five, even five hours. You finished five hours in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're, we have a. Not a prediction, yes. but it's possible. So, you know the rule of thumb at 10 o'clock, your mileage 50, at 10 o'clock is 50% of what you could have at the end, yeah, right? Agreed. So if you want to run 100, you need 50, 50 by 10. by 10, yes. Um, so we were at 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. We're like, we know it's way too early, yes. but if we take our 5 o'clock times and we double them, and then maybe we fudge a little margin of error in there. Right. And then we double that. Now, I know you could keep having it. Like, you can't do this multiple times you should way too early right and again not predictions just possibilities i would think she's on a hundred mile pace right now i think so here that you asked me a question earlier and this is it's interesting you said what else has changed or what has changed since 2012 sure one of them is all the obstacles were open from the beginning back then yeah so we now have this rolling start so these times are going to slow down the laps especially as the night like you go out at a blistering pace. I think the the laps are heavily front loaded, just because of that. Because you have the obstacles that aren't open. Um, who knows? I mean, it, she definitely could. I don't want to say she wouldn't be over 100 miles, but I think that's a good 100 mile pace right now. Do, do we both ladies again? So Absolutely. not just Cali though, but yeah. look at the other. Look right, at how 70. Yeah. Look at how many. Well, have, Stephanie's currently ahead of Kelly now. Yeah, oh, on the course, but they haven't finished that sixth, seventh lap yet. Okay. Not until they finish. So, but look, we have eight women, 30, 30 miles, 30 miles at, by 5.30. That would, I mean, it would be incredible to have multiple women over 100 miles. So. A, little, a little air noise there. Yeah. Um, so we're even talking, like, could a woman hit? Two, two questions. How many women could hit 100, do we think? Yeah. And again, this is not, we're not naming names. We're just, and we're not predicting. We're just like, hey, it's possible. A greater than yeah. zero chance. How many women can hit 100? I think we can have four women hit 100 miles. I think so, too. It seems, it seems like I said two. <laughs> I mean, I'm just looking at, like, I'm not naming names, but we have such strong. Just by numbers, there, right? By numbers. So, by I sheer. Mean, you guys numbers. know what you're talking about because you've actually run it and been here a lot. <laughs> but I'm maybe less optimistic. Like, I couldn't pick names because there are a lot of those women there that are incredible, but it seems like such a big feat, especially now the obstacles are starting to open, yeah. the penalties are really tough, it's going to get colder overnight, just probability, surely they're going to I, I agree, I actually, I'll, I'll be honest, and maybe, maybe I should, I, I think it's theoretical four women could hit it, I don't think four will, um, I they just know the carnage that happens overnight, it is warm outside, it is windy though. Um, it's and it's cold. going when the sun goes down and the wind. A lot of water obstacles, a lot of penalties. People are going to start failing. Those penalties are long and they're time consuming. Thankfully, we're, or Tough Mudder is now making penalties that incentivize you to actually finish obstacles. Um, but I, I, I think we'll see at least one. Maybe two. Sure. I see. I'm there with two. With two. I actually, we had other. We're not calling them predictions. Yeah. No, they're just possible. It's just out there. I, I mean, oh, I, I would love it. I would, get... love, I would want one to hit 105. That would be fantastic. I said two women to get 100 and two women to get 90 or above. Yeah. 
So you four went with at ninety plus. Four women to get hundred and one little dress. Yeah, I don't know. Possible. I'd like to see hundred and five. I, I've heard in talking to a lot of the competitors, they say it's a very fast course right now. Sure. It's very fast. Like, Especially it's right very now. Runnable. Right it's now. Hard ground, this is the problem we've had. Good the, 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 it's good weather. It's good weather. And it, it, yeah, I mean, it was it was hot earlier for sure. And so I think that slowed some people down. But everyone said there's nothing. And actually, uh, it, maybe it's just people have gotten much better obstacles. Everybody's saying the obstacles are not that hard um, in terms of just like they're completed. Completable. Sure. <laughs> sure. So, um, but yeah, I think they're screaming through for sure. Let's, let's look at the uh, the men's results right now. So we got eight men with yeah. 35 miles under ours. Yeah. So we're, I think it's going to be the record for 100 miles, 100 mile finishers is two years ago. We had six men. Last year we had. Laughlin, yeah. Yeah, Laughlin. Last year we had five men and Chris, and Chris, so six people again. Yeah. So I think I think we might have the most hundred mile finishers. <laughs> I should say hundred mile finishers ever. I think so too, because if you look at this, you also like you don't even see Trevor Psychos on there. You know he's getting hundred. Yep. Like not even the top ten, but like. Fifty five is a lot. If you see people, a lot can go at, wrong. There's sixty five miles. There's yes. gonna be attrition. I'm. I mean, and not to speak ill of any of these men but there will be attrition because a lot of these just, guys just took it out it's nothing to do with super, the super hot i mean we, we it happens all the time you know sure well, we um, lost, uh, who was it that we lost with the um, last year uh mendoza tummy ache he's, oh, he's yeah. been in the pit right yeah now. So, uh, too, yeah it's nothing to do with skill or grit or anything it's just bad things happen they get handed out it happen, and it's happening you know people yeah people rolling ink happen or you know, a year. So, no. but they are at a blistering pace for sure. And but Trevor always says that the race starts at midnight, and I agree with him. No. Um, he says that a lot too. You have to be very, very tactical about it. Yeah. No. When Trevor says the race starts at midnight, what does that mean to you? To me, that means like that's when you start to push. That's when you like you you keep it you keep it low key for the first um, you know for the first twelve hours. You run a comfortable pace. You don't get caught up. In, in like the frenetic energy or where you are sure. in the race um in like the rankings it's really interesting to see people come through the pit and, and their attitudes and how relaxed they are versus how frenetic they are and um i think that actually like ends up taking a toll if, if you're not chilling at this point right they're just watching like austin coming through just like fist bumping and she looked very we said that we just, couldn't really work her out because she was kind of trotting in nice and healthy but just looking a bit low-key and i so couldn't find like, the words but I, I think that that's i think that that is to your advantage mm -hmm. like you want to be chill at the beginning you don't want to be caught up with where am i and try and burn each other out i feel that's happened a bit in the men we had a Joshua Fiore coming through first with then my yeah. was behind him. But then the next lap he'd overtaken by like two minutes, a little bit. And it was it was like yeah. way more. And it almost felt like there was a bit too much competition there early. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with them as the night goes on. Because they were way ahead of everyone else at one point. They kind of just back, felt back, too yeah. soon. And, it, for and it. I and I also think that it's you know, you go through you go through highs and lows out there. Like you're gonna have a really rough lap when people stop to change into warmer clothes they're going to have a bigger pit time so you're going to see these leads start to change because people are you know strategically putting on wetsuits or you know taking a longer break things like that so you can't really get caught up in this moment about where you are i personally i when well last time i ran i told them, i don't know where, want to know where i am i don't want to know where the women are ahead of me i don't want to know where they are behind me maybe Maybe if it, like maybe sixteen hours in, I need enough. But you didn't want to know anything. I didn't want to know anything. Sixteen hours. It's four a.m. Yeah. You didn't want to. I didn't want to. I I face. asked my crew to not tell me. I said, "Do not tell me unless I ask you." Okay. And I think I'm. Uh, I think I started asking maybe halfway through. Okay. Um, just to get a general idea, but halfway through at midnight. At midnight. But I think that for me, I knew I was running a hard as I, I'm not going to ease up because I'm a lap ahead sure. or I'm not going to start going harder because of running there's running that, runs. yeah, yeah, it's you, you have to run to what 24 you can hours. do and what you can, you have to, yeah. that's where you, you don't, you know, um, and you get into your head 
and then you start making mistakes on all of and you can start getting down on yourself and just not and just take yourself mentally out of it too. We were saying this earlier about Chris. There was a race she was at a couple of maybe two months ago and she wasn't in the lead. Yeah. And we were kind of going, oh, is it has she done? Is this not her race? Is she pushing to she's been doing so much? And she just ran her own race. She, she, mm-hmm. it was almost like there was no one else there. And she won really nicely. And some women got stuck on other obstacles and she just carried on at her own pace. And she seems like a good example of just I am here doing my own thing. So we can almost ignore, I feel for Chris where she is in the leaderboard currently because she's just steady and mm-hmm. consistent and, and, and has that within her to just keep going and not really worry about anyone else, do her own thing. I agree. I, I have no doubt. I mean, she knows what she's doing. She did go out hard and she, you know, wasn't at the front, but she's she definitely just runs that she knows her ability and her ability is incredible. So she's going to be up there um, for sure. At, at this point in the race, six hours in, yeah. what are you thinking when you're out there as an elite toward the front of the pack? What's like, what's going through your mind? I think at this point it's just, it's, it is, you know, stay calm, kind of like, and also like stay relaxed. And at this point really start to have fun because here's the thing. Sun is, the sun is going down. It's going to get cold. And this is actually always like the lowest part of the race for me because you're you like you realize you're not you're not even halfway there you're like a quarter of the <laughs> I've way been running there. for six hours I've been running for six hours <laughs> I gotta go over this twinkle toes thing like 10 more times I'm so excited they have twinkle toes again but um that's the side point um but I think it really is just this is the part of time when I start to tap into all right let's like chat with other people as we're out there let's get into a rhythm let's figure out awesome strategy um I always pick the same lanes I always make sure you know you can look at things there will be sometimes one of those beads on twinkle toes is going to be easier than other ones or when they used to have things like birth now one of the lower than other ones so you, you just learn and I always pick the same lanes and keep going and figure that out so that's kind of what I do at this point in the race you know, watching these guys do twinkle toes, uh, I've seen maybe two or three people pass it. Seems like a lot of people fail in twinkle toes, huh? I mean, come on, guys. This is an old school obstacle. This, um, this has been there since at least 2012, right? 2011. Like, 2011. My very first okay. letter I remember doing this. So 2011, we were talking, to, I was talking with Four Eyes about this. They had twinkle toes, but then they also built it up. Little steps. With little steps yep, yep, up yep. with little, like, two-by-twos or something sure. like that. Yeah. And, it looks pretty and they wobbly. Were, it was also I'll frozen over <laughs> with ice. Um, I assume they can't use they they can't use their hands on this. Yeah, it looks right? like they're not allowed. They're to, not uh, allowed to. Yeah. Um, this is I love that they brought this back. I've asked them to bring the toes back forever um, because it, I feel like it's actually one equalizer that women gen- in general tend to be better at balance obstacles than men. Sure. Um, fun fact: my actually my Wi-Fi network is named Twinkle Toes. <laughs> I've always named my Wi-Fi networks after a tough butter obstacle. Oh, so that's Mine are named after a Breaking Bad character. Oh, oh, that's good. Not, I not like that. Mine has the name it came with. <laughs> um, what do you think of the obstacles this year? Have you seen any you like or anything? Um, you know, I I unfortunately haven't been out there um <laughs> to see, but I think uh, you know, I miss kind of the big splashy ones that we used to have. I miss King, King of, of the Swingers, swingers sure. King of Swingers just the cliff or like big jump obstacles. Um, but you know, they're, they're innovative. They're always kind of changing and adding new things. And so um, like, it's, it's always a challenge. And the penalties really, really incentivize me to. We've just had word about what some of the penalties are out there. A chunky monkey penalty, a potato sack hop is 0.27 miles long. A quarter mile and potato sack hop. Penalty for grappler is long with a swampy section at the furthest distance. Room zero point seven miles for grappler penalty. Point seven seven tenths of a mile. Point seven tenths of a mile for grappler, which is and gra- I mean, I didn't get grappler once in Vegas, so. <laughs> grappler is there's obviously technique to it, but it feels like there's a little luck to it too. You're right, but I mean, like Walter. Walter showed everybody like the tech. I think that video was making the rounds right, about yeah. how to do it, and I still kind of do it. It was the same. It's like I couldn't do tramp stamp either. There are certain things, but now you, back in the day when the penalties weren't that bad, right. you know, one thing in the world. They brought operation back. They that? did. They did. And actually, of the electrified obstacles, that's my 
most favorite. It's at least there's it's some least, skill to it. Least favorite. Oh, that looks terrible. Are they walking with? This is blocks a penalty, on I believe. Oh, yes. That's really early on. We saw the. Yeah. We saw this. We saw yeah. it yesterday. <clears throat> I'm not sure what I say. Well, some of the first obstacles with penalties. It might be Twinkle Toes. I think that's possible. That's do they have? Oh, the, they don't. Do they have the Hoppy Ball this year? There's a potato sack, I guess, now. Probably the potato sack. Probably because people broke all the hoppy balls. The, yeah, those bouncy ones? <laughs> just, bouncy just ones. Just Did up. I ever say about the time I raced Amelia Boone on the uh, bouncy ball? And you beat me. Proudest moment of my life when I beat Amelia Boone in a race. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, maybe I let you win. Yeah. Ma- oh, my gosh. Oh. I have a core memory, Amelia. Don't I was take like, it away from him. I was like, I, was, I told you the story. I was 12 years old. And I was playing Monopoly with a friend of my dad's. And yeah. I beat him. I was like, yes, <laughs> I beat an adult at Monopoly. And he's like, good job. I let you in. And I was like, what an ass. You, what? you stole that from me. So now, as a core memory, I remember this 30 years later. When I play games with my kids, Yeah. I don't crush them. But I don't let them win, ever. No, I don't like, think you should. They're going to beat me eventually, and they're going right. to hurt it. Like, right. And they'll hopefully feel good right. when they beat me. Oh, For the record, I daughter, didn't let you win. Changes the rules. <laughs> my, quads, my quads were just shot yeah. at that point. <laughs> yeah, you, I think you probably ran 80 miles, and I'd run 40. Ooh, let's get a picture of the finish line, because the uh, sun is starting to look The sun is the coming s- down. Sun set coming down in Granbury, Texas. Oh, I'm not sure you can really see yeah, it. Yeah. It doesn't come out as pretty in the uh, pictures yeah, as a person. It's really yeah. In real life. Well, Millie, we're looking forward to having you next year back on the course. Huh? I'm excited to be out there. I, uh, it's it's hard it's hard to be. Here. I mean, I didn't. It's yeah, it's hard to be on the sidelines. Yeah. I just want to run. As miserable as you know that it's going to get. Soon. Isn't that crazy? How? Why is it that you know you're you would, if you're running right now? Yeah. Six hours. You've been running thirty miles, 25, 30 miles. You know you're, everything hurts. You've been going over obstacles, but man, you still miss it anyway. You miss it anyway. I I, I think it's. It's because of that. You have strains, you know, the whole like we forget easily. Like every every single world cup matter. I think I've said at some point I'm never doing this again. I, I'm pretty sure I've been like, yeah, last year, last year, last year. I got year. nothing to prove. And then the day after, and I think it's being with everyone, and then you're all at the brunch, and then we always joke. We're like, you know, we could all just hang out with each other without. We don't run. have. To we don't run. have to run for 24 hours. We could just. Go have a beer. We could go yeah. camping. Like, we don't I have know. To- <laughs> I know. But no, I mean, it's just the memories that you have you out there. You could just go to Chili's. You don't have to. Yeah, but then we wouldn't have a memory of you beating me in a hot dog race. That's true. So I wouldn't be talking with Carlo about Jimmy Dodgers. Before. Jimmy Dodgers, I missed that. But oh. Brought it from. Imported from the UK. We've got a very big snack table here. It's impressive. I was, I was going to say, I was like, you guys have a bigger snack table than Trevor has for like his pitting or like With a lot media. of people. <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard to find anyone who will say anything really kind about past Tough Butter leadership. Yeah. Early Tough Butter leadership. Okay. But I, I maintain without past leadership, we wouldn't have World Stuff as Butter. I agree. We wouldn't have stuff like this. And that... I'm, I'm grateful I think for everyone this race can agree on that. And for this event, I think it's yeah. a special, special thing that I'm glad exists. No, and I absolutely, and, and I oh, think that the shirt. fact, and I and I understand oh, that, and I get that. Bathroom. I think a lot of people, it's easy to look back in hindsight and also speak very ill and, and things like that. But, you know, Tough Mudder really revolutionized things. And they took a chance on an event in 2011 that, I mean, even now, when you describe it to people, it sounds crazy. Yeah. Like, why would you do? Don't you sleep? Well, you can, but you're not supposed to. Like, it sounds like a crazy, crazy event. So it's. I want to tell my mum about no, just but coming it, here to work, and she can never understand. Like, it sounds like hell. Oh my god, it's really good fun. Right, and it's hard to describe because I tell people, I'm like, there is actually nothing else like it. And I had one of my friends last year, crew for me, who's never been to an obstacle race. Shrez, and she like could never run. understand my love. And she actually really wanted, she was going to come back to okay. this year and was really sad when she couldn't run. She wanted to come anyway because she said, You are right. Like, there is nothing else like this. And it's hard to describe to people unless they're able to experience it. Yeah. Um, you really, it's, people say this about other things, but it's, you have to experience it. Yeah. You really do. It's, it's a chance. That's the only way I can describe it. 
Right. And, and I, and so it's, it's one of those things that I just, I, every year I'm like, oh, I hope, please don't ever get rid of world stuff. <laughs> it's so great. I want to be 60 years old. Now they're running 20 yeah. more years doing this. And even if you like, it's like people who have never run it before, they're like, oh, I'd love to go, but I can't run 24 hours. I'm like, you can think through, you can alter an obstacle for 12 hours. Well, or you can run and then only run 15 miles. Yeah. Like, do that is the beauty of this is that you, you can decide what you want from this race. And I don't think that there's any other format. I mean, I guess some of the time the ultras that you run in loops, it's kind of like that. But you also don't have the ability to be like, you know what? I'm just going to stay in this obstacle a while and help other people. Yeah. So there's nothing else like that. Um, cause you see the people out at Mutterhorn or Everest Angels, things like that, helping out and they're, they're running, they're out there, they're competitors, but this is what they choose to do with their race. That is their race. That's that is how their they race. choose. And there's exactly. no wrong answers. Like no. yeah. some people want to come and hang out in the pit area. Yeah. Let's go do a lab. Then like hang out in the pit area and then they go down and do a finisher lab. Like, and that, there's no shame with that game. Like Absolutely. they're not here to get 50 miles or hundred miles. They're here to experience the race as part of the game. And that's right. And I think that that's what's so cool is that people understand too. Yeah. So we got Stephanie an update the, uh, women's. Yeah. Stephanie Bland moving into first place. Oh, yeah. Kelly Schweiber and Chris Roblosky. Yeah. Well, I've just put the finish line camera on so we can see more heart and scars coming through, but... Looks like our finish line camera is <laughs> Looks like it's frozen, so it's a shame. But that is going to be on uh, on Instagram. We've got Mike's just there, taking a little film, so we'll get that up. The sun's starting to go down. It's so beautiful. Um, the wheelchair athlete is walking. She's yes. walked over the finish line a few times. Yeah. She's using, oh, she's using walking sticks. Yeah, she's using walking sticks. I mean, I think about what it's like to... There's Callie. Callie's the fastest. Nearby. Sweet. Um, so Stephanie and Callie not too far behind each other. Yeah. Can you? I can't imagine going through the course in a wheelchair. So like just I, trusting people to pull me up and over. I remember seeing a um, wheelchair athlete. I, I was like a devil's beard in Laughlin. And the fact that I was like, oh, God, they're going to get that under yeah. and up that hill. And Laughlin was uphill. Yeah. Right, yeah. Then, uh, so it's, it's just, it's, it's bonkers to think about. So. Well, Billy Boone, thanks for joining us. It's fantastic. A pleasure. Be around. All right. Thank you Good so much. You. We're just uh, sticking our heads out to see the sunset. Yeah, but it's here. It's nice. We just saw Jack and the um, and Andre from Spartan Tough Matter running off to go get pictures. So, so nice to have Amelia in the in the. I mean, one. I've been like. A huge fan of her for like the last ten years. I'm sure. like, hi. <laughs> but somebody who has such a good uh, history of it, who knows what she's talking about, is you know it's not one or two races she's done. Amelia Boone is the only three-time women's three-time champion in the World Stubbs Mutter. She's also finished second, uh, and those two finishes were ten years apart. Holy macaroni! In 2021, she almost she was literally nine minutes away from winning the entire race outright wow. uh, just behind John Young Pack in 2011 or I can't wait for the day when so, something like that happens it, it's absolutely possible I think I think the most likely it would have been in 2012 when she finished she finished with 90 miles John Young Pack finished with 90 miles um, Pack finished in 25 21 Amelia finished in 25 30 nine minutes behind Pack mm for the outright win. A lot of people looking at the sunset out here. That's the uh, the scene out here on course. World Stubbles Butter Sunset, Granbury, Texas. So we've got our um, 
Oh, so funny. The advert I've got coming up is for Zermatt, Switzerland, where the Matterhorn lives. I think my phone's listening to me the amount of times we've said Matterhorn today. Matterhorn. Uh, the comments we're not able to throw up on screen at the minute because, again, the Wi-Fi went down, but I'll read a few off from my phone. Did I see correctly the low temps tonight will be 55? A little different from last year, for sure. Uh, my lows are coming in at 12, and I don't know what that means. That's a great question. Let's do a weather update. We'll do a U.S. version, then we'll do a Celsius version. <laughs> Lee said that obstacle's pretty nasty, to be honest. Would have been easier the other way around. Which one, the, um, the, um, is it Spunky Monkey now, oh, isn't it? <laughs> when you start to get tired, you're trying to think of what, I was remembering last year, like, well hung and things like that. You start to forget what all the, uh, obstacles are called. If it's that one, they, they are going to flip it the other way. Uh, an athlete who tried it out yesterday on the hat lap just commented, when you get to the bottom, it can be a bit tricky if you don't kind of accurately know the size of your body and you could slightly touch the water. So current weather in Granbury, 71 degrees here at 6.30 p.m. local time. Getting down to a low of, it looks like... 54. Low of 54, but I believe that was earlier today, though. Like going... Oh, overnight. Mid it's midnight, not be that 61... 4 a.m. 57 looks like a low of 56 that may be the warmest world's toughest mother well it's the sun's going down i'm still in a t-shirt and shorts and anyone who knows me knows that's unusual no medina it's quite a romantic sunset at world's toughest mother indeed it's beautiful well i think so um so many walking around straight to the penalty not going in the water to get the infinity and toughest one are you seeing that on our cameras uh, Lee, I thought races had to enter the water at least. Well, last year they certainly had to enter the water. I remember athletes yeah, just we'll, bobbing we'll in and out. We'll talk to Chris Balbin and get a rules update on that. Because you're right. Usually if there's a obstacle that has a water feature, if you want to take the penalty, just automatically take the penalty. That ladder to hell there in our picture in picture. Then uh, you would have to get wet. Ladder to hell, we went over this during the hot lap. It's not a difficult obstacle on its, it's own. It's bigger than it looks. It is bigger than it looks. It's probably 15 feet. Uh, 14, 15 feet tall. Um, but we're ladder uh, Heather, is that Heather Olson? Right there? Yeah. Where ladder to hell will get you is after you've been running for 20 or 30 or 40 miles, then you'll, you'll, your legs will start to cramp up. Mm -hmm. Even on these little things, it's yeah. ugh, when you're cold and wet. So Heather Olson, we're watching there. I'm not sure where she is on the uh, leaderboard. I would imagine she finishes in the top ten, and with a shot at the top five. And let's have a look. But we'll uh, we'll look her up there. Uh, twenty-one currently, five laps in six hours and three minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I can talk, but I what is Jason out now? Driving yes. Around? Yep. You just text him asking to slow down a little. He's driving too fast. No, no, oh. Jason's not driving. He's, he's out running. Oh, maybe Jack. Jack. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. I will tell him. All right, we'll do. Yeah. It's going to get dark quickly now, isn't it? You know what it is? Once the sun starts setting, which it is setting right now, it'll uh, it'll be a quick. It'll get darker faster than you think. Like those athletes you see them wearing their headlamps now, uh -huh. they're going to be glad they have those headlamps in not too long. Well, I hope our uh, camera crew have got headlamps as well, and they're following the rules. Say what time? I said our, I hope our camera crew has got headlamps as well. I, I've, I've I hope I hope they do. I've got I brought my own headlamp, but that's just oh, that's for. Uh, Jason. Jason. Jen, we got a bike from you. Do you want? Okay. Yeah, all right. Sure. We've got Tough Mudder, World's Toughest Mudder race director and 
Tough Mudder Global Vice President of Product, Chris Maltley, joining us in the booth. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. I like that you come prepared with a clipboard. A uh, clipboard is how you know, I mean, business. This is Chris, serious. we've had multiple guests. We've had the CEO of Tough Mudder in here today, and he, he didn't have a clipboard. Well, that's what I would expect from Giles. <laughs> he just spoke about Pringles. <laughs> That's also what I would expect of Giles. Um, Giles asked us specifically to call him when we opened the Pringles. They've been open so, a few hours. They've been open, yeah. We didn't call him. Okay. Well, so he has more important things to do. Six hours, six hours and 34 minutes into World's Toughest Motor 2023. How's it going so far? It's been going well, I think. All smooth, great weather. Um, you know, we talked about it a little in the race briefing, but this week was freezing here in mm. the 20s overnight repeatedly. And here we are, and it's been beautiful. And if anything, a little too warm. And I think we have a mild night ahead. So uh, really good. And from what I've seen so far, a lot of racers putting in pretty good mileage. As the race director, when you see the mileage or the weather is going to be milder than expected, do you like that or do you hate that? How do you feel about it? You know, as a well, I have a couple of feelings. As a racer, it make, brings me joy. I always preferred when we had mild years for Worlds. As a race director, it's just a different race. It's interesting. You know, you see how people adapt to it. It can be fun when there's dust storms and when it's super cold overnight because you see people push through another element. But it's exciting to see big miles. And, you know, if anything, it's an opportunity for the obstacles to shine. You have people going harder, deeper overnight rather than just, you know, a lot of racers will wrap up, pack up and go to the pit overnight until the morning if it's too cold. So different race. I think it's exciting, exciting no matter what. Personally, I'm not upset that I get to hang out outside when it's a little bit warmer out. How do you, you see? So we see so far six hours in, but it looks like big, big mileages, big, uh, finishing big mileages. You know, you plan the you plan the course. This is your race. How do you feel about it? You see, like we know when Raymond Vincent is coming through every lap. Every time Nerf the runner Raymond Vincent comes through, he's hooting and holler. It's amazing. There are a lot of cat out on the course. Yes, I warned, not him, I warned him in advance of the race, and he said, "We'll see how bad they hurt." And he, Amazing. But they, there are a lot of big ones, like to the point people, yes, like, don't stand in them, they could go through your shoe. Yes, yes, and he's many laps in now, yes. barefoot as always. He's run more laps barefoot today than I have, more miles today than I've run in my life. Yep. Like, he's even, in, like, in yep. the house, like. Yep. An amazing guy. I mean, oh, that I've run in my life, full stop, even with shoes. <laughs> um, so what do you, when you, you see all these guys, we think they're going to be big miles when it's all said and done. How did, what, what's your reaction to that? It's great to see people come out hot. I'm always interested to see, as you know, overnights when the race always changes. You'll see a couple front runners usually drop down, either because they went out too fast, um, or they just miscalculated the race, or because they start hitting things they can't do. So I like to see good mileage up front. You know, it means people came and are pushing each other. Um, you know, we've seen a lot, males and females, similar distances, you know, up to this point, running similar paces. That's great. Um, the real race, you know, I think always starts around midnight and goes from there. Um, also, one of the cool things about Worlds is all the obstacles aren't open from the start. Nothing's open at the start, and they get progressively harder as the night goes on. So we intentionally move some things back on the opening schedule this year. So Dingleberries, we know, is going to be a very tough obstacle, and it has a very tough penalty that doesn't open until 10 p.m., which okay. is our last opening. Um, so the combination of those obstacles opening late, just fatigue from hitting some of the early obstacles through the day, it just it stacks up. And that's what really ends up making the difference of the race. Who's brought it? Um, and it's really done their training for those obstacles. And that was one of the big priorities this year. I think we might've talked about previously was make the penalties substantially harder so that, that athletes that can complete the obstacles are rewarded. Um, it should never feel like the easy option to take the penalty. You should take that because you truly are at failure and cannot pass. It feels like a punish failure, but you want to reward the success. I think we definitely saw elite athletes and contenders last year skip holes. And if they can do it, as we're saying, you just should. Yeah, and we can't, you know, as a as a course designer or race director, you can't blame an no, elite athlete. One hundred percent, an athlete is going to do the path of least resistance. Absolutely. And, so they should. and by the way, when I say skipping obstacles, I don't mean skipping obstacles yes, illegally. I mean doing the penalties. Yeah, but you but know, it's, they're going to do what's the easiest thing, and they should. Yes, it's a strategic race. You take the opportunities that present themselves yes. to you, um, because you know your competitors will. So. Um, but then for us to adapt, that's why we love to collect feedback. You know, Dingleberries is a great one I talked about in the race briefing. Last year, I got the feedback directly from elites that the penalty was easier than the obstacle, mm -hmm. which I appreciated. And then I meant to change for this year uh, because it shouldn't be that way. Of course, they tell you at the end of the race. They, tell, they say at the end of the race. Um, my memory with most things is bad, but my memory for those types of things, quite good. 
Um, so we've adapted it. I, you know, I hope to see a lot of athletes completing that this year. But most of all, I want to see athletes trying it. You know, when it's a foregone conclusion that you're going to even put in the effort because you know you're going to fail or you know the penalty is an easier option than the obstacle, you know, that's that's a failed design. We're hearing a couple of penalties out there are quite brutal, uh, quite long with quite tricky bits in, in between. Yeah, well, you know, you may notice on the course this year, some of the obstacles are throwbacks to the 15, 16, 17 era, some things we haven't seen in a while, like the grappler, like operation on a course. Um, and like way too tough as a penalty. And I was going back and doing a lot of research into those early years and reading things that, you know, us as Tough Butter had put out, but also that, you know, stories that you guys had written, stories that had gone up on other blogs. And it was really interesting. There was such good data for how long the penalty mileage used to be. Mm. And it was shocking when I looked at that because I, I knew vaguely in the back of my mind that our penalties used to be much longer. Sure. But when I went and was looking up these old, when 2016 was like two and a half miles of penalties, that's half the course distance. Yeah. Um, and so most of the penalties that we have here, yes, they can be silly or, or creative, but they definitely have an eye towards putting in the extra mileage, mm. going out and being penalized for failing an obstacle. So almost everything, if you're doing something like building Legos, you're doing that after you've done a loop. If you're carrying a bucket, you're going to get around a loop. There's a right. nice play, I think. It brings you it back to obstacle loop. proficiency rather than making it this is an obstacle course right it's not just who is a good runner absolutely that can then just yeah which feels appropriate right i know you know some some races do mandatory obstacle completion i think that works really well for those races but those races and other races do it like each race is individual and for this you couldn't have mandatory completion exactly here. 24 hour completion yeah. we would knock way too many runners out it's worth what people can pull out of the yeah. bag overnight did you say we have way too tough on as a penalty Way too tough. The obstacle at Dingleberries, that's as a matter of fact. 2014. Yeah. That's a, that's a throw. So throwback. what's way too tough? So way too tough is a overtly a bucket carry penalty. Um, however, the twist on it is there is a posted weight for the bucket, and you have to fill it yourself. Oh, you were telling me about this. Carry it around a penalty loop, and then you weigh it at the end. And if you're not within a certain amount of the posted weight, you have to either add more weight or dump weight out and run the penalty loop. Ooh. And you'll do that continuously until you fit the design. So my weight. only question about that was, do you do it in pounds or kilos for different This was a question when we did a quarter for the other. It is in pounds. <gasps> I did warn everybody in the race briefing that we would be doing it okay. at, um, <laughs> in, Imper in Imperial. So 2.2 2 pounds a, to a kilo, you just got to do more race math. A fair, fair chance to look up the conversions. Yeah. So in 2014, the kind of hack that the athletes came up with is after you know your, you do the thing and you know your weight is correct, you give that bucket to another athlete. Cheeky. So I don't know if that's allowed this year or if they've even thought that, because oh. very few of these athletes ran 2014, I'm sure. Yeah. So I don't know if they worked that out yet. Yeah, that's so cheeky. we did, I do recall that, and I was happy to cut that out. Okay. So... <laughs> When you run around and when you dump your bucket out, you've got to put so it So you have to dump pile. it before you finish. Okay. Yeah. What are some other of the... Um, we saw them pounding stakes into the ground as a penalty. I don't remember the obstacle. Um, That's uh, Swing and Tip. So it's it? the version of just the tip that we have here. Um, I was out there testing that earlier today, actually, to help dial it in a little bit. So it's instead of our normal just the tip obstacle where you've got a static overhead beam with little finger handholds on a 2 by 4 and some knobs in the middle to swing across, this one, the entire structure swings, so it's it free hanging. It's really it's like tough. People are struggling with it. Yeah, and the there's a, some new sort of handholds in the middle on that one as well. But it's a whole other dimension to that. Um, and the penalty for swinging tips is high stakes. So you have to run a penalty loop, but at the back half of that loop, there's a pile of stakes that are spray painted, and you have to pound the stake into the ground up to the spray painted line and pull it out. Um, if you break the stake, then you have to do ten burpees, get another stake, and resume. That's awesome. What and are are people, uh, can people reuse the old holes that people have? If they're into? clever and they get to it before we fill it in, <laughs> there's, one, there's one potential. <laughs> but we had to find, we had to look around quite a bit because it's very rocky soil in yeah. this venue. So we wanted to make it doable. Sure. Yeah. It's not challenging. I think that a hallmark of the courses you've done is they're very tough, but they're not unfair. And that's, and that's I think, as an athlete, as a runner on course, that's what you're hoping. You, you signed up for a tough race. But you want it to be, you know, achievable. A hundred percent. I never, there are certain things I don't like to put on course. I don't like to put mandatory electricity. I do like to put on electricity where you can avoid it with skill. I don't like games of chance on course because I don't like yeah. that. A, you know, this is 
a world championship race, and sure. I don't want anyone to have a more difficult time because they have bad like luck. The gambler rolling a dice. Exactly. You roll a one, you get the hard wall. You roll a six, you get the easy wall. Yes, exactly. You should be able to prepare for the race and do well, um, and then we can play with it from there. We have the challenges going on at the race center. Those are so fun. But so yeah, last year was it Golden Carabina? Yes. Is that happening again this year? So we do, no longer have the Golden Carabina route. So those challenges used to buy you access to a, a course cut. Um, that was only available to open racers in the past, but because we changed the rules around the categories this year so that open contender and elite contender are all one leaderboard, um, we didn't want to have different rules around the challenges. Yeah, so right. we turned those challenges over just to be an optional um, sort of gamification. So we have patches this year. Anyone can come and earn them. Every three hours, those challenges roll over, and they're just bragging rights and a fun little side twist to it. So they don't actually affect racing placement mileage or skipping obstacles it's for a cool patch exactly i, I, cool I would patch. go for a patch I like yeah patches. well you can swing by the race center later we already finished the hot sauce roulette <gasps> right now we're on a memory challenge oh, oh i love memory challenge all right well it's down there for you and then we're going to roll over to um ice buckets later so uh, let's take the camera down later and have a look at what they're all about one i ate more buffalo sauce than i think i've ever done in my life yes to get those carabiners. i think dustin nothing is spicy enough for him one of our guys with the cameras he would, he would have smashed that had we known. We'll bring him down. We'll bring him down. This year we went for less volume, more heat. Uh, I would get, in 2021, you take a shot glass, a small shot of buffalo sauce to get a golden carabiner. And it would mess up your stomach for like a mile and a half. Fun. You'd be tired and just killing you. So that's, that's fun. They're still there, but they don't affect the race. That's good. Exactly. Yeah, we took it out of the race there. But yeah, I think to your point, I, planning a fair course is what it's all about. We can make this plenty interesting, plenty creative, plenty fun without making it a joke or yes. you know a gimmick it's you keeping the silliness which tough mudder is known for and people love but keeping the conversation as well and yeah. it's, it's good it must be a difficult balance yeah it's important that we maintain the integrity of the race you know we never want somebody to not put up an amazing performance because we're doing something too goofy that's unfair sure. um, or anything like that so you know we'll see how it shakes out it's always amazing after the race to see what the unknown thing was that uh is what everyone's talking about. You know, something yeah. that seemed innocuous ends up being the most challenging obstacle on the course. Sure. Or there's a penalty that everybody's sort of raving about or complaining about, rather. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting. It's always fun to see what they talked heard, about. Have you heard any of those rumbles yet? Um, not too much yet. You know, we still have a couple obstacles that aren't open yet. Um, so I'll be interested to see. I haven't really gotten much back at the, back at the tent yet. Sure. I guess it's early enough. It's not super cold, so people are cruising through, and a lot of folks now are just hitting the obstacles for the first time. Mm. But I'll be fascinated to see. I think Dingleberry's, in, to my mind, is probably the hardest we'll have out there. Okay. I mm. think, um, but it depends. Some people just have strengths in you know some areas and, and less than others. You said the Dingleberry feels it's pretty good. Way too tough, but okay. it's quite long. Okay, it's quite long. Um, there's a few long ones out there. The grappler penalty is quite long as well. Mm. Um, so that one pays, you know, certainly to, to get it up there. Um, what's um, what's the deal with uh, Statue of Liberty? So Statue of Liberty, um, when we were mapping out the course on Thursday for that bypass, that was meant to open overnight and bypass Augustus Glue while it was open. When we were testing the water route through there, it just wasn't going to be safe to run people through it. But so we reverted it back um, to keep the, the main daytime course open through there. Okay. That was a bummer. It's really cool. Um, it would have been cool here to be able to see it, but ultimately you've got to keep people yeah. safe. And we finished, figured there'd be enough of a spectacle up on top of that hill with Coach's Corner. Um, he's got a lot of lasers, a lot of lights up there. So once the sun goes down, I think we'll be able to see him for miles around. Yeah, we need to get some cameras up to Coach's Corner so we can see that going as well. What else you got on your clipboard there? What's good? We uh, had some rule questions to ask, didn't we? I can't remember what they are now. What's up? Did we have some rules questions we wanted to ask? I don't remember. No, I don't either. We said some blessed Chris. Yes. Well, you know where to find me. Um, we've done a couple other great ones. Uh, well clung. That's a variation on well swung. Sure. Out to the net. That'll be really interesting to see how that plays with time. We were just actually tweaking the distance to that net a little earlier to make sure that, that athletes could reach it. From there, you the strength to grab onto it and climb down. Well flung reminds me, in a way, of double rainbow. Yes. In that, if you're successful, you don't get wet. Yes. Which, not as bad when it's a little warmer out, but still overnight when you've been in and out of those pits over and over and over again, staying dry is one of the greatest things. Um, and it's just a fun extra twist to it. Um, so that would be really great. Um, that's got the penalty with the log carrying the egg, which is 
just lots of fun, keeping those eggs intact. The log carry and the egg? Yes. Okay. Egg in one hand, log in the other hand. Um, carry it around the loop. If you smash smash up your egg, you need to do it again. So there's a few of those where there's the opportunity to repeat the penalty multiple times if you fail at the penalty. Do you have to do it until you get a, a good egg? Like a successful Correct. egg? Yes. Oh, okay. Wow. Similarly, um, we have barrel chested. So that's our version of dingleberries here. There's a barrel right in the middle of the slack line that you're climbing under. Um, if you fall in the water on that one, you have to carry a water balloon on a paper plate around a loop. And oh. if you smash your balloon, uh, you have to do the penalty again. So there's the potential there if, um, you know, especially later in the race, people are getting tired and just a little bit beer um, for, for things to turn on you. So we'll see. I'm, gonna, I'm fascinated to see um, what happens later once everything's open. And Amazing. I think that's going to change things a lot. It will be. Yeah. Chris, maybe we'll find you again when it gets uh, middle of the night. And, yes. Uh, that's, that's why. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. Thank you both. Bye. Chris Baldy, World's Toughest Butter Race Director. Interesting. Interesting how it changes and develops every year. And it's. It's really nice when racers listen to the people who are taking part and listen to the athletes and, and work accordingly. And I like Chris. He seems really, really eager to get it right. Yeah, and Chris, he has been working for, for Tough Butter for but he also is a, a runner for the course. He finished with 90 miles one year. He's, uh, oh yeah, we got fourth place in 2017. So, and I remember that year, I know he's done it before too. I, also in 2015 in Las Vegas, he finished sixth with 80 miles. I remember before the race started, they told us at the at the race briefing mm -hmm. or the you know, pre-race, like 11:30, you're going to shoot. The Eli and Nolan, two members of Team HQ, were given the briefing, mm -hmm. and they said, "Just so you guys know, there's we have an employee that's running the course, and if he wins or if he if he, if he wins prize money, he's got to donate the prize money or it'll go to the next person or whatever." But they kind of gave us a heads up that one of their guys was running and he had a chance to do some damage. So and that was Chris Baldy wow. back, back in the day. And now he's designed the whole thing. So.
Let's have a quick look at some of your comments coming through on YouTube. Uh, let's also have a quick look at the leaderboards and see if anything has changed. So top five men with 40 miles, eight laps, Michael Scott, Joshua Fiore, not far behind him, Tyler Veerman, Isaac Sampson, Austin Azar, and then we have James Burton, Christian Brown Johnson, Scotty Campbell, Grant Thompson, and Connor Moran at 35 miles. And in the women, Stephanie Bland, Kelly Schweihart, Chris Rogoski, Katie Knight, Nikki Karamba, Jenny Overstreet, top six, all with seven laps, uh, 35 miles. And then Hannah Carter, Robin Costa, Sarah Tucker, and Marie Waldman rounding off the top ten there. Uh, is the rope throw a penalty? No, so the rope throw that you have been seeing on screen, let's see if we've got it somewhere to show you. There we go. Picture in, picture coming up. This obstacle here, actually let's make that a main one right now. The obstacle, Apla. that's an old obstacle that's been brought back. Um, the athletes have a, like a baseball on a rope and they have to throw and it falls into kind of like a wooden funnel and then they pull themselves up the hill. You have three attempts on that obstacle. If you don't get it within three attempts, there is a big penalty loop, a really big penalty loop, like 0.75 mile penalty loop. It's looking much darker on some parts of the course than others. Uh, we're at the finish line where the sun is going down and it looks, it's kind of bright here, but in other places, it's starting to look really dark. Night Ops started two hours ago. So people out on the course uh, should be having just about everyone wearing a head torch and a, um, a little light on your back. So we just had Chris Malt here, co-race director of World's Toughest Mudder, talking about some of the penalty loops and some of the obstacles and some of the choices behind what they've done. We'll try and get him back later, but if not, we can still try and ask him questions. So. If you do have any questions, do send them over and we'll try and get them asked as soon as we can. Uh, we're coming up to hour seven. At hour eight, uh, the live feed will switch to a different channel. But right now, we are still on this one for another hour. Good luck, Team UK. Loving the coverage of the event this year. Thank you very much. Good luck, Team UK out there. Let's have a quick look at the top 10. We had James Burton as a UK athlete. He's uh, sixth place, seven laps, 35 miles at 5.55. Let's have a look where he is coming in. What was the last obstacle he was seen at? James Burton was last seen at Spunky Monkey at 6.52. Uh, so he should be finishing this lap in, what, the next 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes? Hard to tell. Is that Jason? 
So it's 7 o'clock p.m., World's Toughest Mudder 2023. The night ops are well underway. Every athlete you see out there should have their headlamp on, should have a flasher on. If they don't have a flasher, they'll have a glow stick, a siloom stick, like that guy that just went over the uh, fence crossing. Now is when it starts to get – it starts to set in. It starts to get real. You think, I've been running for seven hours, and I'm not even a third of the way done. And if you think about that, it will crush you. It will crush you. As someone going over to Little Toes right now, and they're about to go into ah, splash. splash, in they go. You know, we have watched, I don't know how many athletes on Twinkle Toes, attempts Pink Twinkle Toes, and I feel like the success rate is incredibly low. I mean, that is standard, I feel, for a balance beam, even the simplest of balance beams people really struggle with, but this is a tricky one. It's slippy, and it's thin, and it's wobbly. Amelia Boone was in the booth uh, about an hour ago, three-time world champion. <laughs> Three time world champion, Amelia Boone. She said that Amelia Boone is world's toughest mother. She, when they hold world's toughest mother, they have to pay a uh, a fee to uh, Amelia Boone because she owns the race. Um, <laughs> she said that she like one of the reasons she likes balance beam obstacles or balance obstacles like that is because she thinks they level the playing field. That women are better at those type of obstacles. What do you think of that? I would agree. Um, men just kind of stomp through life, don't they? So yeah. Men just kind of stomp through life. And it requires, you know, some delicacy and some noticing where you're going and maybe just the smaller feet help. Who knows? You can't really stomp through twinkle toes. No, you gotta to twinkle through twinkle toes. So this is this is a a fun part. I say a fun part. It's fun looking back on it. It's fun from where we're sitting. You're seven hours into the race, you're not even a third of the way through. Mentally it's got dark dramatically quickly. Fast. Yeah. 30 minutes ago, it wasn't this dark. No, it's, it's dark now. Like, you, we have, there's runners that's finishing James laps. Burton, there's James Burton going through on his... Uh... And if they don't have a headlamp on, you can't see them at all. They're, like, invisible. <coughs> James Burton just crossed there. We have six athletes, 40 miles or more. It was interesting talking to Amelia about the predictions. It was interesting talking to her. She's, I, I feel like, between you and me. Uh, I, I think she wanted to say three. Yeah. But she didn't. So remind me uh, what I said earlier. I, I, I think these are predictions. These are, hey, this is possible. Two hours ago at five o'clock, we were talking about. You said four what, men. What we what is possible to happen? You said four men race. will get 110. Eight men.
will get 100. Four women will get 100. And Will will be Chris. I said two women will get 100 and two women will get 90 or above. I would like to see 105, but saying two women will get 100. Wait, did I count. say one woman's going to get 105? No. Oh, okay. I would like to that say 105, is... but me, I'm, I'm also going to quantify me saying two women will get 100 is not counting out one of those women getting 105. Right. I'm going to say a minimum of 100. I would like to see 105, but I'm not putting money on it. Sure. Hypothetical non existent money. Get some shots of the uh, the pit area. This is kind of the the quick pit area. Now the quick pit is doesn't officially open until later tomorrow morning, but this is where members of the pit crew are along the the chute between the finish line and the start line, and their athletes will come see. Uh, What's quick pit? And some of them are like a lot of them are family. People mm -hmm. bring their parents. They bring their kids. They bring. You gotta imagine having that kind of parental support. You know, what? I I would. Oh. <laughs> Um, I had my dad come out one time. My aunt came out to pit for me. Jeez. Uh, Ian Hosek, um, <coughs> OCR athlete there, working in the pit crew. Coach, Coach you, Hosek this weekend. When you cross the finish line, there is a about, a, I don't know, an eighth of a mile from the finish line to the start line. And during that... 50 during, meters. During that distance is what you're looking at right now. You run along this, this barrier and... They can hand you stuff. Now, the, the pit crew can only help you when you are in the pit area. Once you have crossed the start line, before you, you can see the start line in the distance there, The all the pit areas off to the right, all of the race tent, our, our uh, broadcast booth, everything else kind of work-ish for the race is on the left side of the race, or left side of the chute. The pit crew can only help you when you are in the pit area. Oops. So, but earlier we saw, like... Um... Chris stopping right there at the end of the barriers. Uh, so I say in the pit area, after the finish line, before the start line, the pit crew can help you in there. Now they're they're being kind of liberal. Even on if it's the, on the other side of the fence. Now the actual pit area, yes, is on the other side of the fence, but between area between laps, you're, they're allowed to be assisted. Okay. So the, the quick pit will set up like usually it's right in front of this barrier that the, the your spec that we're seeing right now. This is very. This is a good example. DJ Fox there on the left, reigning champion. We had it in the booth already. There's uh, Javier Escobar next to him. Um, I, I'm trying to make out the athlete they're helping. Can't see the athlete. It's hard with that headlamp, right? That might be Christian Brown Johnson. Yeah, that's that's CBJ, I believe. He's a hundred miler, past hundred miler. We expect him to do a hundred again tonight. You expect him to do hundred and seventy. 170? With your predictions, yeah. <laughs> I think the, the tw I need to look it up. There is a record for 24 hours. Oh, that was not Christian Brown Johnson. There, the, look at this. This is, okay, that's actual, that's what they're eating. <laughs> Nutrition, I, we talked about this with somebody else. Nutrition is the most individualized, that is Christian Brown Johnson. Nutrition is the most individualized part of the race. Like, what works for one person will not work for somebody else. DJ Fox is telling us he prefers liquid nutrition. He's the, he's like, like nutrition. Um, I mean, I don't think I could take on enough liquid oh, nutrition. Oh, Descent. That's what it sounds like. Who's, who's Descent? I don't know Descent. Um, Javier Escobar was assigning, was writing bib names on athletes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We saw some things that we are not allowed to Some of them were earlier. not safe for work. Descent is, is the uh, cleanest one I saw. I did, I did take a picture, and it's hilarious, but we're not allowed to share it. Yeah, Christian Brown Johnson. Um, he needs to get out of there, though. That's a long pit stop for someone running 100 miles. <laughs> but you see him when he goes, he's gone. He takes off. Off he drops. And that's Javier Woo! and DJ Fox. Uh, elite athletes, both also troublemakers, but... Yeah, absolutely. Well regarded. The First kid. thing he said to me when I saw him, we're getting drunk on Sunday. I was like, I will be at the ball court. Yes, drink it. Drink it. There's a shot of that screen actually has our live feed on there. It's, uh, you're going to get a little inception here in a second when the uh, feed catches up. <laughs> You'll see a shot of the shot. You can also see the delay that's inherent there. It's about a five second delay. Here is the TMHQ race center. This is not us, so we get a lot of people running past us. A lot of people looking bags, at us. So they're like, nope, not us. Keep going. Yep. It'd be quite Those, sad if we were that. No. Those are the race results. 
they're updated here on the screen for people that want to uh if you are looking for your athletes race results there's the bibs looking for your athletes race results go to our instagram that is a 20 no it is a 25 mile bib and well, it's silver that's i'm gonna i'm gonna walk down there and look at that you that's should new. because i said that and you're like no well i i did say I, if i'm wrong i apologize and there's another bib I, I talked about there's three kinds of bibs there's really multiple bibs there's a bib there's mileage bibs there's a sprint bib but generally there's three three bibs and then you see uh more of that start shoot so let's go back to some obstacles here's the grappler grappler is a difficult obstacle because there's a skill aspect to it the you can see on the right the athlete has it um looped up there you have to loop it up there's a baseball attached to the end of that rope and you have to Swing it up and land the baseball in a, in a basically a V-shaped slot so that you can sum up the hill. You have three attempts. If you fail all three attempts, then you have to do the penalty. A very long penalty, move. which we've heard is Point seven five mile. So we've got more obstacles opening in the next forty-eight minutes at eight o'clock. Well, clung. And hanging the rough open. We just had some open at seven o'clock. Everest and barrel chested. Everest no, is Everest finally six, open. No, barrel chested. Barrel chested and Augustus. Looking at the uh, the comments on YouTube here, we're gonna see if we can pull them up in a bit here, but. Anke says, having 300 milers or above as your pit crew is pretty crazy. Anke, you are not wrong. Um, and that, you know what? That's one of the cool things. We talked about this a little bit already. But it's the cool thing about the community is uh, DJ Fox literally won the race last year. He's recovering from a 400-mile um, a run attempt that he was trying to do in Colorado. And so he didn't. He wasn't up for running this year. And, uh, and now he's running. Javier Escobar, another 100-miler. Javier actually literally just walked in the tent while I'm talking about him. Oh. Got, Javier, we got a comment on YouTube. Having 300 milers or above your pit crew is pretty crazy. Oh, Javier, yeah. We saw, you, we saw you pitting for Christian Brown Johnson over there. How's he doing? Oh, he's doing great right now. Um, you know, I think uh, around mile 30, feeling a little <laughs> offish. Um, but, you know, we gave him some advice, or at least I gave him some advice. Um, when you start to kind of start to focus in on like little things that start aching you and start bothering you. It's important to really kind of focus in on other athletes and support. Um, you know, it kind of does two things, right? You get that like goal, um, cheering from other people and you also feel good because you're helping your people along the course. And, you know, everyone appreciates that as well. Um, you know, he's, he's definitely looking strong. He's a very, uh, he got over that little dark period now. He's in a very good place. Um, and yeah, he's just he's just gonna have to carry that through to to the very end. So we had a couple of strategies in there for him. That is standing advice because when you a race like this, at some point, whether it's seven p.m. or whether it's seven, you're gonna get some niggles, right? Yeah. Like something is gonna hurt, something's gonna ache. And when when you focus, when you think about, it, like you said, it's almost like a selfish thing. Like, yeah, oh, this hurts me. This yeah. when you're like, I gotta help this guy up the wall. Or I gotta help him pull his like. It's not that it doesn't hurt anymore, but your brain is not thinking about it. Right, yeah, and, and it almost becomes like an instantaneous meme that, you know, you just can't stop thinking about, right? And and you just continue to focus in on a particular thing. And then, and then, you know, people oftentimes talk about, like, the dark place that you get into, and, and that's that's exactly what it is. It's just like you, your, your mind gets in a, 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 it's just a repetitive state of just focusing in on negative thoughts. And it's like, you, there, there are things you can do to kind of break the cadence of that. And like I said, I think the best thing you can do is just kind of support everyone else out there on the course. It's you know seven p.m. kind of early to be in a dark place mentally. Yeah. Was he? How will he be doing? You, you know, you know, you know what morning? happens, right? Is that th those first couple of laps that that you do, um, you, you're going at somewhat of a blistering pace, and when you start to notice that your pace is going from like fifty minutes to an hour to an hour five, that kind of starts to eat away at you because you're like, man. Like, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going fast enough. So you start getting some of those thoughts in your head. Um, yeah, and, but it's it's not it, – it's weird. There are some years where, you know, I've gone into a dark place 
um, you know, 12 hours into the race, there are years where I have gone, I have not even, you know, experienced a dark place at all. So, um, you know, it's, it, I don't, there's a, a, a right or wrong for that, you know. So I don't think it's too early. And, you know, it's probably not too late. It's funny because we do this race, not that it's artificial, but it's like it's a created thing that we choose to sign up for, we choose to do it, and we know sometime during the race we're probably going to get to this. But, like, in our lives, like, in real life, we can go through these years where we're in, like, a, a philosophers call it a dark night of the soul. Yeah. Where, like, this really sucks. Yeah. And, like, and the thing about real life is, like, it's not over in 24 hours. Like, yeah. this is, I'm here for the duration. Yeah. So it's 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 cool that we, in a microcosm we can kind of learn le- little, learn little lessons yeah. from a 24-hour race that we can take to real life and apply out there. Absolutely. You know, I think, um, I, you know, I've spoken to several of my friends and they asked me about, you know, the, the racing aspect of things. And I said, look, this thing translates into real life, you know. And, it, um, you know, in terms of, like, to your point, right, so you, you're kind of prepared that you understand, oh, shit, it, this is going to be a dark period and I just need to kind of weather the storm, you know. And, you know, the highs are highs, the lows are lows. So when, when you when you start to, like, kind of get out of that and you get in rhythm and a good cadence and a happy place, you learn to appreciate it more. Um you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, this, I think this race definitely prepares or it accelerates the, the learning process that otherwise, if you hadn't experienced something like this, it takes, you know, for some people a lifetime and for other people that go through a lot of uh, things in their life, um, you know, it, it happens in a much shorter time frame. But this this definitely is a good staple and a good learning experience for, for anybody. What's cool about another thing I love about World Stuff is, is you know something's going to go wrong. Yep. You know, at some point you're going to want to quit probably yep. even like hundred milers. Like I, I can imagine like, you're like, I ran a hundred miles last year. I have nothing to prove to anyone. Why am I doing, why am I here at six thirty in the morning? I have, you know, I have no loved ones here. Like, who am I trying to impress? Like it, we know there's going to be down like terrible parts and we know like eventually it's going to get better. We just got to like wait it through. And that 100% translates over to real life. Yeah. Like, real life. Like, People die. Friends die. We end up in the hospital. We yep. see like injuries happen, or loved ones like betray us, or what? Like sometimes stuff life can really suck sometimes. Yeah. But literally, it's just like world stuff. Is eventually it's gonna get better. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know I think I think um, you bring up, up a good point of like people that that uh, have gone through this race for like a couple of laps and whatnot, or um, have have contended and have achieved like 100 plus miles and stuff like that you take someone like ryan atkins right who's like he has no reason right when when he first started doing this thing and he had, he had no reason to come back the second year or even trevor psychos actually which is better actually a better example um he has no reason to be out here right now you know he just started a family he has a lot going on you know but he's out and he's he's been the world champ several times over several hundred mile finishes but he's He's still out here. He's still grinding. He's still getting after it, um, you know. And it's just, just it just kind of speaks to, to some people's willpower and their nature is that you know nothing, you know, adversity. We can get through it, you know, with just a little bit of motivation and a little bit of drive and stuff. So Trevor is such a great example. He's run 100 miles or more six years in a row. Yeah, like that's the longest streak by. No one else has more than two years in a row. So do, do you guys know that he has a he has a WTM like mileage goal? A total mileage goal. So this is what I've heard. Uh-huh. He's told me I've heard a thousand miles. Yes. Lifetime. Yes. Do you know where he is right now? Uh, this would probably be like around maybe five fifty, six hundred ish. He's at eight seventy five. Oh. So. Um, he's at the tail end. <laughs> he's closer to the end than the beginning. Yeah. So I. Uh, and, and that would be a major loss, I think, for this. For this. I'm kind of hoping no one tells him how close he is. Yeah. Maybe yeah. He, if he thinks he's at five hundred, <laughs> then. We get a few more years out of them. I, you know, I think I think if I can get back into this uh, next year um, and and, re- and be in some some level of contention, sure, I can bring him out of that shell and you know, yeah, just talk a substantial amount of. Uh, I don't snack. expect him to run 125 this year, so I feel like we'll get one more year out of him for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let me let me double check those numbers, but I'm pretty sure that's that's where he's at. So yeah, you've run 100 miles twice, two times, yes. But you 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 also ran a third time before that, right? Uh, I, what, what do you mean? Like, like, you don't have just the 200 mile finishes. Like, how, how many mile, how many times have you run World Summit? Oh, I ran it, uh, so I've started running World Summit Mudder in 2016. Okay. Yep. And that first year, I ran, uh, 35 miles. 
okay. with absolutely no training and no idea what the hell I was getting myself into. I actually signed up for this race drunk because um, I didn't have the courage to do it <laughs> otherwise. Dude, that's the second best World's Toughest Motor sign-up story I've heard today. Oh, yeah. You know the first best? What's that? Giles yeah. told me there was a guy, a Spartan guy here for the World's Toughest Motor event, and he's got an unbreakable pass. Yeah. So he's like, oh, yeah, the race. Like, I'm here this weekend. Might as well. Yeah. He shows up this morning and finds out it's a 24-hour race. Oh, wow. He had no idea. Yeah. So he just showed up, like, oh, yeah, race starts at noon, and now he's he's out there somewhere running around. Do we know his name? I gotta again? find out. I yeah, gotta yeah, find yeah. out. But that's that's pretty well. That's that's. You incredible. signed up when you were drunk. Yeah. And yeah. you ran. And you know what? Whatever it takes to get somebody to sign up the first. Like I'm not encouraging you know anyone to go out there and drink, but I'm encouraging you to sign up. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, it's it's like I I'd, I'd seen a couple of YouTube videos on it. Obviously, it scared the living crap out of me. Um, you know, the the mileage and the time and all this other stuff. But sure. You know, I'm I'm kind of like all in type person. So I was um yeah. you know signed up for it, and you know. They, there's there's a thing to be said about like pride and stuff like that because I was like I you know I, I'm better than this race I know what I'm doing I'm gonna go out here I'm gonna crush it like blah 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 sure and you know after failing miserably um, the first time around only getting 35 miles which is which is a pretty good year because they like that year in particular people were walking to 50 okay. like without any issue so 2016 you know, in Vegas 2016 yeah. in Vegas yeah because they even like the obstacles got easier as the time went on overnight yeah I so that. there was like no excuses for you not to at least get 50 miles of that race I, I just, did not get 50 there either oh dude you didn't I got I think 25 or 30 my second oh, really? year yeah oh shit so yeah <laughs> what no, happened I, no shame in that game I yeah. get it yeah. no I what I did is I put my wetsuit on way too early yeah I overheated not oh. that it's an excuse you gotta get 50 but yeah anyway no I get it yeah. You know, it happens, right? And uh, so, yeah, and then, the you know, from there, 2017, you know, I, I, I hired a coach. Um, I was definitely much more prepared, and I made a pretty big jump from 65 to, I mean, from 35 to 60. Um, and, and then in 2018, I broke top 10 um, with 80 miles. And 2018 was a brutal year to kind of get uh, any sort of mileage. I mean, Wait, you had 80 in 2018? In 2018, yeah. that was Atlanta. That was Atlanta. Super cold, and we got well, there was like frost warnings and 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 all sorts of things were happening at yeah. that race. Um, enough, right? It, like after that race ended, I couldn't feel my fingertips. I work in a hospital, right? I work in healthcare, so I went to nurses and I said, "Hey, can you tell me what's wrong?" I was like, "They're always tingling," and she's like, "Oh, you got frostbite," and I'm like, "Oh, really?" <laughs> I was like, "I didn't know that," <laughs> and uh, and yeah, so that that kind of like you know that took me through 2018, and then um. 2019 is when I broke 100. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I don't think I've ever talked too much about this, but I, you know, I think with the level of controversy in 2019, with all of the uh, the things, um, that's why in 21, I, like I was like pushing hard because I was like I need to prove to myself that it wasn't because of the bands or or because of like everything else that was happening on the course, right? I was I said. Because everybody, you know, at, at, I think after that event, there was a lot of controversy and stuff. Um, so in 21, you know, I set out and I was like, all right, I'm going to run at least 100 miles under 24 hours. And that was my goal. Sure. And I think I came in in like 23 something, yeah. you know, and then uh, DJ, that piece of crap, passed me like around mile 99 and just completely broke my soul. <laughs> broke uh, your soul. Yeah. That was 2021. Yep, 2021 in Laughlin. You finished 100 miles in 22 hours and 57 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, DJ Pashton took that podium it, spot. He just, no, he literally, he took my soul. Mile 99, it, it hurt. Mile so, 99. 99. That is painful. And passed me, I was like, That nah, is painful. 100 yeah, miles is the finish line. I was, see, you know, that that was like, I I, I, had, I had hit a pretty, like, that, that last lap, I was in a pretty low. Uh, at a pretty low point, and then when he came, like when I saw him, and he just kept inching and inching and inching, and then I just kept getting in my head, and then eventually he's just he's like, "Hey, what's up, dude? Great uh, job!" Gives me uh, a handshake. Uh, 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 like fuck you. <laughs> yeah, and he deserves it. You know, DJ is a sweetheart. You know, we had a, a, actually him and I knew each other before that race even, because um, I was hanging out with uh, like Joshua Reed and him and stuff like that. Um, and we were running the mountains all summer long. So, yeah, good guy, man. Love him. And then, uh, and then he won it last year, the next year after that. Yeah, yeah. So I pitted for uh, for for well, I mean, a winner, right? So hopefully, I'm I'm trying to replicate the win. <laughs> yeah. Again this year. 
Well, I was telling Amelia Boone the same thing, Lit. I uh, hope to see you out there next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get back out there. Um, you know, just just working through this ankle injury, and uh, you know, I actually got some um, some good PTs over here that gave me some some more advice on what oh, to nice. do with it. Yeah. So uh, hopefully, you know, with with uh, pending nothing crazy happening, I should sure. be back out. Even even if I'm out here just to kind of run the course and be out here for the time being contention, but. You know, get you know, bring some rust over, and uh, and then see what happens the year after that. You wrote a really good article for the OCR report about how you got to 100 miles. Yeah, and the short the short version, if I was to summarize it in one sentence, it's lift a little less, run a little more. Yes, like you, and I, I've told people this, and I, I think it's good advice. People will help you over obstacles. Yes, but you have to physically. No one's going to carry you 100 miles. No, no one's going to carry you 50 miles. No. Like you have to physically move your body around the course, yeah. and that requires time on feet, requires miles, requires running, or straight. Yeah, yeah, and and you know it's it's a hundred miles sounds daunting, right? Um, it's a very difficult uh, thing to get to, but it's just a, it's a matter of moving. And I think Ryan Atkins said it best: is like, how do you run hundred miles? It's one mile at a time, you know. And it's like you can't be thinking about, oh, I'm at mile forty nine, or I'm at mile fifty, fifty one, or whatever. It's just like you know, you got to keep keep going through, man. Yeah. Twenty four hours is like a lot of time. But you only have 24 hours. Yeah, like that's it, and then you can't run this race again until next year. Yeah, so you gotta keep moving. Yeah, and I think by by midnight, you know, I think for 100 miles, you gotta be at least at 65, 70 ish miles. So is that is that kind of like with, with your elite circles? Is that what you? Guys you know, I, I think by by midnight, if you're 65, 70 miles, you're in a good place to, okay. to hit 100 miles. Because things just really start to slow down after that, and then you know, once the sun comes up, you start to you know develop some more pace and some more speed sure hopefully you save some bands and you can kind of like strategically utilize them for obstacles but yeah hey let's look at the get your, your thoughts on where they're at right now and what you think we could be looking at for final to like mile maybe not specific names but like look at this we have we have eight guys eight guys with 40 miles or more at 7 30. yeah really some of them at 6 30. yeah michael shot and joshua fiore will probably be coming in soon Finishing that forty-fifth mile. Yeah. Um, what do you? How many of those? I think we could. Have, this is. I'm not predicting it. Yeah. But it's possible. We could have eight hundred milers. Here's why. Here's why. So you've heard the, th the thing about ten p.m. If whatever mileage you want by twelve noon the second day, you need to have half of that by ten p.m. the first yep. day. So if these guys have fifty miles by, 10, I think we could have a couple. In the history of World Steps Mutter, we've had three people, three finishes, 110 or higher. Yeah. We had, we had two 110s and one 115. Yeah. I think we could have two 115s tomorrow. Two more. You know, I, I, I don't. Oh, sorry, 110s. Two more 110s. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with you um, just because, um, you know, kind of walking out on the course and, and actually observing some of the obstacles, there was nothing, you know, there's no real big feature obstacles that really consume your time to get up and over. Um, and everything's and the terrain is very conducive to some fast running. There's maybe two to three hundred feet of elevation gain throughout this entire course, and you're sure. running primarily on gravel. Uh, so it, again, I think I think this I would say that this course is easier than uh, 2021. And how many hundred miles did we have in 2021? Six. Yeah, the sand uh, the sand areas in 2021 really killed a lot of first people. mile and a half. Yeah. 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 It's just, you know, you're just kind of running through that. I was like, you have none of that over here. So sure. it's just like, you're just pure. If you can lock in a good cadence, um, then, then yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, we might have 10 people hitting hundred plus miles. I hope they brought some Yeah. 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 I'm like, <laughs> I'm Hey like, friend, let's look at the, the women's top 10. See what, uh, and the women, we have seven women, 35 miles or more. We could have multiple. We had last year. Chris was the first woman to hit 100 miles. Yeah. We could have. Chris is in third place right now. We could have multiple women hit 100 miles this year. Yeah. Chris permanently moved, pushed the bar up. Forever. Correct. I mean, if you kind of look at the top two, three, and four, five, and six, uh, you know, their timing isn't too too bad. It seems like they might be running together and supporting each other through some of this. Um, yeah. Very well. I mean, we might have four women, five women. That we'll hit on this year. They're pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a great yeah. year. There's um, a lot of hundred milers here that aren't running. Yeah. Like you, DJ. I'm sure there's more I'm not thinking of. But guys out there, Chris. Chris is out. So. 
Is oh, Mendoza. Mendoza. Yeah, He's Mendoza's done. out. Yeah. Done, done? Done, done, yeah. He, he came by and he told us that his stomach was really hurting him. Yeah, he's he's just been yeah he's been dealing with some gastric issues, which is very unfortunate. You yeah. think he'll go out for a finisher lab just for kicks? Or yeah, for sure. I mean, he's definitely you know towards the end, you know, a couple of his uh, patriots there, like Chris, Katie, and them that he's going to go out and most likely support. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Fuck sure. out of here. We'll uh we'll go over and talk to him about that. But Chris, we're getting word Chris Mendoza may be out for the rest of the race. Not, yeah, not contending this year. Shame. Javier. Well, it's been a pleasure. I'm sure I'll come join you a little bit later. My pleasure. Yeah, come by. Yeah, man. man. All right. Go back. Good talk. Javier Escobar, third place finisher, multiple 100-mile runner, world's toughest mother. Javier Escobar, thanks much. So I just took a little wander down whilst you were chatting to him, and I can confirm there is a silver 25-mile bit. Okay. But it's for adaptive athletes. So there you go. So we were both wrong. And both right. You know what? Now that you mentioned that, I remember they brought that 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 debuted last year, the 25 mile adaptive athlete bib. Jesse Strahan and her whole team earned that bib last year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that is true. That's very exciting, and I'm glad they have that. So yeah. I remember seeing it. I just it wasn't for what I thought it was. For. Traditionally, the 75 mile bib is the silver one. So that's yeah. Let's we'll go. Sure, we've not talked about it in a long time. Tell me. Low teams teams. top ten: D Fit Black and Crazy Divas, and Cristelli Fitness. They're putting some space. Those three uh-huh. look like, again, we're still, you know, a third, maybe it's a third-ish, eight hours would be a third of the way into the race. But they have a three-lap lead on fourth place. So, good for them. D-Fit Black, Frasian and Divas, and Cristelli Fitness. I just uh, saw Giles whilst I was out there, and he was okay. saying, you know, they've been busy, and he's not been keeping an eye on things, and what, what's it looking like about our... We won't call them a prediction. He was like, yeah, looking at the numbers, maybe. He said it'll come by. Stop stop by and see us again at some point. But Did you tell him we opened the Pringles for him? I completely forgot about the Pringles. Giles, that if you're listening, we have the Pringles. That would have brought him over. It would have, wouldn't it? We learned tonight the president of Tough Mudder really likes Pringles. So. Don't tell the president of Spartan, though. No, no. I mean, also don't tell the president of Spartan how much junk food I'm sitting here eating. Every time the camera mic goes quiet or you hear a little... I'm just chewing on what what Dustin called my bougie trail. So we are almost a third of the way through the race. Already? It's a 24-hour race. That's a long race. But man, it's only 24 hours long. (laughs) We look forward to it all year long, and we're already a third of the way through it. It's crazy, isn't it? It's suddenly everything feels very different now. It's dark. Like, it's changed entirely. Before it was just the afternoon. It was, I mean, it must have only been less than two hours ago that I was having to cover my legs because I was getting sunburned. Now I've got full leggings. Yeah, five thirty. Yeah, it's remarkable hoodie. how fast it happened. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it is dark. You can see looking at the cameras. It's dark out there. We lost light fast. So we are getting cameras moved. Uh, just as a reminder, in twenty-five minutes the stream will switch. I'm not sure if we need to do anything, but. Jason will sort it out if you do. So now's a good time to just save the link. Oh, you were on. Oh, poor guy. He was on the downhill. That's that's a shame. He did the hard part. <laughs> you fall in the water, it's, it's a penalty for him. So youtube.com slash the OCR report. We'll have the next stage of our 24-hour stream. YouTube.com slash the OCR report. We'll tell you that multiple times over the next 25 minutes here. We absolutely will. So we're um, just out, out moving some cameras, uh, trying to get something to Everest, probably off Mudderhorn, and one of our cameras out there is died. Uh, but we'll get them updated. Jason is, God knows how many miles Jason's going to have done by the end of the night. So looking at some YouTube comments here, Noel Medina says, we were talking about how it feels different in the dark. He says it feels different at home, too. He had to turn the lights on. Oh, no. So thanks, Noel. Uh, you know what? No, you, what you could do is just turn the lights off and kind of be in the dark here with us. But you could sit outside and weigh yourself. What was it that Chris was saying? Oh, when the weather's nicer, it's nice to get to be outside. And I was like, um, excuse me, where do you go overnight when we're all sitting outside and the athletes are running? Do you go to a cozy caravan? You should be outside all night. Uh, Noel, in fact, what I would recommend is you go get a headlamp and a flasher uh-huh. and just, uh, you know, wear that around and turn all the lights off in your house. Uh-huh. And Open the windows. Keep the feet on. Watch this on YouTube. 
But that's the only light. And then uh, send us a picture at the OCR report. Elmer King won the, oh, news on Elmer King actually from Noel. Won the Tillington Ultra, a handful of other Ultras and Mudders this year. Uh, JJ5 Gamer. I'm just here watching because some people I know are staffing. Is it just me or is the um, the British crowd gone quiet? I thought you were staying with us all night, guys. If you're still with us, can you um, can you let us know? Because uh, it kind of feels like you're gone to bed. How was our 24-hour crew? Exactly. Um, you want those stickers. You've you got to be Kim. checking in with us like yeah. every hour at least. You know what? Okay, so next year that's what we should do. We should, if you're going to watch for 24 hours... And you get a free sticker. We need like a comment every thirty minutes or something, like every thirty minutes on the half. Screenshots. Or, or um, an Instagram check-in and tag us on Instagram every half hour. <laughs> there you go. All right, so we're on the honor system this year for everyone who's watching us for all twenty-four hours straight. Next year we'll have a system to uh, all it. night long. All night Lee. long. Good to have you. Lee, are you going to come out and do a um, come and do a world's toughest mud up? Martin's watching as long as he can. LMAO, I'm much in the house. I also took a little bit of a wander down. We've got a just past race, race HQ. They've got a big screen with um, the live feed playing. No sound, but they've got the pitch up. It's pretty darn cool. It's, it's like the size of a screen you would see in your theater at home. Yeah, it's, it's, it's massive. It's like 15 feet wide. Mm. And uh, so anyone in the pit area can watch the live stream. They're watch Like, if you're in the pit watching that stream, well, you actually aren't hearing our audio right now. But anyway, that's uh, that's, that's just to remind you guys, uh, it's about 20 minutes from now, go to YouTube.com slash the OCR board to get the next uh, stream. Know, next stream. Yeah. YouTube forces us to break it into eight hour chunks. I don't know why. So Team next year with you, Fran. <laughs> oh, Lee, you're thinking far too highly of me. Lee, I'd, uh, I'd hate to lose her in the booth here. Maybe in a toughest you can have her. Fair, fair. <laughs> oh, this obstacle is really doing people in, isn't it? This is a brutal one. Funky Monkey is always a high failure rate. Because you can't, oh man, I feel, here's the one that's, okay, so if you start this obstacle and you fall in, I feel bad. I, 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 my heart goes out. But if you do this obstacle, you pass the rope part, you pass the trapeze part, you're on the ladder, you're going downhill, and then you fall in, mean. my heart breaks for you. Yeah. Because you did the hard part. You're 90% you're of the way done, and you got to go do the penalty anyway, the exact same penalty as if you fell in at the rope. So, yeah, my heart goes out. Seriously envious. I ain't out there with my chair with my assistant team alongside the wheel changer there. Sending big love to them. What about what about next year? B, come on. We'd love to have you. If you tell us where it'll be next year, maybe we could all plan it for next year. Shane, I'm taking the stance of let's enjoy where we are right now and stick with the event we're at. And Shane, worry we'll about have next so much year. more to talk about next year. <laughs> this is over, I promise you. And um, if we knew... And it's not like we don't we, know. It's not like we're not telling you because we don't know. I mean, if I knew, I still wouldn't tell you, but I don't know. <laughs> you remember when you did that to me? You called me and you're like, where's uh, OCRWC going to be? I was like, listen, I'm, I'm just not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just a secret I can't share. And you're like, yeah, but... Can someone share the leaderboard? All right. I feel like I've been sharing it a lot, but if someone's asking, let's have a quick look. Not been much changes, really, though, to be fair. Here's our men. Michael Schott, first place with Joshua Fiore, three minutes behind him. has been a, a lot of change in the last 10 minutes. Two men have gone through on the next lap. And uh, so there's the men's leaderboard. And we'll show you the women's leaderboard real quick. We have another guest joining us. We in the do, booth. we do. Oh, no, we don't. No, we don't. Oh.
So we've just seen Callie cross the finish line uh, on lap 8, 40 miles in 7.45. Uh, also with the men's top 10. That's back into first place for Callie. She dropped back into, into second for a minute. First place. For a bit, actually. Men, uh, Michael Scott and Joshua Fiore, both with 45 miles, nine laps. And then Tyler Veerman, a 640, so we might be seeing him. Tyler's, Tyler's steadily crept up that leaderboard. Yes. As the Knights uh, crept on slightly. So he's, he's showing us a full lap behind, but he's probably close to finishing that mm. ninth lap. And well, that was at 6.40, which was over an hour ago. So, yeah, I'd imagine. So he'll come, say he comes across in the next couple minutes. He'll be 15 minutes behind the other guys. Mm. We're getting our first Everest. picture from Everest. Michelle Carney, Team UK, still here. 12.40 a.m. UK time. Woo woo! Big UK contingent in Tough Mudder. It is. They look too warm. Do you know what? I, I am wearing a hoodie. Well, I'm wearing a jumper and I've put leggings on, but it's still warm, isn't it? It's definitely warmer than last year, and it's warmer than most years. So it's like Anna Carter going up there, possibly. So this is a hard obstacle, not just for the athlete going up, but for the athletes that are reaching down. We had a go on this yesterday. Um, and I was a little bit cocky because last year I flew up it. Like, I didn't even think about it, so I was like, oh, I'll go up with the GoPro. Uh, and filming, uh, filming it as I go up. And I got part of the way up, and uh, Jason grabbed my hand, and then we realized I couldn't get up on my own. I was trying to shove the camera in my mouth and down my top. I had to hand it to him, and in the end, uh, get two people to help me up there. No. Ha, ha, ha. Splash. <laughs> So hopefully we get to see uh, Tyler come through soon. I'll have a quick check to see where he was last seen. So let's have a check now. So there's. What you don't see on the screen, but you can see if you look at the results at home, is you get a last scene uh, where the athlete was last seen. Uh, Land was last seen at Spunky Monkey at 7.37. Uh, ooh, Chris Rogowski was last seen at Mudderhorn at 7.46, which I think is after Spunky Monkey. It is, which means Chris Rogowski should be coming round any minute. Um, we should be seeing her lap. So let's 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 put the finish line up hey, there and see if we can Jason, see how's it going? I'm, I'm live. Oh, hey, Jason. We've got Jason here. I'm just saying we. Uh, there she is. Chris nice. just passing. So she's now in second place. Oh, she's looking strong. Uh, uh, Stephanie Bland was seen at seven thirty-seven, awesome. and Katie Knight was seen at Melting Point at seven thirty-one. I see we got a smudge on uh, Everest. I'll fix that on my way out <laughs> after eight o'clock because eight o'clock. So we're going to switch over to the next uh, yes. YouTube feed. We've been talking about that a bit, so they just have to find the different link and join us on yeah. that link. And it's right there in our YouTube. There's actually a playlist. So if you go to our YouTube page and look for the playlist, you'll find World's Toughest Motor 2023, and all the videos are right there. Fantastic. And actually, I, was... I think when this one ends, I think it might actually even show you. Hey, go to this video ah. next. I don't know if we need to do anything, but I was like, Jason will just come by. He'll fix it. You want back in? No, no, you got it. Yeah. We're good. No. I was just yeah, saying to um, just the guys at home and to uh, Will trying out Everest yesterday, I was a little too cocky. You were? Yeah, I went up with a camera in hand. <laughs> and then. Uh, yeah, you need both hands for that. Couldn't do it. I just remember flying up it last year, but I guess. I must have had two people helping me. Did you have a camera in your hand? No. Well, there you go. But I was like, well, I found it so easy last year. <laughs> As somebody who hasn't been running a race and is fresh and dry and non-fatigued and has been walking right. with a lot of help. That's it definitely not always a... makes a difference. <coughs> oh, pardon me. It absolutely does make a difference. Tyler Veerman. 
Oh man, Veerman's been looking good. Yeah, Tyler's in third place currently with 45 miles. Last I saw him, he was uh, very cheery and smiley. Yeah. So Jason, you've been out there a... Uh, wasn't I saw you did good considering you had a camera in your hand. You made it look easy. Uh, thank you so much, but I really didn't. It was it was embarrassing. Um, you've been out there quite a lot, seeing what's going on. What's it like out there? What's the feeling? Just it's so different being outside than being in this booth. Early on, it was everybody I passed by, eh, you know, like lots of hoots and hollers, and muscles, and you know, thumbs up, and all the good stuff. Everybody sees the camera and they light up. Yeah. Obviously now I can't even see people's faces as they come towards me. You got they the, probably can't see mine yeah. if my headlamp's on, and so it is. It definitely becomes a different feeling. There's still still seeing some thumbs ups and some dances and stuff <laughs> depending on where they're at, especially if they're coming straight out the pit. They're usually dancing and such. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been good, but the, the darkness changes things. It does, but it's still pretty warm. A lot of people still in shorts or just long trousers. Yeah. Not seeing as many wetsuits yet than we would have seen in the past. Right, and I'm not needing to get in the water myself, but uh, for myself, I'm running shorts and, and t-shirt. And really the only reason I'm using a t-shirt is because uh, I'm stopping to film obstacles. Uh -huh. If I was running the entire time like these guys, I probably wouldn't even have my shirt on. Um, you know, of course, depending on the water. Ooh, somebody just fell on, uh, like they had a, a hold on Everest fell kind of backwards on us, like we're like rolled down it. <laughs> so I'm saying, I know you guys have heard this ad infinitum, but thank you for doing this to those who can't get there this year. Um, yeah, no, we, we're happy to keep hearing that. We appreciate it, so thank you. And thank you for watching, because there's are. no point doing it if you're not going to watch. We uh, are very happy to do it. Board. Uh, I, feel like, I do feel like I'm sharing the boards a lot, but as you ask for them, I will absolutely show them. Women's top 10, three women have come through on 40 Kelly, miles. Four four minutes ahead of chris that's awesome she has been she yes. dropped a second at one point i think stephanie took first stephanie's right behind her. those top four have been switching around a bit but yeah Callie's back in the first place chris moving steadily up chris is just chris and chris gonna chris she is she absolutely is chris she ridiculous. Had a, a slice of pizza or just the crust of some pizza going into snog and dirt <laughs> and I, I told her, you gotta watch that pizza, it's gonna get in the mud. But she kept it up the whole time. She kept it in her mouth the whole way through. That's so funny. Out of the mud. Caroline started at lap nine at 7.50. Chris Glockley started less than two minutes later. Steph Land is on lap eight at Mudderhorn as of. Uh, and I lost the rest of that comment. Yeah, if you look at the whole thing there, it'll show you. As of a few minutes ago, it should be finishing soon. Yes. So Mudderhorn uh, is. But a horn and then Everest is really not far from the finish line. In fact, if we kind of stand on the other side of this tent, we can see Everest. Then they've got a small loop after it. So we know kind of when they're hitting Mudderhorn, they'll be here shortly after. Yeah. And yet we still manage to miss them a lot. That's that Austin passing there? Over there on that side? That does look like Austin yep. passing through. There we go. Uh fourth fourth Walking place. With some Austin. Bottles in his hand. I mean he's still in shorts and just as race just, bib, yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I know Tyler was in his, uh, Tyler Verman was in his um, rain jacket or, or windbreaker. Mm. How, how does everybody not know yet? How does everyone what? Not know, like how people still walk by and not know that this is not racing yet. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, that loop from passing up uh, Hanging Rough. Mm -hmm. And then going up that hill around and then doing, you know, usually, um, what you call it, takes a couple of minutes. Um, doing Everest, not Everest, doing uh, Butterhorn. Mm -hmm. Usually at least two minutes to get up and over that thing. Earlier when you were at Butterhorn, first I had like three women go through, but I didn't see any of them. And I was like, oh, well, oh, wow. it's just gone through. Chris should be going through soon watching the camera and then she'd pass on the mat and I was like, yeah, I missed that. 
you can see on the finish line how quickly it got dark. How quickly it got dark. It did. Uh, you know, I was out there running with Heather while the sun was going down. I think we got some good shots. Oh, it was beautiful, yeah. We had that on the screen for quite a while. They don't look wet or muddy. Um, I don't think I, there is a lot of mud out on the course, but then there's clean water as well. Snog and dirt, you get absolutely muddy. I mean, a lot of people are rolling through that, so you're getting wet. Wet. There's plenty of mud on in different spots, uh, but you're also, you know, yeah, you're getting clean, cleaned off in the water, and if you fall into, you know, different obstacles. So yeah, people aren't looking too muddy, but that's uh, that's good. There's there's several water like little ditch crossings yeah. that, that get real muddy. I mean, a lot of people are falling into the water, aren't they? There goes Anne Carolyn Clifford. Still moving. Yikes. Should we move the camera to where the finish line is like on the right side of the camera? You see them pat walking through for longer. Yeah. I like the way you asked that, I'm like, yeah, you go do it. Jason's just going to move the finish line camera. You'll see it now. Move. Uh, just so we get a bit of a better picture of people as they go through. Oh, there he's done. Oh, you look cold. Please put a wetsuit on. Yeah, I think so. So as in here now, uh, if anyone wants to tell us where you would like to see any cameras, we can try and we'll move them throughout the night, like we say. Um, yeah, if there are any places you want to see, not everything is even open yet. Uh, a lot of last things to open. So eight o'clock, we'll get well flung and hanging rough. We're going to open nine o'clock operation uh, and 10 p.m. Dingleberries. If you weren't here when Chris Maltby joined us, we spoke about Statue of Liberty and he was saying that the route through the water was just too dangerous to put people through. I wonder and why, if it was more the depth deep. or the, because I don't think there's a current going through there. I think it was just too deep. Which uh, is interesting because in 16, going across Lake Las Vegas, it was, you had to swim. Maybe there were alligators. <laughs> That's a possibility. Uh, we do have a little over a minute before we're going to switch over to the next feed. After the switch happens, I'm going to head and uh, I'm going to wipe off that lens at Everest. And then I'm going to head on to um, put a camera back on Hanging Rough because it'll open up. And then I'm going to go on to Coach's Corner. Nice. Oh, yeah, that'll be great with Coach's Corner. I'm looking forward to seeing it, that. Is it is open, right? Uh, it should be open, yeah. It should open quite a while ago, I think. It opened at four o'clock. Awesome. <laughs> it's kind of hard to keep track, isn't it? Thanks, man. What's the story with the camera? Mine? Mine's just off right now. Oh. Water obstacles camera. Well, we've got um. More obstacles on. Ah. Will just saw this one and he went, aww. What does it say? Although not official, a person. Oh, wait, no. We're saying they love you and Jason, not me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you love Will as well, right? A person who wins WTM, what are their official mileage is? Unofficially, it could be more depending on if they had to do penalty loops. The penalty Absolutely. loops don't count as distance, yep. I guess. But your laps count. It's yeah, lapsed. there's definitely, you've seen, I mean, ask Amelia, Amelia about that. She's definitely had years where she's done a ton of penalties and gotten a ton of extra mileage. You know, who knows when, when she got 90, you know, there's a couple of times, like, how much extra mileage did she do? I don't know. Like, it was potential. Uh, she but you would kind of hope that somebody, I, I, I can't really do the maths right now, but a first place and a second place, the second place doing that many penalty, penalties, when they're this long, probably wouldn't be coming in second place. You wouldn't think so. But you wouldn't think so because they're all quite close. I mean, further on, yeah, maybe. Like, I think Ray is a good example. I, I 
even though she did amazing, she won. I, I guarantee you she did, did a lot of penalties. Not Maybe not a ton, but... Do we need to do anything? Uh, you know, I'm going to dump in the race pocket We can fix that. Yeah. No, that'll that'll keep running. Oh, cool. I don't know why it's... Oh, it is at it's fine. one. No, yeah. we're good. Are we going to do the stream? Oh, yeah, it's time. Sorry. Well, I'm just, we're just talking away. <laughs> All right, we're going to do the next stream, so find us over there. The link. Oh. link. Uh, YouTube.com slash OCR report. Yeah, slash OCR report. And remember, when this one shuts off, you may see it direct you to the next link. They're all on the playlist as and well. If, you're, You'll if find you them don't there. see it there, then go look for the playlist. If you're here with us now, you'll find the next one. Uh, see you in just a minute.